as long as you're all right. I just, you know. We Order! Order. Question to the Secretary of State for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. I will call Minister Victoria Prentice to answer the substantive question from Rosie Cooper. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Government has a manifesto commitment to introduce compulsory microchipping of cats, which was recently reaffirmed in our action plan for animal welfare. We carried out a public consultation and we are currently analysing 33,000 responses. We will publish a summary of these responses soon and the detail of our proposals later this year. Let's go to Rosie Cooper. Rosie. Thank you, Mr Speaker. That is good news from the Minister, as cats' protection indicate that a quarter of all domestic cats, 2.6 million of them, are not microchipped. So what support will the government actually provide in ensuring that cats are microchipped as a priority? Minister. I would encourage the Honourable Lady to feed in the views of herself and her constituents to our consultation. We are working up detailed proposals now. I know how important that this issue is. I myself have lost a pet to a road traffic accident, and it is very important that we get this right, both legally and in support terms. Anthony Macdonald. To Mr Speaker. The European Commission's ban on the import of live bivalve mollusks from Class B waters is wrong and unjustified. We have repeatedly told the Commission this and will continue to raise the issue. I am pleased to say that the Food Standards Agency has recently revised their shellfish waters classification process, ensuring that classifications are rewarded in ways that are proportionate, pragmatic and provide high levels of public health protection. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that incredibly helpful answer and for visiting my constituency yesterday and to see the fishermen and shellfish uh, industry of Brixham. It is deeply appreciated. She mentions the FSA's report. Can I ask, in light of the Prime Minister's answer yesterday, whether there is any chance that those recommendations could be brought forward ahead of September 2021? Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I can confirm that the Honourable Gentleman re represents one of the most beautiful constituencies that I have visited ever, full of positive and innovative people involved in the fishing industry. As he heard yesterday, the Prime Minister is doing everything he can to accelerate the process, as are we in DEFRA, but it is important that the process that is arrived at by the FSA is both robust and fair. Right, let's go to the Shadow Secretary of State, Luke Pollard. Luke. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I think the government's got this one wrong, and instead of blaming the European Union, I think their responsibility sits closer to home with ministers. Fishing businesses, shellfish businesses, will go bust if the solution is not found soon, and reclassifying waters is a partial fix at best. So being charitable to the minister, if she thinks she has a case that the EU has acted unlawfully or incorrectly, why has she not begun legal proceedings against them? Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I don't need the Honourable Gentleman's charity. I'd quite like his support, actually, in, in representing our position to the European Commission. There is a process for doing this, and we intend to follow it very carefully. We've made it very clear that we do not agree with their analysis of the situation. Our shellfish from Class B waters is fantastic to eat, as they always have done. We will continue to use the proper processes through the new Specialised Committee on Fisheries, and if necessary, we will continue to consider when and if legal action should become appropriate. But legal action, and I know this as a lawyer, is never a quick fix, and there may be a better way to do this. Let's go to the Chair of Select Committee, Neil Parrish. Neil. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. First of all, can I correct the Minister? She did not go to the most beautiful constituency in Devon at Totnes. She came to Axminster in my constituency previously. But um, the point with this, with the shellfish, is that the Commission have acted very badly, in my view. I have sympathy with the Ministers, but I also have huge sympathy for the shellfish industry. And so FSA can move faster, I think, still, to reallocate re waters from A to from B to A, and also I think we want all the agencies working together quicker, and I also would like to see some direct support to the shellfish industry, because we are putting shellfish businesses out of business, and we're not, no politician and no government wants to do that. Some might argue beer in his constituency is pretty good as well, Minister. <laughs> I had the most lovely lunch in the Right Honourable Gentleman's um, constituency the day before yesterday. It was unbelievably beautiful and the weather favoured us in River Cottage. And we, it, was, it was just magnificent in every way, and it was great to see um, the Honourable Gentleman there. However, he does raise some important points as well about shellfish, and it is right that this is a very difficult issue. It was not one that we wanted or would have chosen. We want to export Class B mollusks still to the EU, and we think that that should be possible. However, we are looking in a very granular way at how we can best support the industry. I'm very involved in this. I've spoken to colleagues across government, including repeatedly in the FSA and the Department of Health, and I would like to reassure the Honourable Gentleman that we are dealing with this in a proportionate and joined-up way. We have a substantive question to Minister Pack. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I will just demask. Uh, and with permission, Mr. Speaker, I would like to take this question grouped, uh, question five and six. Uh, so, to support the recovery of native species in England, we have tabled an amendment to the Environment Bill to require a new historic legally binding target for species abundance by 2030, aiming to halt the decline of nature. This is in addition to the long term legally binding targets we're developing under the Bill, and we expect to publish a, pub a consultation in early 2022 on the proposed targets. We're looking at the action needed on the ground and will be launching at least 10 landscape recovery projects to restore wilder landscapes in partnership with stakeholders. We will determine the specific actions that will be paid for by our new schemes to reward environmental land management. And in addition, our £80 million Green Recovery Challenge Fund has kick-started a pipeline of nature-based projects, many of which do relate to native species. Let's go to Kate Griffiths. Kate. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Washlands in my constituency is a fantastic place to visit, an expansive part of natural land that follows the river through the heart of Burton-upon-Trent. Will my right honourable friend join me in thanking East Staffordshire Borough Council, Staffordshire Wildlife Trust, and other organisations for their efforts in transforming the Trent Valley to create spaces that work for both people and wildlife. Uh, I thank her very much for that and of course there's hot competition in here this morning for the best constituency <laughs> and of course uh, her own area is an extremely actually very interesting and diverse uh, uh, landscape area and I would of course like to thank all of those organisations working to transform the Trent Valley including East Staffordshire Borough Council as she mentions and the Staffordshire Wildlife Trust and partnerships like this the collaboration between the partners and the community are an absolute key to building successful projects to restore and enhance natural and cultural heritage. I actually visited Somerset Levels yesterday with a similar really big partnership working, going so well with so many partners, and I'm very grateful to all of the partners and their efforts towards goals for uh, thriving plants and wildlife right across England. Let's go to Sir Roger Gale. Sir Roger. Good morning, Mr Speaker. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd be grateful if my Honourable friend could confirm that her department will be supporting the reintroduction, properly managed, of beavers, which can contribute so much to the environment. Um, but second, endangered species suffer, of course, because of loss of habitat more than anything else. If we rip out our hedgerows and our headlands, and if we build over all our agricultural land, then the habitat will be destroyed and wildlife will be destroyed. So will my honourable friend join me in campaigning against the use of agricultural land for development. Minister. 
I thank him for that, and I knew my, uh, my right honourable friend was going to mention beavers. He's a great champion of beavers, uh, and uh, we are consulting, as he knows, on the reintroduction of beavers this summer, their, their myriad benefits, but also to look very carefully at the, man the potential management that might be needed and mitigations if necessary. Uh, but of course, he raises a really important point about our precious agricultural land, but I absolutely want to reassure him that we on these benches are working uh, hand in glove so that all our new schemes deliver for nature, but also that we can produce the sustainable food in this country we want. And this morning, actually, I went to New Covent Garden Market and saw a whole lot of our British produce there. There's a lot of imports, a lot of great British fruit, vegetables, particularly flowers, and it's British Flower Week this week. And I think these benches are absolutely supportive of both productive agriculture but recovering nature. I'm going to welcome the new Shadow Minister, Olivia Blakeson, for a moment. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Government has made some very grand claims about the species abundance targets it will add to the Environment Bill uh, to protect our native species and wildlife. The Secretary of State has said we want not only to stem the tide of the loss of nature, but to turn it around and leave the environment in a better state than we found it. However, last week the Government published its amendment. Can the Minister explain why the proposed legislation commits only to, and I quote, further the objective of halting a decline in the abundance of species rather than reversing the decline? Minister. Thank you, and I welcome her to her place. It's the first time we've done uh, questions in the Chamber together. Um, Mrs. Speaker. Uh, and uh, of course, this is a tremendous commitment by this government to uh, halt the decline of nature by 2030. No other country has done anything like this. So we are totally committed and all of the framework that we're putting in place will build towards that. Our local nature recovery strategies, our national nature recovery strategies, our 30 per cent of protected land on sea and land. Uh, I could go on and on and our 10 new large scale landscape recovery schemes and the entire ELM system will build towards this nature recovery. Uh, so I don't think I could reiterate more the government's commitment to that, and we'll be consulting on the exact detail of the target in 2022, along with all the other targets on the face of the Environment Bill. Let's go to John Stevenson. John. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As the Minister knows, the food and drink manufacturing sector is the largest manufacturing sector in this country, employing over 400,000 people directly. A major innovator and exporter. My concern is that the sector may get too much red tape and regulation. If you look at the obesity strategy, for example, there could be a lot of regulation with very little gain. Can the minister reassure me that their department will make sure that there's proper um, scrutiny of any legislation and the minimum burdens will be put on this sector, which is vital to our economy? If you could pick up the substantive, my fault, Minister. No, thank you, Mr Speaker. We'll manage. Our manifesto was clear that we want people at home and abroad to be lining up to buy British. We're lucky to have um, a fantastic network, as the Honourable Gentleman referenced, of manufacturing businesses, most of which are SMEs. So we're very live to the needs of those businesses and the difficulty of uh, excessive regulatory burdens. I'm quite sure that we will debate the new obesity strategy very fully, both in this House and outside. Some of the legislation can be done using powers in the Food Safety Act and other parts in the Health and Care Bill. We meet regularly with the sector and are keen to engage with them on a practical level as to how regulation will affect them. Let's go to SNP spokesperson Deirdre Brown. Deirdre. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, given that the Australian trade deal is predicted to save the average household an incredible £1.23 per year in the long term, while destroying agriculture businesses and opening us up to similar lowered standards and bad deals with the US, Argentina, Brazil and so on, perhaps the government's counting on that extra disposable income, making up for an uncompetitive sector. What protections uh, are intended to be put in place to make sure that our farmers are not undercut by cheap imports? Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, one of the things, as I've just said in reference to this question, is that we are very, very keen to promote the buying of British produce. We have a plan to promote domestic promotion and we are further strengthening export support. In reference to the other part of the Honourable Lady's question, we will have a chapter in the new Australia deal 
to deal with the protection of animal welfare standards, and I would encourage her to get engaged with the details as they emerge in the course of this year. Karen Buck. Number 10, sir. Sheriff Uh, Mr Speaker, I have had regular discussions with the Secretary of State of the Department for International Trade and indeed other Cabinet colleagues on the issue of food standards in the context of our negotiations with Australia. The UK has a prohibition on the sale of beef treated with hormones and the agreement recognises our right to regulate in this way. But he'll be aware that environmental, animal welfare and farming groups have all expressed their concern both about the small print in the deal and the precedent that it sets. Um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, the Minister knows that uh, trust is in very short supply and that deals have a habit of unravelling, as we have seen very uh, clearly in recent months. So can the Minister give us a date by which the, proposed, the Trade and Agriculture Commission will be fully operational and the date in which the analysis of this deal will be published? Well, Mr Speaker, the um, Secretary of State of the Department for International Trade, I think, will be giving a statement later, and the Government has now uh, published the uh, key components of the agreement uh, in principle. Um, there's already been some analysis that's been uh, cited in terms of the uh, impacts of this uh, agreement. But look, Australia is a very important partner of ours. Uh, it's important that we get a trade agreement uh, with them. Uh, it is, of course, a smaller uh, economy, and um, the opportunities uh, are therefore not as large as they would be with a, a large economy. But nevertheless, Australia is important allies, and this is a good uh, agreement between us. Shadow Minister Dyer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I hardly need to explain to the Secretary of State the level of disbelief and anger that there is as the betrayal of British farming unfolds this week. Now, the level of detail is unclear, but the Telegraph helpfully reports a major win for the Secretary of State for International Trade, doubtless briefed by her, but the key losers in this are British farmers. So, can the Secretary of State today tell the House, given that we now know there's going to be a huge increase in the amount of beef and lamb coming in from Australia, produced to lower standards at lower cost, disadvantaging our farmers. What is he going to do to help our farmers meet that challenge? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, we he secured some important mitigations to help the farming industry, including uh, the fact that a tariff rate quota will remain in place for the first 10 years on both beef and sheep. And for the subsequent five years, there will be a special agricultural safeguard uh, that means if volumes go above a certain trigger, tariffs immediately snap back in. So we believe that we've put in place mitigations uh, through that uh, quota for the first 10 years and that safeguard. A substantive question to Minister Prentice. The current legislation and guidance provides the right safeguards and powers in respect of horse tethering. The Code of Practice for the Welfare of Horses provides information on acceptable standards of tethering. We want every owner to follow this guidance. Let's go to Robert Halford. Robert. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In my beautiful constituency of Harlow, we sadly see many horses tethered by the roadside and in dangerous locations. These horses often have no water, are left for days on end, and sometimes the tether breaks, causing danger for the horses and passing cars. Will my right honourable friend not only consider introducing tougher measures to penalise individuals who mistreat their horses and break the code of practice for the welfare of horses, ponies and donkeys, but also look to introduce a mandatory duty upon local councils to implement a licensing system to ensure that horses are monitored and receive regular vet checks and that the highest animal welfare standards are upheld? Minister. Well, the honourable gentleman from his beautiful constituency has long campaigned on this important issue. People who mistreat their horses face prosecution under the Animal Welfare Act. And the good news is that the maximum penalty under this Act increases to five years' imprisonment this month. Anyone who has concerns about inappropriate tethering should report the matter to, a lo to their local authority. They have powers under the 2006 Act to take action where a horse is suffering. Alex Cunningham. Number 13, Mr Speaker. Minister. DEFRA is working closely with industry and wider government to ensure that UK growers get the labour they need. This year, the seasonal workers pilot has been expanded from 10,000 to 30,000 visas. 
Many workers are among those um, who all now have settled or pre-settled status as well. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Minister will be aware that the Government's bizarre approach to labour from the EU is causing chaos across all manner of job roles, including agriculture. And just this week, Holly and Martin Levitt from Stockton told me there's a huge shortage of drivers as they can no longer easily hire from the EU and goods aren't being delivered. That needs to be sorted. But today, the NFU and I would like to know if the Minister will extend the seasonal workers' pilot scheme to ornamentals to ensure the plants and flowers in fields and nurseries get picked and aren't left rotting, bringing joy to no one and bankrupting businesses. Minister. Uh, I know that the Secretary of State is working actively on this issue and had a meeting with several representatives of the ornamental sectors only yesterday to discuss this. We are working hard across government to address these worker shortages. I am working with DWP to promote picking and to support the horticultural sector as well to recruit more UK workers. Automation will be at least some of the solution to this, and we are actively promoting new technologies. Mr. Bell. Question, full, question 14, sir. Stay. Mr. Speaker, farm incomes are heavily influenced by exchange rates, and in the aftermath of the 26 referendum, there was an immediate boost to farm profitability, and that has remained the case since. For the first time in 50 years, we are also free to create an independent agriculture policy that works for our own farmers. Our future agriculture policy will support farmers to farm sustainably, to make space for nature in the farmed landscape, and to improve their profitability. Peter Bell. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I, I thank the most excellent Minister for that response. Is he as fed up as I am with the doom and gloom on the side opposite? When our farmers do such a good job, coming out of the EU allows them to turbocharge their exports. Get rid of that lot. Concentrate on the good stuff that we're doing. So, Steve. Well, Mr Speaker, my, my honourable friend makes a, a very uh, important point. Uh, British agriculture in many sectors is uh, world-beating, world-leading, competes internationally, can export internationally. Uh, we will be uh, announcing plans to uh, increase the support that we offer to exporters, and there are important opportunities in some of the Asian markets for our goods. Substantive question to the Secretary of State from Christine Jardin. With permission, Mr Speaker, uh, I would like to group questions 15 and 16. As part of the agreement with Australia, we secured a Special Agricultural Safeguard, or SSG, which has a strict automatic volume trigger. It means that for the first 10 years, uh, Australian beef and lamb will be subject to a quota, or a TRQ, and for the next subsequent five years, it will be subject to a Special Agricultural Safeguard with a volume trigger. Let's go to Christine Jardine. Christine. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And this particular member of the opposition has no doubt about the world-class nature of our crofting and farming sector and our food production throughout the UK. However, I am aware of the concerns expressed by those sectors about the lack of consultation, both of trade bodies and um, of Parliament, before this deal was announced. So what can the Minister do to reassure the industries that this is not a dangerous precedent that's been set and we are not going to see a repeat of this with trade deals however important they might be a lack of consultation we're not going to see this repeated in future so state well mr speaker the department for international trade have a number of groups including one covering agri-food that um, uh, discusses the approach uh, to trade deals and also helps uh, the department for international trade identify uh, priorities Obviously, necessarily, when you're in the final stages of a negotiation, uh, the mandate that government has uh, is kept confidential, since uh, not to keep it confidential would undermine our negotiating position. Uh, but we do share uh, as much as we are able to with stakeholders, including the National Farmers Union. Stuart C. Macdonald. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Secretary of State confirm that there is tariff-free access for Australian farmers from day one up to a meaningless cap 60 times the current levels of imported yeah. beef? And the same applies to lamb, up to a cap three times current import levels. Doesn't that render talk of, of promises of a 15-year protection period absolutely redundant? And can we expect the same so-called protections in future trade deals? Yeah. 
Well, Mr Speaker, I think you have to um, look at this in the context uh, uh, of the fact that at the moment Australia doesn't sell us really any of these goods uh, because they have a minuscule tariff rate quota in the case of beef of only around 1,400 tonnes. Uh, so you also have to look at it in the context of the fact that we have a TRQ already with New Zealand uh, that is uh, over 100,000 tonnes uh, and actually New Zealand don't fill that quota. Ed Dugan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A concern that I've shared with the 17 of April. As we set out in the recently published Action Plan for Animal Welfare, we will be bringing forward legislation to ban the import and export of detached shark fins. DEFRA has been working closely with the Home Office and Border Force officials. We need enforceable legislation which will lead other nations to join us in banning this dreadful trade. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I quite agree with the Minister that we do need enforceable legislation, not just on whole shark fins, but also on shark fin products. And I've asked the Minister um, in a written parliamentary question and in Westminster Hall about this, and I haven't had a satisfactory response. So can she confirm today that shark fins and shark fin products will be proscribed from UK borders, which will be a great relief to my Angus constituents? Thank you, Mr Speaker. We are in the process of preparing the legislation at the moment, and I would be very willing to reach out to the Honourable Gentleman and to meet with him on the detailed wording of how we do this. We are making good progress, and we need to um, make sure that our measures are as effective as possible in delivering shark, shark conservation measures globally. Substantive question, Minister, from Chris Loader. Final question. The seafood sector has faced significant challenges over the last 18 months, but the situation is now improving as hospitality opens up and we adapt to new export requirements. Sector support worth £32.7 million is available this year, plus an additional £100 million, which will help rejuvenate the industry and our coastal communities. Let's go to Chris Loder, audio only. Chris. Good morning, Mr. Speaker from West Dorset. Seafarers UK conducted a report in 2019 which found that most small scale fishermen often had few savings and reduced financial resilience even before COVID. And many have fallen through the gaps of government funding because they either changed vessels or because their fishing opportunities and the earnings in 2019 weren't enough to reach the threshold for the Fisheries Response Fund. What steps can the Minister take to address this issue and to support the small fishing boats that I have in my constituency in Lyme Bay? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The excellent report referenced by the Honourable Gentleman, um, which I was very pleased to provide a forward to, highlights that the small-scale fishermen face not just financial challenges, but also social pressures. The report's recommendations point to where industry and the government might, might tackle these challenges together. We are currently considering these in more detail. Clive Betts. Question one, Mr Speaker. Go stay. Mr Speaker, today is Clean Air Day, and the recent coroner's inquest into the tragic death of Ella Kissy Deborah highlighted the importance of making progress on delivering clean air. The government is working on a new targets framework to work on air quality and a range of policies to improve air quality, in particular to reduce particulate matter. And we will also be doing more to raise awareness of the risks of air quality in our urban areas. Clive Betts. In, in 2007, there were major flood in Sheffield, which uh, uh, not merely affected homes, but actually destroyed um, large parts of the industrial area. Sheffield affected Meadowhall Shopping Centre, Forshmas and other industries. A great deal of work has been done on flood defences, with the council and the private sector working together with some government support. But one thing that would really help is preservation of the peat bogs in the moorlands above Sheffield. They act as a massive sponge to stop the runoff and the cascading of water down into Sheffield. So will the Minister take action now to stop heather burning on the peat bogs and also make sure that peat doesn't end up in unnecessary uh, products such as compost for gardens? 
Secretary of State. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman makes some important points. Uh, the Government is already uh, clear that we are going to consult uh, on a ban on horticultural peat. Uh, we will shortly be bringing forward the legislation uh, that will uh, implement uh, a new ban uh, on burning of heather on blanket bog, and it is our intention to treble uh, the rate of peatland restoration for all the reasons he said. Right. Let us go to Sir David Evanett. Sir David. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. My borough of Bexley is one of the greenest in London, with great parks and open spaces. However, will my right honourable friend explain what action is being taken to increase the number of trees planted in urban areas? Chester. My honourable friend makes a, a very important point, and the government set out some proposals in our recent uh, England tree strategy. There will be a new uh, urban um, tree challenge fund, a new treescapes fund for local authorities, and of course uh, our policy of biodiversity net gain uh, absolutely intends to make space for nature within new developments, and uh, that will include tree planting. Let's go to Shadow Secretary Luke Pollard. Luke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hope today isn't the Secretary of State's last death for questions because of the rumours from Downing Street that he's due for the chop. But if it were to be true, how will the Secretary of State be spending his next few weeks ensuring that he's not remembered as the Secretary of State who betrayed our fishing industry and rolled over and betrayed our farmers over an Australian trade deal? Secretary of State. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, ministers never uh, comment on. Uh, 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 reshuffle speculation, particularly when it's about uh, oneself. Um, but uh, in the context uh, of fishing, we have recently uh, got an agreement with the EU on how to approach shared stocks for the remainder uh, of this year. We have, of course, got a, an increase uh, in quota of around 25 per cent, 15 per cent of that coming this year, and we've deployed that to actually almost double the fishing opportunities for our inshore fleet in this year. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The moors of the dark peak are staggeringly beautiful, but unfortunately remain some of the most depleted in Europe. The case for restoring our peat moorlands makes sense on so many levels. It enhances biodiversity, it improves water quality, helping keep water bills down, it reduces the risk of flooding and of wildfire, and it helps tackle climate change. I'm proud that the government is investing huge sums of money in restoration already, but we do need to go further and faster. Can I invite the Secretary of State to come up on the moors of the High Peak with me so we can see the excellent work that's being done first hand and so we can make the case for continued investment in this vital restoration? Secretary of State. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my, my honourable friend makes a very important point. Our um, peat habitats uh, are vital for our biodiversity and can be a, a vitally important carbon store and can also help with. Uh, both drought and also flood uh, mitigation, flood risk mitigation uh, as well. We will be uh, dramatically increasing the funds available for peatland uh, restoration. Uh, and of course, uh, I or one of my ministerial colleagues would be delighted uh, to, to visit his constituency uh, in the High Peak and see some of the uh, work that's being done there. We now go to Helen Hayes. Helen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, further to the previous question, the Committee on Climate Change warned this week that the area of land suitable for peat-forming vegetation in the uplands could decline by 50 to 65 per cent by the 2050s through the effects of climate change alone, potentially dramatically increasing UK carbon emissions. How is the Secretary of State planning to amend the England's Peat Action Plan to bring forward plans for peat protection and restoration in light of the Committee's damning report? So well, Mr Speaker, we, we are dramatically increasing the rate of peatland restoration uh, to get to sort of 35,000 hectares uh, by the uh, end of, of this Parliament. It will be a big feature of the landscape recovery component uh, of our future agriculture policy, uh, and we've got uh, great ambitions to, to see the natural hydrology of our deep peat habitats restored. Richard Paul. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Fly tipping is a blight on rural areas, and central Bedfordshire alone issued 400 penalty notices last year. But, Mr Speaker, with only a £400 fine, frequently discounted, yeah. treated really as just a cost of doing business if you get caught, does my honourable friend agree this yeah, fine yeah. is too low, and what other efforts can he take to improve deterrence? Yeah. So, 
Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I know that fly tipping uh, is a challenge, and um, my, my uh, honourable friend says that um, £400 is too short. Obviously, that's um, an immediate on the spot penalty fine. Uh, that was introduced just uh, a couple of years ago. Prior to that, actually, local authorities had to try to bring a prosecution. But we are doing more to try to improve the traceability of waste, uh, to strengthen the waste uh, carrier uh, transfer system, and digitise the notes to improve the traceability and track down the criminals behind this fly tipping. Let's go to Beth Winter. Beth. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Today marks Clean Air Day, which aims to improve public awareness and understanding of the damage caused by air pollution to promote campaigning as well on this critically important issue. Now, I'm proud to say the Welsh Government's programme for government published this week included a commitment to introduce a Clean Air Act for Wales consistent with World Health Organisation guidance and extend the provision of air quality monitoring Will the Minister commit to follow Welsh Government's lead at a UK level? Sir Stay. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, this uh, issue is very much the subject of debate in the Environment Bill uh, that is uh, currently going uh, through uh, both Houses of Parliament. Um, we will be setting uh, targets uh, for clean air, uh, and we will also be looking at a population exposure target, since it's not just the absolute levels of particulate matter uh, where we want to continue to reduce those. It's also looking at the issue of population exposure too. Let's go to Ian Little Granger. Ian. Mr Speaker, good morning. Mr Speaker, the Secretary of State is fully aware that we do have an issue at the moment with customs. West Somerset Garden Centre, which is at the far end of most supply chains, which is in Minehead, at the moment is getting a lot of these articulated lorries from across Europe, which start their drop in Minehead, which means the customs forms are done in Minehead for the whole load, regardless if there's only a third of it cutting off there. The other problem is that when they, these trays come off, and I know the Secretary of State knows what I'm talking about, if only three of those plants are coming off in Minehead, the rest still have to go through the customs rigmarole there. The customs officers either don't get to Minehead or don't know where it is. And there is a huge problem with this, um, as the Secretary of State is aware. We need an answer to this fairly quickly because the paperwork is swamping a small garden centre in Somerset. They are meant to be brief topical, so we will have a brief answer, Secretary of State. And I, I would be um, more than happy to, to meet my honourable friend to discuss this uh, particular issue um, uh, in relation to uh, customs. Final question from Tim Farron. Tim. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. The reason why Cumbria's farmers feel betrayed is that the Australian trade deal gives Australian farmers an unfair advantage over British farmers, and it's because their production costs are lower due to significantly worse animal welfare and environmental standards in Australia compared to our country. Now, given that this sets an appalling precedent for all future deals, will the Minister ensure that farmers' representatives in this House get the final say and a veto before this deal is signed off? Serve State. Uh, well, Mr uh, Speaker, under the provisions that we have uh, to ratify treaties, of course, this House uh, will have the ability uh, to decline to ratify uh, any treaty, uh, including this particular one. And on the issue of animal welfare, uh, the, it is the case that we have a chapter on animal welfare cooperation. And, of course, we will be seeking uh, to address some of the welfare deficiencies uh, in Australia and to get them to, for instance, follow New Zealand's lead on the issue uh, of mulesing. And it's also important to recognise that this agreement does not cover uh, pork and poultry, uh, where their standards also uh, have problematic uh, uh, approaches. We now come to questions to the Church Commissioners, the House of Commons Commission, the Parliamentary Work Sponsor Body and the Speaker's Committee on the Electoral Commission. Alistair Carmichael. Number one, Mr Speaker. Chris Matheson. Mr Speaker, the Commission has made no detailed assessment to the number of fraudulent votes that could be prevented as a result of the Government's proposed policy to introduce a voter ID requirement. While levels of re reported electoral fraud in the UK are consistently low, they do vary and there is no reliable methodology for forecasting instances of electoral fraud. The Commission has highlighted the lack of an ID requirement as a vulnerability in polling stations in Great Britain. Public research shows that this is an issue that concerns voters. Alistair Cumber. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We know, as the honourable gentleman says, that previous work by the Commission has shown that voter uh, impersonation is a very rare occurrence in this country. We also know from the other side of the Atlantic that schemes there involving the production of identification at polling stations have suppressed turnout especially amongst poorer communities and minority ethnic communities. Will that experience be taken into account by the Commission in formulating further advice to the Government in respect to the proposed legislation? We now go Chris to Mar Matheson. Sorry, Chris Matheson. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm grateful to the Right Honourable Gentleman for that um, question. And he raises an interesting point. Honourable Members will have seen at both state and federal level there are um, discussions at the moment over electoral law. Um, we may have the, um, lessons to learn from fellow uh, democratic countries, and I will pass that recommendation on to the Commission for their consideration. Martin Vickers. Uh, number two, Mr Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The Church of England is strongly encouraging churches to support both in-person and online communal worship, and training has been given to thousands of clergy to enable this. It is up to local churches to decide how best to do this. Martin Vickers. Um, I thank my honourable friend for, for his reply. It, it, it's welcome that uh, the, the church is encouraging both uh, online and in person for those housebound who perhaps in the past have only received home communion to be able to participate more is, is very welcome. But nothing can actually replace the fellowship of being a part of a, a real life congregation. So c can he give an absolute assurance that nothing will be, uh, no barriers will be put uh, in the, the way of uh, achieving that? Well, I couldn't agree with my honourable friend more, and I can give him a complete assurance that the Church of England fully recognises the importance so many people attach to worshipping, worshipping communally together in church. At the same time, we're very keen not to lose those who join us online, and we hope we'll be able to get to know many of our new online attendees as soon as possible in due course. A substantive question to Andrew Slew. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Church is having ongoing discussions with the Government about when choral and communal singing in churches and cathedrals can return, and I am very aware how frustrating the current situation is for choirs across the country. Let us go to Litchfield Cathedral, the shadows of with Michael Fabricant. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Some people relax with yoga, others with Tai Chi, perhaps you do, Mr Speaker. But I, in the good old days, when I used to have a, a week in Westminster and then get back to Litchfield, unwind by going to Evensong in Litchfield Cathedral. Very relaxing indeed. But for whatever reason people go for Evensong, perhaps even religious reasons and worship, uh, you know, there's a need for it to be restored. So what assurance can my honourable friend give that come July 19th, things will truly get back to normal in Litchfield and elsewhere? Andrew Slate. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I was praising my honourable friend in front of all the cathedral deans on Tuesday for his diligence on behalf of Litchfield Cathedral. And he's absolutely right about the beauty of our choral tradition and how much it is cherished, and we all want to see a return as quickly as possible. Shelley Ann Hart. Number four, please, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Restoring Parliament will benefit businesses uh, in, in the UK using UK materials wherever possible and creating jobs and apprenticeships nationwide, including, I hope, in my honourable friend's constituency, from engineering and high-tech design to, to traditional crafts, such as carpentry and stonemasonry. Sally Ann Hart. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The restoration and renewal programme will cost billions, but at the same time will employ thousands of British people. The sponsor body is required to procure and manage the contractors and the supply chain. Does my right honourable friend agree that in doing so, it can help towards delivering the government's levelling up agenda, ensuring that businesses, contractors and so on from our more deprived socio-economic areas across the UK will have real equality of opportunity to access the variety of employment opportunities afforded by this programme? David Hines. Absolutely, Mr Speaker. My honourable friend is indeed quite right. And the programme is, is currently developing its supply chain plans to help ensure the benefits of the programme are felt uh, across the country. There's also an innovative loan scheme for apprentices to be employed by the programme and then loaned to businesses working on the restoration. And dozens of young people from more disadvantaged areas will be offered 
uh, paid internships and placements in a partnership with the Social Mobility Foundation. Substantive question to Andrew Slew. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Both archbishops are very committed to strengthening families and marriages across the country, which is why they've launched their commission into families and households to see what greater support the Church can provide in this vital area of our national life. Let's go to Dr Lisa Cameron. Lisa. Many thanks, Mr Speaker, and what a welcome response. Given the Government has recently announced the foundation of a centre for family hubs led by the Anna Freud Centre and interest in family hubs from our local Hope Church in Blackwood, can I ask the Honourable Member representing the Church Commissioners what communication he has had with the Family Hubs Network to ensure that churches are involved in this support that is being offered to vulnerable families across our local communities? Andrew Slew. Well, I'm very grateful for her question. And like her, I'm a great fan of Family Hubs. And the Families and Households Commission will be looking carefully at they, uh, how Family Hubs can help families to flourish and how churches could be involved in this important work. Graham McCarthy. Question six, Mr Come Speaker. On. Andrew Slew. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I commend the Honourable Lady's continued focus on this vitally important area. Our new farm business tenancies strongly encourage good environmental practice, such as ensuring watercourses are kept clear, hedgerows are well maintained and topsoil is preserved. We are reviewing tenancy obligations as our new environmental strategy is developed. And I thank the Honourable Member for his engagement with me on this issue and uh, his, his tolerance in, in some cases. Um, I'm pleased to see that the Commissioners will be carrying out a natural capital audit of their 105,000 acres of land. Can he say whether this is likely to resort in recommendations on conservation and rewilding? And if so, would he consider looking at the National Trust's model tenancy agreements to see whether that's something that could be put in future tenancy agreements on their land? Well, I continue to be grateful to the Honourable Lady, and the Church does want to be an exemplar in this area. And I can tell her that we expect the results of the Natural Capital Audit shortly, and we'll use it to see where we can enhance the environment of our rural land after we've listened to and collected the necessary data from our tenants. Steve Baker. Number seven, sir. Christian Matheson. Speaker, following the 2017 UK general election, the Commission recommended that the UK Government consider making just such a change to the registration system. It is possible for somebody to be lawfully registered to vote in more than one place. At local elections, these people are able to vote in each place in different elections. However, it is an offence to vote twice in a single election, such as in a parliamentary general election. The Commission report in 2017 highlighted that uh, requiring such voters to choose which area they will vote in at a UK parliamentary election could reduce the risk of electors voting twice. One practical issue is that we don't have one single national register, but lots of local registers held by individual registration officers. Steve Baker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm very grateful for that answer. Of course, this is a problem that we've seen in Wickham. I've seen evidence of it, and that's why I raise it. But on the point about a single national database, can I just say the House will remember we had very much this conversation about the NHS Track and Trace app. So as a software engineer, through him, can I encourage the Electoral Commission to perhaps take the advice of expert software engineers on how such uh, uniqueness could be assured about the uh, registrations without having a single national database. I'm very grateful for that. I think the House is aware of the Honourable Gentleman's professional experience um, in this area. Perhaps if he has some solutions um, that he could suggest to the Commission, I could ask them to meet him and they could discuss what's possible. Sure, Mary. Question number eight, please, Mr Speaker. Good, Sir Charles. Sorry. The House of Commons Commission will continue to ensure that all necessary measures are in place to protect everyone in the parliamentary community from the risk of COVID. The specific measures to be retained or implemented will be informed by the current government guidance in place at the time, public health advice received and the parliamentary COVID risk assessment. The COVID risk assessment has been continuously updated in the past year to reflect the changing position and will continue to be so, as long as COVID poses a risk to the health and well-being of our community. At its meeting on Monday 8 March, the House of Commons Commission agreed that the House makes all necessary arrangements to ensure the resilience of business and safety of all pass holders in relation to COVID through to March 2022. Cheryl Murray. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Would my honourable friend, the uh, honourable member for Broxbourne, please pass on my thanks, and I'm sure that of all members, to all staff who continued to work through the pandemic in this place. 
Will a review take place into the procedures used so that these could be improved to protect against the threat of disease in the future? Sir Charles. Mr. Speaker, I will certainly pass on my right honourable friend's thanks to all staff who have worked in the House of Commons during the past difficult 15 months. And I think I speak for everyone when I say they've done a simply outstanding job. Learning lessons from our response has been a key priority throughout this time. It has allowed us to refine and improve our response as time has progressed. The House Service, through the Business Resilience Group, will ensure planning is conducted to prepare for a range of public health emergencies alongside identifying and mitigating against a number of other novel risks, if they occur. Substantive question to Andrew Shalhoub. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And with your permission, I'd like to group this question with number 10. Ahead of the new environmental land management schemes, we're undertaking a natural capital audit across our rural holdings. The report, which is expected later this year, will include a review of woodland management and new tree planting, including riparian planting. Let's go to Alex Silver. Alex. The church is a significant UK landowner owning 105,000 acres of land and with a property portfolio worth over two billion can ask about their plans for rewilding tree planting and sustainable farming on their estates as well as being more transparent about what land they own and how that land is used yeah. well i can tell the honorable uh, gentleman that like him i want to see a lot more trees planted and that the church in 2019 uh, planted uh, sorry 2020 planted 1.1 million trees on top of the 2.6 million we planted in 2019 and page 24 of the 2020 annual report shows our top 20 property holdings and our top 20 equity holdings. Rachel Musk. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Church of England is in the business of restoration, yet over the centuries we've seen our natural habitats retreat into manufactured and managed landscapes, which are just as effective at balancing our delicate ecosystem. So as a significant landowner and lagging behind the national ambition on rewilding as well as planting, what are the next steps the Church Commissioner will take in order to build our natural cathedrals of woodlands and wildernesses ahead of COP26? How much will it invest in this project? And will it set a, a diocesan and local church challenge in this year of COP26 for, for them to do their part too? Andrew Shalhoub. There's a lot there, but I'll, I'll do my best. So I can tell the Honourable Lady that of the um, 184,000 acres we own in total, 92,000 acres of those are timber. But she is right, there is uh, more to do. Uh, I will be attending the Grand Swell Conference next uh, week, as will some members of the Church Commissioners, along with a number of Environment Ministers, and we are very conscious of the important issues which she raises. We have a substantive question to Andrew Shalhoub. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Commissioners have a long history of leveraging their position as an investor to increase transparency and to make sure that companies are Paris aligned, most recently with ExxonMobil. The Commissioners work alongside other investors and often play a leading role in organisations like Climate Action 100, the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment, and the Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change. Let's go to Janet Davy. Janet. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. This week, the Young Christian Climate Network began the relay, uh, relay for Justice, where over 500 young people will take part in their trek from Turo Cathedral to Glasgow to call for bold action from our political and religious leaders. We all know warm words won't stop the Earth's temperature rising. And although I, I very much welcome the update from the Commissioner today, can he confirm to me that every component of the Church, including the Commissioners, are on track to reach zero carbon by 2030. Yeah. Mark Hull. Oh, sorry, Church Andrew. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All, all parts of the Church are absolutely committed to reaching uh, net zero, and the Church will shortly be meeting with environment ministers to see what more we can do together. And our ethical investing has won a number of awards in that area. Mark Hull. Number 12, please, Mr. Speaker. Christian Matheson. Mr Speaker, the Commission has regular discussions with the Cabinet Office at both official and ministerial level, including to provide feedback on the development of the Government's policy on voter ID. These discussions followed the Commission's independent evaluations of the Government's voter ID pilot schemes at local elections in 2018 and 19. 
The Commission recommended that any ID requirement should deliver clear improvements to current security levels, should ensure accessibility for all voters and be realistically deliverable, taking into account the resources required to administer it. Mark Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Does the Honourable Member agree with uh, Labour colleagues when they seem to suggest that voter ID is racist or discriminatory when actually most industrialised nations use it? Well, well, Mr Speaker, it's not a question of what I agree with, it's a question of what the Electoral Commission um, agrees with, and I'm here to answer questions on behalf of the Electoral Commission. The Electoral Commission believes that there is um, a perception um, of the potential for fraud, and it is that that they are seeking to um, uh, address in the advice that they have given to government. Well, Mr. Lane Question 13, please, Mr Speaker. Andrew Salou. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We estimate that the net carbon footprint for our church buildings is 12.5% lower than in 2006. We have developed an energy footprint tool, which has been shortlisted for an award at this year's Energy Awards, and 38% of our parishes, parishes have engaged with this footprint tool. And I would suggest to my honourable friend that she encourages parishes in her own constituency to do so as well. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank my honourable friend for his answer. And I'm sure he would agree with me that small rural churches, of which there are many in my North Devon constituency, have an important role to play in hitting net zero. And I know many congregants who are keen to do more with their local church to help. Could my honourable friend explain what the government is doing to promote the role individuals and small rural churches can together play in this national issue? Well, I'm delighted to be able to tell my honourable friend that the Diocese of Exeter has just received a £1 million grant from the church for its Growing the Rural Church project. And my honourable friend could encourage her local churches to join the Eco Church scheme and suggest that they move to a renewable electricity supplier. And for those fit enough to cycle to church, she might ask them about where bikes could be left securely during services. There we are. I have received a report from the tellers in the eye lobby from the division that took place at 6.59 yesterday on the question that the health protection coronavirus restrictions, steps and other provisions England Amendment No. 2 regulations 2001 be made. The Honourable Member for Lewis, Maria Curlfield, has informed me that the number of eye votes was erroneously reported as 461 rather than 489. I will direct the clerk to correct the numbers in the journal accordingly. The eyes were 489, the noes were 60, the eyes have it, the eyes have it, the nays were correctly recorded in Hansel. Order. We are now suspending the House for three minutes to enable necessary business arrangements to be made.
Order. I now call the Secretary of State, Elizabeth Trust, to make a statement. Elizabeth. Mr Speaker, I wish to make a statement on the new UK-Australia Free Trade Agreement secured by our Prime Ministers this Tuesday. We have agreed a truly historic deal, which is the first negotiated from scratch by the United Kingdom since leaving the European Union. This gold standard agreement shows what the UK is capable of as a sovereign trading nation, securing huge benefits like zero tariff access to Australia for all British goods, world-leading provisions in digital and services, whilst making it easier for Brits to live and work in Australia. It also paves the way for the UK's accession to the vast market covered by the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, coupling us with some of the world's largest and fast-growing economies in worth $9 trillion in global GDP. Our Australia deal shows that global Britain is a force for free and fair trade around the world. We believe in 21st century trade. We don't see it as a zero-sum game like our critics, who doubt we can compete and win in the global market. We want to be nimble, positive and open to new ideas, talent and products, without sacrificing our sovereignty. We've laid out the core benefits of this deal in the Agreement in Principle document. It means that 4.3 billion of goods exports will no longer have to pay tariffs to enter the Australian market, from Scotch whisky and Stoke-on-Trent ceramics to the 10,000 cars we currently export from the north of England. Meanwhile, we will enjoy greater choice and top value in Aussie favourites like wine, swimwear and biscuits. Young Brits under the age of 35 will be able to live and work in Australia for up to three years, with no strings attached. And our work and mobility agreement goes beyond what Australia agreed with either Japan or the United States, making it easier for Brits to live and work in Australia. We've agreed strong services and digital chapters, which secure the free flow of data and the right for British lawyers and other professionals to work in Australia without needing to re-qualify. We've secured access to billions of pounds in government procurement which would benefit firms like Leeds-based Turner and Townsend, who are contracted to expand the Sydney Metro. This deal promotes high standards, with the first animal welfare chapter in an Australian trade deal, as well as strong provisions on climate change, gender equality and development. On agriculture, it's important that we have a proper transition period. That's why we've agreed 15 years of capped tariff-free imports from Australia which means that Australian farmers will only have the same access to the UK market as EU farmers do in 2036. We should use this time to expand our beef and lamb exports to the CPTPP markets, which are expected to account for a quarter of global meat demand by 2030. I don't buy this defeatist narrative that British agriculture can't compete. We have a high-quality, high-value product which people want to buy, particularly in the growing middle classes of Asia. This Australia deal is a key step to joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a market of 500 million people which has high standards trade, 95% tariff-free access, and very strong provisions in digital and services, which are of huge benefit to Britain, the second largest services exporter in the world. It covers the fastest growing parts of the world where Britain needs to be positioned in the coming decades. While some look to the past and cling to static analysis based on what the world is like today, we are focused on the future and what the world will be like in 2030, 2040 and 2050. Of course, Parliament will have its full opportunity to scrutinise this agreement. Our processes are in line with those of other parliamentary democracies, like Canada and New Zealand. The Trade and Agriculture Commission will play a full role, providing expert and independent advice. And the House can rest assured that this deal upholds our world-class standards, from food safety to animal welfare to the environment. Following the agreement in principle, we will finalise the text of the full FTA which will then undergo a legal scrub 
before being presented to Parliament alongside an economic impact assessment. And I look forward to further scrutiny from the Trade Select Committee and the Chair of the DEFRA Select Committee. This deal means we have now struck agreements with 68 countries plus the EU, securing trade relations worth £744 billion as of last year. This deal with our great friend and ally Australia is just the start of our new post-Brexit trade agreements. And it's fundamentally about what type of country we want Britain to be. Do we want to be a country that embraces opportunity, looks to the future, believes its industries can compete, and that its product is just what the world wants? Or do we accept the narrative some peddle that we need to stay hiding behind the same protectionist walls that we had in the EU because we can't possibly compete and succeed? To my mind, the answer lies in free trade. And our country has always been at its best when we've been a free trading nation. This deal is a glimpse into Britain's future, a future where we're a global hub for digital and services, where our high quality food and drink and manufactured goods are enjoyed across the world, and we are open to the best that our friends and allies have to offer. That, Mr Speaker, is what this deal represents, and I commend this statement to the House. I now call the Shadow Secretary, Emily Thornberry, who has five minutes to reply. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Secretary of State for, for both for the out, um, advance side of her statement and for publishing the outline agreement at quarter to one last night. I, I must say, uh, if you don't mind me saying, nothing screams confidence in the deal you've negotiated like slipping it onto your website after midnight. I will not address every element of the deal the Secretary of State has highlighted today. On some, we will have to reserve judgment until we have seen the full treaty text and the economic impact assessment. After all, Mr Speaker, this was the Secretary of State who agreed a brand new Japan deal, which turned out, according to her own figures, to deliver lower benefits for Britain than the one that we already had. However, the one area of this deal where we can reach a verdict now are the terms agreed on agriculture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in doing so, Mr Speaker, I am not going to hold the Secretary of State to some impossible ideal. I'm simply going to hold her to the past commitments she has made to protect our standards and protect our farming industry. So let us start with standards. The Secretary of State said last October that she would not sign a trade deal which would allow British farmers to be undercut by cheap yep. imports produced using practices that are allowed in other countries countries but banned in the UK. She called that an important principle. So let me just give her ten examples of such practices in Australia, allowing slurry to pollute rivers, using growth promoting antibiotics, housing hens in battery cages, trimming their beaks with hot blades, mulesing young lambs, keeping pregnant pigs in sow stalls, branding cattle with hot irons, dehorning and spraying them without pain relief, and routinely transporting livestock for 48 hours without rest, food or water. Exactly. All practices in common use in Australia, all practices banned in Britain. And yet, under the deal that she has signed, the meat from farms that use those practices will come into our country tariff free, undermining British standards, undercutting British farmers, and breaking the promises made to the British people. Yeah. So much for protecting our standards. What about protecting our farming industry? The Secretary of State said last November, we have no intention of ever striking a deal that doesn't benefit our farmers. And yet, and yet, the deal that she has just signed will allow Amer Australia's farm corporations to export more than 60 times the amount of beef next year as they exported to Britain last year, before they pay a single penny in tariffs. It is the equivalent of immediate, unlimited, tariff-free trade, which is why the Secretary of State, when the Secretary of State says Australian farmers will be in the same position as EU farmers after 15 years, she is talking nonsense. There will be exactly, we, they will be in exactly the same position from year one, but without the requirement to meet EU standards. No wonder Australia's former negotiator at WTO has said, and I quote, I don't think we've ever done as well as this. Uh, getting rid of all tariffs, all quotas forever is virtually an unprecedented result. Yep. 
And of course, he's right, Mr Speaker. When Japan and Korea negotiated their deals with Australia, they set tariff-free allowances in year one, which allowed for a modest increase from the amount of beef Australia had exported to them in the previous year. 7% for, for Korea, 10% for Japan. By comparison, the Secretary of State has just signed a deal which allows Australia to increase ex exports of beef by 6,000% without paying any tariffs. And Mr Speaker, in the government's own scoping paper last July, we have it in black and white. That increase in Australian exports will mean, and I quote, a fall in output and employment in the UK's agriculture sector. British farms, what you, the Honourable Lady says it's wrong, I'm just quoting her department. British farmers left worse off as a result of her deal, another broken promise and more to come when New Zealand, Canada, Brazil and America demand the same deal from their exports. Mr Speaker, let me be absolutely clear. We want good trade deals with other countries. We want trade deals that will create jobs, support our industries, strengthen our, our economy, strengthen our recovery. But to be blunt about it, we want the same kind of results for our trade deals that Australia has just achieved from us. In closing, Mr Speaker, the Secretary of State told the newspapers in April that she would sit her inexperienced Australian counterpart in an uncomfortable chair and show him how to play at this level. I'm afraid, Mr Speaker, this deal has exposed the Secretary of State as the one who is not up to the job. And Britain needs and deserves better. We need someone who will keep the promises they make to the public and to Parliament, someone who will promote British standards around the world, not allow them to be undermined, someone who will protect our farming and steel industries, not throw them to the wolves, someone who will get the results for their country that the Australian Trade Minister has delivered for his. The Secretary of State has shown that she is not that person, so there is only one question that matters today. Will she guarantee to give Parliament not just a debate, but a binding vote on the deal that she has agreed with Australia so that we can reject the terms that she has agreed on farming and send someone else back to the table to get a better deal for our country? Yeah. Yeah. So state. Well, Mr Speaker, it's not a surprise that the Honourable Lady is relentlessly negative yeah. about the opportunities of the Australia deal and the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I'm surprised that she's known as the Secretary of State or the Shadow Secretary of State for International Trade. She should be known as the Sec Shadow Secretary of State against international trade because there's not a single trade deal that she supports. She had nothing to say about the tariff-free access for all British goods, from cars to whiskey, that we are going to secure under this agreement. She had nothing to say about the benefits for the under 35s of being able to live and work in Australia for three years with no strings attached. She had nothing to say about digital and services, even though the UK is the second largest services exporter in the world. Instead, she talked about agriculture, which is a new interest for her because we haven't really heard her say much about it in the past. Let me be clear, Mr Speaker. In year one, the cap on Australian exports to the UK in beef will be 35,000 tonnes of beef. Now, we currently import 230,000 tonnes from the EU. So the cap is 15% of what we currently import from the EU. That is not the same access that the EU have. It's only 15% of the access. In fact, Australian farmers will only have the same access as the EU in 2036. And she talks about animal welfare standards, Mr Speaker. Australia has been rated five out of five in international ratings on animal welfare standards. And in many cases, in many cases, Mr Speaker, those animal welfare standards are higher than they are in the EU. But not once, not once, Mr Speaker. Did the Honourable Lady complain about the zero tariff, zero quota deal from the EU? Not once has she talked about animal welfare standards in the EU, apart from claiming that she likes Danish pork. Mr Speaker, the reality is that the lady opposite simply wants to stay in the EU. She doesn't want to look at the future opportunities. She's not interested in where Britain can go in the future. And she is not interested 
in expanding Britain's trade and delivering more jobs in this country. Let us go to Sir Roger Gale. Sir Roger. Thank you, Thank you Mr Speaker. I certainly don't intend to criticise my right honourable friend, who's clearly put a lot of work into this, um, without even beginning to know the details of the deal that has been struck. And it's clearly the case that we do need to strike agreements with not only Australia, but also with the Pacific Partnership and Canada and the United States and South America. But um, my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, spent part of the G7 weekend firefighting the fallout from a badly negotiated deal over the um, Northern Ireland Protocol, which demonstrates why parliamentary scrutiny is necessary. I'm pleased to hear that um, my right honourable friend has said that this will be the subject of a parliamentary debate. I assume, and perhaps she can confirm this, that that will mean that there will also be a vote. And can she tell the House when the Trade and Agriculture Commission will actually be fully functioning up and running? and what, when impact assessments in relation to this deal will be published. I thank my honourable friend for his question. I can tell him that we have already put out expressions of interest to serve on the Trade and Agriculture Commission. That will be in place before we need to have the scrutiny of the agreement. The scrutiny of the agreement will take place when we have reached the final signed agreement. That will be presented to Parliament in advance of the presentation to all of Parliament, it will be given to the International Trade Select Committee and to the Chairman of the DEFRA Select Committee for scrutiny. It will then go to Parliament. It will go through the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act process. And during that process, MPs are able to block the deal if they do not support it. I believe the deal I have negotiated is positive. Uh, for the United Kingdom, and it will command parliamentary support, but the, there is always that option open to members of parliament. Right, let's go to SNP spokesperson Drew Hendry, who's got two minutes. Drew. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you to the Secretary of State for advanced sight of her statement. But for all the bluster, she knows that any deal with Australia can't even make a dent on the shortfall created by the trading disaster of leaving the EU. The simple fact is that we're doing much less trade now than before January the 1st. And this deal will take 15 years to deliver one two hundredth of the benefits lost from EU membership, a loss that's already cost Scotland's economy around £4 billion and is projected to cost every person £1,600 in red tape and barriers to trade. The Secretary of State talks of whisky exports to Australia whilst ignoring the fact that the Brexit cost of goods for distilleries have shot up around 20% in addition to lost trade. This deal can't come close to mitigating their costs or sales. 14 of Scotland's food and drink organisations have written to her, saying that they've been ignored by this government. They are Scotland's farmers, crofters, producers and manufacturers. They know that they're being dragged underwater by yet another Westminster government that simply doesn't care. And for what? Swimwear? In the 1970s, the Tories were officially calling Scottish fishing expendable and repeated that attitude on the way out of the EU. Even the Tories and Scottish constituencies are now showing the same contempt for Scottish agriculture. They failed to back any amendments to legislation that would protect UK standards in trade negotiations or even public services. So can she guarantee that this deal does not include investor state dispute settlement mechanisms that could give corporations the right to sue governments over actions affecting their profits, potentially leading to privatisation of public services like the NHS or changes to workers' rights? Could she tell us how she will guarantee that no cut of hormone injected beef from Australia or food products treated with pesticides and antibiotics will appear on our supermarket shelves? She can't, can she? Or will she simply duck these questions and prove once again that the only way to protect Scotland's business and consumers is through independence. Secretary of State. Well, I was hoping, Mr Speaker, that the SNP spokesman would welcome today's announcement about the Airbus Boeing dispute and the fact that we have continued to suspend the tariffs on Scotch whisky uh, in a deal with the US. Mr Speaker, I have much more faith than the honourable gentleman does in Scotland's beef and lamb industry. I think it's some of the best beef and lamb in the world. I'm excited about the opportunities 
in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which by 2030 will be eating 25% of the world's meat. And I think he should be looking forward to those opportunities rather than harking back to the time we were members of the EU. He needs to look at where the fast-growing markets of the future are. That's where Scotland's opportunities lie. I can absolutely confirm that ISDS is not part of our trade agreement with Australia, and I can also assure him that no hormone-injected beef will be allowed into the UK. No come to Jacob yet. Good day, Mr Speaker. Uh, can I thank the Secretary of State for this gold standard trade deal with our long-standing friends and allies. She will know that Teesside has a long history of exporting to Australia, including the Sydney Harbour Bridge, which was made from Dom and Long's Teesside steel. Can my right honourable friend confirm that this trade deal will mean simpler trade for chemicals, cars and steel, cheaper prices for my constituents and easier travel to and from Australia? Yeah. Yeah. Well, my honourable friend is absolutely right. Teesside is, Teesside is absolutely set to benefit from this deal. There will be a removal on tariffs on products like steel and chemicals. No British product will face tariffs into Australia. And the North East is already incredibly successful at exporting 10,000 cars to Australia every year. That tariff on cars will be removed, allowing even more of our fantastic exports down under. Let's go to the Chair Select Committee, Angus Brendan McNeil. Angus. Uh, Tablo, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, uh, some are saying that uh, Australia have never had it so, such good luck in any trade negotiation at all, and wonder if the UK hadn't been at the table how this would have been different, and suspect Canberra is probably running out of champagne, Mr. Speaker. But the reality is, is that UK farmers are facing quantities of beef, sugar, lamb, cheese, and other dairy products arriving in year one of the deal and they never faced as part of the, e of the EU in any year from Australia. And to make up the Brexit damage, they would need about 245 such deals that are very risky uh, to farming. Uh, there's a feeling of unseemly haste with this deal, uh, something the EU, incidentally, would not do risking its farmers. Uh, with all that in mind and with the need for scrutiny, will she appear at our committee in the next week, 10 days, the International Trade Committee, so that we can have a good to and fro and a good uh, investigation of the issues before she signs the deal and before Australia have her in any handcuffs whatsoever. So stay. Well, I'm, I'm interested that the chairman of the select committee uh, accuses me of haste. Uh, it is true that the EU is currently in their fourth year of negotiations with Australia, uh, just as they take a very long time to negotiate any deal with any party because fundamentally the instincts of the EU aren't to open up their markets and that has cost British business over the years because we haven't had access to Australia to those Pacific markets at the same terms as others. Uh, I can assure the Honourable Gentleman that I will appear in front of his committee uh, to answer questions prior to signing. I'm very happy to uh, give him any kind of briefing and as he knows he will get a copy of the signed trade agreement before anyone else. I'm afraid I can't understand the Honourable Gentleman's gesticulations, <laughs> Mr Speaker, because there is no sound. Uh, so uh, I think he's very happy uh, that I'm appearing. Uh, I think that's the message I've received, uh, that he's very happy uh, that I'm appearing from. Because he, and as I've already said to the Honourable Lady, you know, in any of those 15 years that we have a transition period for beef and lamb access, none of those years is higher than the amount we currently import from the EU. And I do find it extraordinary that the party opposite are happy with a zero tariff, zero quota deal with a landmass which is much closer to the UK, and they're afraid of a country that is 9,000 miles away. It just seems to be one rule for their friends in the EU and one rule for everybody else. My help if he goes on training with the British Sign Language course. Right, let us come to David Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. May I congratulate my right honourable yeah, friend yeah, on securing yeah, this yeah, yeah, yeah. agreement? Uh, as you will know, uh, certain farming organisations have expressed concern uh, about this deal. Uh, but will she uh, repeat once again that there will be no reduction in the standards of food that will be allowed to be offered for sale on the British market. 
And will she further invite those organisations, rather than expressing concern, to work with her and, department, and her department to secure the best possible outcome of the agreement she's achieved? Seriously? Well, I thank, I thank my honourable friend. And there are huge opportunities for British products overseas. There's a growing global market for these products. And the vast majority of Australians' beef and lamb goes to the Asian markets where prices are higher. And that is where the opportunity lies for Welsh lamb and beef, is to get better access into those markets so we too can benefit from those higher prices. And I welcome uh, the opportunity to work with the farming industry. I've already talked to the NFU uh, about how we can work closely together to promote British exports, to get more agriculture councillors uh, into those markets so we can realise the opportunities of this deal. Let's go to Sir Olney. Sarah. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, the, the Secretary of State just referred there to the fact that Australia is 9,000 miles away compared to, obviously, the markets, that, uh, the trade that we were doing with the EU. So I'd be grateful if she could confirm how, through this deal, the UK are actually reducing their carbon emissions uh, in their international trade and what this deal will do to help the government towards its net zero uh, goals by 2030. So state. Well, I'm pleased to say, Mr Speaker, that this deal is the first that Australia has signed that has specific references to us achieving our climate change objectives. And we're working very closely with the Australian government and other allies to reach net zero. Let's go to Duncan Baker. Duncan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I warmly congratulate my right honourable friend on this deal. Uh, the Secretary of State has now signed, what is it, 68 trade deals. Given the Shadow Secretary of State comments, I'd love to know how she thinks that's not up to the job. But whilst the doubters are still stuck in the past, can my right honourable friend reconfirm that this free trade agreement not only paves the way to CPTPP membership for the UK, but that membership of the CPTPP would provide untold opportunities for our businesses, by opening up access to 11 Pacific markets worth £9 trillion, something that, as a believer in free markets, we cannot overlook. Well, I thank my honourable friend for his question. We are expecting trade with those 11 countries to grow by 65% by 2030. It's a huge opportunity for the United Kingdom. It's got very high standards in areas like digital and services, where we're the second largest exporter in the world. And what we've agreed with Australia also covers the market access negotiations for CPTPP. So this is a very important stepping stone for those broader opportunities that are in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Let's go to Mick Whitley. Mick. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Investor stake dispute settlement clauses allow multinational corporations to take sovereign governments to court simply for acting in the best interest of their citizens. They've been used to sue governments for taking part in their health services back into public control and by fossil fuel companies to undermine vital environmental regulations. They make a mockery of the idea of taking back control. Can the Minister reassure the House that investor state dispute settlement clauses will be excluded from the UK Australian negotiations? And can she guarantee the House that there will be a full debate and meaningful vote for MPs on this agreement and all future agreements? Thank you. Well, I disagree uh, with his characterisation of ISDS. The fact is that those clauses are in trade agreements, and in fact, we've already got more than 60. ISDS clauses in various investment agreements to protect British businesses from unfair actions by overseas countries, such as the appropriation of property. And the UK has never, ever lost an ISDS case, because we are a country that follows the rules and implements our laws and regulations in a fair way. But in any case, there isn't an ISDS call clause in the Australia trade deal. Dr James Davies. James. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Snowdonia Cheese Company, which is based in Rill but also has footprints in Deeside and Wrexham, is expanding 20 to 30 per cent per annum and is a North Walian success story, combining milk from local farmers with brand Britain to rapidly expand its sales overseas. 
Australia is a key market for Snowdonia cheese, and with tariffs lifted, the company stands to do even better. Will my right honourable friend visit Rill to celebrate with the company their enthusiasm for a UK-Australia trade deal? Joe well, this, this deal is great for UK cheese companies. There is currently an 11% tariff uh, faced by products like Snowdonia cheese, which will be removed uh, as part of this deal. And I'd be delighted uh, to come and visit the country, company and celebrate their success. And this is what we want to see. Currently, only one in five of our food and drink companies export. There are huge opportunities overseas, and we need to uh, see more follow the lead of the Snowdonia Cheese Company. Let's go to Kate Osmore. Kate. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, there is grave concern across the farming industry, not just about this deal, but about the potential precedent it sets for our future deals with New Zealand, the United States, Brazil and Canada. Will the Secretary of State agree as a matter of urgency to publish an assessment of the amassed impact on our farming communities if deals on this same basis as Australia are agreed with all those other countries? Well, I'm very clear that this deal doesn't set a precedent for other agreements. The reason that we have uh, agreed this liberalisation is because Australia is liberalising all of its trade with us including on goods, uh, services, digital and mobility. So this is an agreement between two very like-minded partners who share the same high standards, who believe in free trade. Of course, we will be striking different sorts of agreements depending on how much other partners are prepared to open up their markets. Thank you, Mr Speaker. While some in this place hark back to a delightfully rose-tinted past, I'm pleased it's this side of the House that are really looking to the future. Yeah. And this is the first major trade deal we have signed since we left the European Union. So on that, does my right honourable friend agree with me that this is a fantastic example of how we can use the opportunities available to us as a sovereign trading nation to deliver for Bishop Auckland residents and for people right across our nation? Yeah. So this is our first from scratch negotiated trade deal and I think we've shown here what we want to do as the United Kingdom. We've gone further than the US or Japan did with Australia in terms of getting uh, the ability for British workers uh, to go and work and live in Australia. Uh, we've achieved huge amounts on youth mobility, under 35s being able to go to Australia for three years with no strings attached and complete tariff-free access for British goods, gold standards in areas like digital services and also technologies of the future like artificial intelligence. So I think that benefits my honourable friend's constituency, but also the entire United Kingdom. Let's go to Dr Philippa Whitford. Philippa. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Antimicrobial resistance is a major global health threat, which led the EU and UK to ban regular antibiotic use to promote growth in farm animals in 2006. Australia continues to allow antibiotics to be used as growth promoters without any requirement for farmers to even report multi-resistant bacterial infections. So how will the Trade Secretary prevent the import of such antibiotic-fed meat to protect Scotland's high food standards, our farmers and our future health? So stay. Let me be absolutely clear, Mr Speaker. We are not lowering our food import standards as a result of this deal. We are absolutely maintaining that, so no hormone-injected beef will be uh, allowed into the United Kingdom. But let me just be clear, all of the questions coming from the opposite side of the House seem to imply that we need regulatory harmonisation with everybody we trade with. That is the EU model. We've left the EU. We believe that other countries should be in charge of their own rules and regulations, and we should have the sovereignty to set our own rules and regulations. The, what the people opposite seem to be arguing for, Mr Speaker, is global regulatory harmonisation. Let's go to Danny Kruger. Danny. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, my constituency of Devizes is home to some of the best farmers in the world. 
including the current Farmers Weekly Beef Farmer of the Year, James Waite of Enford Farm. So I'm very positive about the opportunities for more exports of Wiltshire produce, and I congratulate the Secretary of State on concluding this deal. But I'm even more positive about the opportunity for our farmers to have a bigger share of the UK market. We already import three quarters of the food we eat in this country, and to my mind, that's too much. So can she reassure me that this deal will not undercut farmers in Wiltshire with cheap, low-quality imports? Secretary of State. Well, I know, I know my honourable friend believes in both beef and liberty, and I can assure him that that's exactly what this deal delivers. There are huge opportunities overseas for our beef farmers, and that is what we are seeking to open up. Of course, we opened up the US market last year, which now we've got beef going from England, uh, Wales and Northern Ireland into the United States. And you know, I agree with him. I think there are huge opportunities for our farmers freed from the common agricultural policy, which has held them back, and with a new uh, pro-animal welfare, pro-environment policy here in the United Kingdom. John Speller. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And Australia, like Canada, is one of our oldest and closest allies, and many of us have family and friends there. So does the Secretary of State share my concern that the anti-trade lobby don't want us to do a trade deal with either of them, nor indeed with the United States and Singapore, for that matter? So had she had any indication from the anti-trade lobby as to which countries they think we can and should do trade deals with? Welcome voice from the benches opposite. If only, if only he could be promoted into a position on the front bench, we might see, uh, we might, well, even leader, a very good idea, I think. Um, we might see a more sensible pro-growth, pro-trade policy on the opposition benches. It seems to me, Mr Speaker, that the only group that the party opposite wants us to do a deal with are the EU. In fact, they want us to rejoin the EU. That's the very strong message I'm getting from the party opposite. Aaron Bell. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, could I uh, firstly thank the Secretary of State for her statement and secondly congratulate her and her team on this achievement. The point of free trade, as she said in her statement, is it's not a zero-sum game. It can be win-win for both us and for Australia, both for our exporters, such as the ceramics firms in neighbouring Stoke-on-Trent, and for consumers, such as my constituents in Newcastle-under-Lyme. So can she confirm that through this deal, Aussie favourites such as wine, Jacobs, uh, Jacobs Creek and Hardy's, swimwear, as she mentioned, uh, confectionery, will be uh, much cheaper and there will be more choice for British consumers, saving over £34 million a year in year one? Well, my, my honourable friend is right that this idea that free trade or free trade deals are simply about who wins and who loses is completely wrong. The whole point, these, Australia are an old friend of the United Kingdom. We want to trade more with each other. We want to give opportunities for our young people in both countries. We want to give opportunities for our exporters. And thus, all of us can become more successful, have more jobs and more growth in every local area from ceramics uh, to all the other industries, as well as being able to get their hands on those fantastic uh, Australian goods like swimwear and Tim Tams, and of course Australian wine, which I've been drinking quite a lot of this week, Mr Speaker. McCaskill. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Secretary of State has mentioned in earlier answers uh, climate change, but hasn't said what assessment has been made of increased greenhouse gas emissions because of shipping the volumes of Australian beef and lamb uh, that their acting Prime Minister is salivating over. Uh, has that been done? Can she advise, or is it anticipated that be, price will be paid and offset will come from a, a reduction in ferry and freight traffic in rural parts, in particular in Scotland, who will pay the price and the consequences of this? I, I absolutely refute the honourable gentleman's suggestion that Scottish uh, farmers aren't going to benefit from this deal. This is a key stepping stone to CPTPP. By 2030, CPTPP countries will be eating 25% of the world's meat. And I want to make sure they're eating Scottish beef and Scottish lamb. And of course, we're absolutely committed to our net zero target. The Australians are committed to a net zero target. And we will make sure those targets are achieved. Craig Williams. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I, can I thank my right honourable friend for engaging with the International Trade Committee and I look forward to scrutinising the legal text. Welsh beef, Welsh lamb, 
Welsh dairy, Welsh cheese, Welsh agri-products are wanted around the world. And I am confident with my farmers that this trade deal and access TPP will benefit them. There are scaremongers bleating on from the other side, which is an echo from the former Brexit debate. But can my right honourable friend reassure me and reassure my farmers that they are at the heart of our trade policy, not an afterthought? Secretary of Trust. Farming is absolutely at the heart of our trade policy. That's why we've worked to get the US market open to British beef. Yesterday, we announced that British poultry will now be going into Japan uh, for the first time. There are huge opportunities in these markets, which generally have higher prices than here in the United Kingdom. And that is where the future of global Britain lies, supporting our farmers with their fantastic products, get them out into world markets, learning from others with ideas and innovation, not closing ourselves off to the future, which is what the party opposite seem to be advocating. Let's go to Ben Lake. Ben. Yes, Mr Speaker. The Secretary of State makes much of the so-called transition period secured for farmers, but information on the Australian Government website suggests the tariff rate quota for Australian beef will increase nearly tenfold immediately, and that the deal will see the quota for Australian lamb nearly doubled in the first year. If she is serious about wanting farmers to compete and succeed, why, at the very first attempt, has she conceded to such a drastic and immediate increase in tariff rate quotas that imperils the future of Welsh agriculture before domestic post-EU agricultural policies are even in place? Secretary of Trust. The fact is that there is very little Australian beef imported at the moment. What makes much more sense is to compare the amount in year one 35,000 to the amount we currently import to, from the EU, which is 230,000 tonnes of beef. And the Honourable Gentleman, I don't remember him complaining when we agreed a tariff free, quota free deal with the EU, which is exporting far more uh, beef and lamb than is under our agreement with Australia. In fact, the likelihood is over time some of those Australian exports will simply replace exports from the EU. Let's go to Dr Neil Hudson. Neil. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I welcome the prospect of a productive trade agreement with our closest friends in Australia, but it has to be right for both partners. As a vet who has worked on farms in the UK and Australia, I very much welcome confirmation from the Prime Minister yesterday in the House that this deal will be the first ever to incorporate high animal welfare standards. Will my right honourable friend reassure the farmers and food producers in Cumbria and across the UK that tariff rate quotas and animal welfare clauses will be used in the agreement to safeguard it and that the Trade and Agriculture Commission will be constituted in time to allow for meaningful parliamentary scrutiny of this deal so we get it right for farmers, producers, and not least animals in both our countries. Secretary Truss. I can confirm to my honourable friend that there will be an animal welfare chapter in the agreement. We've published the outlines of that in the AIP document uh, that we've put online today. Uh, I can also confirm to him there will be a transition period of 15 years, uh, which will give significant time to our farmers both to uh, work on this, but also to expand exports into these important markets in CPTPP. And I recognise my honourable friend's expertise in this area, and I very much welcome his engagement as we approach the signing process. John Crow. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, you know, it always amazes me how a legion of ministers come to this dispatch box and pretend they're great independent-minded Eurosceptics, and always have been. The reality is most of them towed the line, voted for Remain, and then did a bit of quick backpedalling afterwards, like the ministries at the dispatch box today. But while she's on the subject, she said that uh, the deal will be subject to full parliamentary scrutiny. Does that mean it will be subject to primary legislation or not? Yeah. Simple question. The deal will be subject to full parliamentary scrutiny. It will be subject to exactly the same parliamentary scrutiny that the EU deal was. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank the outstanding Secretary of State to come to the House to update her on the free trade agreement. Would you agree with me that all free trade agreements end in lower consumer prices, 
great opportunities for exporters, makes industry more efficient and allows developing countries to develop. So could I, in a way, agree with the previous questioner? Let's have a debate on the Australian Free Trade Agreement and let these benches vote in favour of it and let members on the other side decide whether they believe in Britain or not. Secretary of Trust. Well, I, fear that I fear we know the answer already uh, as to whether they believe in Britain or not. This, this deal will go through uh, the proper parliamentary scrutiny process. It goes through the CRAG process, as all international treaties do. And can I concur with my honourable friend that the idea that the future of Britain should be closing ourselves off to the rest of the world, putting up high tariff barriers, not innovating, not learning, not sharing ideas, is the recipe for penury, not the recipe for success. Brendan Thank you, Mr Speaker. My Gail and Butte constituency overwhelmingly rejected Brexit because we knew what it would do to our farming and our fishing industry. And she concerned that the Australian farmers are hailing this as a huge victory, while Scottish farmers are seeing this as a complete betrayal. And will she therefore explain to the hill farming communities in my constituency how the flooding of the UK market with cheap, factory farmed, inferior produced meats is the golden opportunity the Prime Minister promised that this deal would be? Secretary of Trust. Well, I think his farmers deserve better than the ludicrous scaremongering that he's been putting forward. I congratulate my right honourable friend and all her officials on this excellent deal. Isn't the quality of this deal and the speed with which it's been agreed a testament to what can be achieved by high standards nations when they come together properly as partners and negotiate in good faith? And will she agree with me that this all goes very well for our accession to CPTPP? Yeah. Yeah. Trust. Well, I agree with my honourable friend. The fact is that the UK is now open to doing liberalising trade deals around the world. We believe that our farmers, our manufacturers, our services companies are able to compete successfully, and we, we believe that we are better uh, when we are able to share ideas, to trade with our friends uh, right across the globe. And I can assure him that this is only the start of our free trade agreement programme. Uh, we're working on CPTPP accession, uh, we're working on deals with other countries around the world, and we are going to make Global Britain a success, and we are going to make the UK a hub for trade in all areas from food and drink to manufacturing to services and digital. Mohammed Yassin. Mohammed. Mr. Speaker, can I ask the Secretary of State to confirm that our proposed deal will reduce tariffs on meat produced using growth promoting antibiotics? which UK farmers are banned from using? And if so, how is it consistent with the repeated promises that she and other ministers have made that our farmers will not be undermined by food reduced to lower standards than they are required to meet? Secretary Truss. I reject the argument that standards in Australia are low standards, but what the Honourable Gentleman seems to be arguing for is that we should only trade with countries that have exactly the same regulations and rules as the United Kingdom. And I think that is frankly a ludicrous proposition that would lead to us trading with virtually no one. And let me be clear, we are not reducing our import standards. We're not allowing hormone-injected beef into the United Kingdom. Alexander Stafford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I also join with the other members of this House and congratulate my right honourable friend on this great deal? And can I also thank her for making the first scratch built uh, deal with a Commonwealth country, Australia being a key member of the Commonwealth? The Commonwealth has been historically neglected by this country over the last few decades. But does she agree with me? Now we can do our own free trade deals outside of the European Union. We should focus our efforts on the Commonwealth and keep maintaining our great ties with our, these Commonwealth nations who have got great history and cultural issues together and trade can bring us all together even better. Secretary of Trust. My honourable friend is absolutely right. You know, these are like-minded countries who we have long historical links with. They are our friends and families. And I'm pleased to say that immediately after this statement, Mr Speaker, I will be meeting the New Zealand Trade Minister uh, to hopefully make further progress on that deal. Let's go to Stephen Furry. Stephen. Uh, 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Post Brexit, the EU remains our biggest export market by far. I believe that the overarching trade priority must be to address the remaining non tariff barriers with the EU beyond the TCA, including around SPS rules. So, can the Secretary of State assure me that the SPS chapter of this Australia deal, based around equivalence rather than, rather than alignment, will not compromise the UK's options regarding any future EU veterinary agreements? I believe it does. So state. Well, I observe that the uh, New Zealanders have a veterinary agreement with the EU, but they also have their own independent SPS policy. And let me be clear, we are not dynamically aligning with the EU's SPS policies. And in fact, in our agreement in principle, it makes it very clear that both Australia and the United Kingdom have their own independent SPS regimes. Richard Phillip. Uh, Mr Speaker, there can't be British citizens in the Australian Parliament but there are Australians in this Parliament, and I, for one, would like to commend my right hon. Friend for securing this deal. She will understand that one of the benefits of this deal, strategic benefits, is to set the basis for a global arrangement on standards in services. Could she indicate to the House what progress she made in this deal towards that strategic objective? Secretary State. Well, my, my hon. Friend is right, and in this deal, we have uh, agreement on the free flow of data. Uh, we have agreement on very advanced provisions around uh, the mobility of professionals, uh, the recognition of qualifications, and a whole host of very positive arrangements in areas like investment and procurement. And by Australia and the United Kingdom working together to set standards alongside other allies, we can help challenge unfair trade practices across the world and make sure that we are standing up for good rules-based trade, rules -based trade in areas where the UK leads. Shannon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the Secretary of State for her statement. Um, whilst I welcome the deal as a signal of things to come when we are unfettered from Europe as an entire nation and not just three out of four regions, I still have great concerns that our quality lamb and beef sectors, particularly those in Northern Ireland, so renowned for quality and high standards and who depend on exports across the world. Last week, the Secretary of State, uh, in a reply to another question, referred to the contract uh, as secured by foil meats. Well, that's good news that one person has done that. It has to be more. While, will the Secretary of State give assurance our, our over standards, such as the use of antibiotics, which may be notably higher in meat from other countries? Our standards in Northern Ireland are some of the best in the world. We need to retain them. Well, Northern Ireland is a very successful exporter of agricultural products, and we want to make sure that there are more opportunities, not just in the US markets, which is now exported to by Foil Food Group, but right across the world, including CPTPP. Let's go to the final question from Kevin Holdenray. Kevin. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I congratulate uh, the Secretary of State on a very significant achievement? It's also a very important precedent that she has set, as this deal was done from scratch. It sets the basis for potentially all our future trade agreements. Does my right honourable friend agree that we must include something in this agreement that has been missed in other international free trade agreements around the world? It must establish and maintain a fair and level playing field for uh, UK businesses employing UK people, uh, particularly in the food and farming sector. Secretary Trice. Well, I'm pleased to say that our agreement with Australia will contain a very strong Labour chapter and also an SME chapter to cut the red tape on our fantastic small and medium sized enterprises that want to export around the world, cutting their paperwork so they can get more of their fantastic goods including, of course, food and drink companies. I am now suspending the House for three minutes to enable necessary arrangements to be made for the next business. Order.
When we're ready. Are you ready? <laughs> Order. Before I call the Leader of the House, I want to pay tribute no. to Sir Roy Stone, the Principal Private Secretary to the Government Chief Whip, who is leading the civil service this week. Sir Roy is only the fourth person to have held this role in a century. He has done so with distinction for more than 20 years. In helping facilitate the smooth running of parliamentary business, he has served this House as well as successive governments. I am sure the whole House will join me in wishing him well for the future. I have got to say, personally, I have always felt him. Not only has it been great advice, working very well behind the scenes, being in charge of usual, the usual channels, I've got to say, he will be missed by all sides within this House. I do wish him well. I now call the Leader of the House to make the business statement. Leader. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. The business for the week commencing the 21st of June will include Monday, the 21st of June, an opposition day, third allotted day. There will be a debate on a motion relating to planning, followed by a debate on a motion relating to steel. Both debates will arise on a motion in the name of the official opposition. Tuesday, the 22nd of June, the second reading of the Northern Ireland Ministers' Elections and Petitions of Concern Bill. Wednesday, the 23rd of June, consideration in committee of the Armed Forces Bill. Thursday, the 24th of June, a general debate on the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, followed by a general debate on UK defence spending. The subject for these debates was determined by the backbench for this debate was determined by the backbench business committee. Friday, the 25th of June, the House will not be sitting. The provisional business for the week commencing the 28th of June will include Monday, the 28th of June, the second reading of the Rating Coronavirus and Directors Disqualification Dissolved Companies Bill, Tuesday, the 29th of June, Estimates Day, first allotted, subjects to be confirmed. Wednesday, the 30th of June, Estimates Day, second allotted day, subjects to be confirmed. At 7 o'clock, the House will be asked to agree all outstanding estimates. Thursday, the 1st of July, Proceedings on the Supply and Appropriation Main Estimates Bill, followed by a general debate on Windrush Day, followed by a general debate on Pride Month. The subjects for these debates were recommended by the Backbench Business Committee. Friday, the 2nd of July, the House will not be sitting. Mr Speaker, I am pleased to announce the remaining recess dates for the rest of this year, subject to the progress of business. The House will rise for the conference recess at the conclusion of business on Thursday, the 23rd of September, and will return on Monday, the 18th of October. The House will rise at the conclusion of business on Tuesday, the 9th of November, and return on Monday, the 15th of October, uh, November. And finally, for the Christmas recess, the House will rise at the conclusion of business on Thursday, the 16th of December, and return on Tuesday, the 4th of January. Mr. Speaker. We often talk of parliamentary democracy in sweeping and even grandiloquent terms, but its day-to-day -day success rests on the hard work of unseen officials. Yesterday, the Prime Minister paid tribute, and you did earlier on, to Sir Roy Stone, the departing Principal Private Secretary of Chief Whip, who came to his current post at the start of the millennium after having served Margaret Thatcher, Sir John Major and Tony Blair in Downing Street. And while Sir Roy did not waste any time on my appointment in making it clear to me that the term usual channels is best kept away from the floor of the House. In fact, I was told in no, in to, I was told in no uncertain terms that I was not to use this term. I do intend to break the rule today to make clear that when people mention the usual channels, actually they meant Sir Roy. He was and has been the usual channels for the last 20 years. He is, as you pointed out, only the fourth person to have held this particular set of responsibilities since Sir Charles Harris's appointment a century ago. And over the last 21 years, Sir Roy has kept the parliamentary show on the road, not least in helping to smooth occasionally troubled waters in recent years, working phantasmagorical wonders behind the scenes, and accomplishing feats of which Houdini would be proud to ensure that the show went on. Uh, a predecessor of mine, Richard Crossman, described the job as a little round ball bearing which makes the huge joint work that links the opposition and government's whips offices. But that doesn't quite do it justice. Sir Roy himself would say that he is an honest broker. This is nearer the mark but underplays his significance. Instead, Sir Roy's occasional declaration that this or that politician is offside 
is nearer the mark because it invites comparison to a popular game known as association football, where referees may instinctively understand what is appropriate and what is not. My own view is that Sir Roy has been a guardian of our constitution and its proprieties, the keeper of the democratic clocks devoted to maintaining the position of and the balance between our constitution's weights and counterweights, executive and legislature, front bench and back bench, opposition and government. I cannot think of a more important or solemn duty, but Sir Roy has proved himself the sort of man who performs near miracles with considerable regularity. He has been an inspiration and a teacher whom we will all miss enormously, and to his great credit, he still has much more to give. I wish him and his family every possible blessing. I now call the shadow leader of the House, Tangan Debonair, who has now got five minutes. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Leader for the business, and I, I know that the staff of this House who have been asking me about it will be very pleased to hear of recess dates, given the hard year that so many of them have been through. Mr Speaker, every day we here are under the protective shield of our loved friend, Jo Cox. We can hear her voice. We are inspired by her. She mattered then. She matters still. And her life made a difference to millions, and we miss her very much. This week, especially, we send our love to her family. Mr Speaker, the opposition, particularly the Whip's office, also join you and the Leader in saying a big thank you to Sir Roy Stone, retiring this week after 44 years of service. We want him to know how much we appreciate him. And Mr Speaker, in this Cervical Cancer Week, I encourage all women to take up the screening when offered and to encourage other women to do likewise. Mr Speaker, the British people deserve to have a competent government, but this government, unfortunately, is anything but competent. Hopeless, in fact. And this is costing the country dearly. Four years on from the Grenfell tragedy, where on the business is the plan to make all homes safe from fire? The law reforms to give tenants true voice, something the survivors and bereaved people were promised. The Chief Secretary of the Treasury announced yesterday what he called an economic support package, but consisted of just one single measure, which does not a package make. Failure to help businesses who have lost thousands because of the COVID measures extension, itself needed only because of other government incompetence, will cost many people's jobs. Hopeless. Similarly, the Prime Minister came back from a weekend with a few mates in Cornwall, describing something as a global vaccination programme, which is anything but. 870 million doses of vaccine is a fraction of 11 billion the world actually needs. His level of leadership at the G7, a fraction of what the country needs. The government isn't preparing the UK for the impact of climate change, according to the Committee on Climate Change. The Ministry of Justice is having to remove children from Rainsbrook Secure Training Centre because it can't keep them safe. There's little hope for young people who've lost months of education. Social care is failing vulnerable children. Trade deals undermining farmers and fishers. And exports are down. Hopeless. Hopeless. So can the Leader of the House please explain to people who own homes with fire defects, to the world's poorest people, to businesses losing money, to care workers and people who need care, to our children and young people, why the government couldn't get around to arranging the business to sort out problems which are predictable, predicted and fixable? Mr Speaker, there is now a steady stream of government announcements on major matters which members have to find out about from journalists instead of here in this chamber. Covid regulations. Parliamentary rules on English votes for English laws, the publication of the review on rape prosecutions, and that's just this week. Does the Leader agree that this is, at best, not in the spirit of the Ministerial Code, and at worst, treating our constituents with contempt? Mr Speaker, the British steel industry supports tens of thousands of jobs, but the Trade Remedies Authority's decision to withdraw steel safeguards plunges steel workers, their families and communities that rely on the industry into a deeply precarious situation. So will the government bring forward emergency legislation so ministers can reject the Trade Authority's recommendation, temporarily extend current safeguards and protect British jobs in steel? Mr Speaker. When will the Leader of the House bring in the rule changes that he and I both know are urgently needed to allow constituents to petition for recalling their MP when the independent complaints process finds them to be a bully or sexual harasser? Finally, Mr Speaker, I didn't need leaked texts from one hopeless person about another hopeless person moaning about a third one. 
I only needed to listen to the care workers in Bristol West to know that there isn't and never was a ring of protection around them and the people they care for. Why did the Prime Minister keep on as Health Secretary someone he thought was hopeless in a global health crisis? Why? Mr Speaker, the British people recognise incompetence and waste when they see it. They know what's right and what's not, and they know when a minister is hopeless. The leader is always welcome to listen to the people of Bristol West, as I've been listening to the people of North East Somerset, and my constituents and his share a strikingly similar view of his hopeless government and a shared belief that we all deserve better. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And Mr Speaker, the old uh, lady very kindly promoted me because it is not, of course, my government, but Her Majesty's, uh, and that is not that is not a role to which I confess I uh, aspire. Um, as regards text messages, there's a great line from Dr Johnson that in the Pidgery inscriptions, a man is not on oath, and I think the same applies to text messages, which are essentially the trivia, the flotsam and jetsam, the um, ephemera of life, and uh, fundamentally unimportant. And the fact that the honourable lady finds them so exciting shows. Uh, how little she has to go on. Um, as regards um, bringing in rules relating to recall, uh, the Honourable Lady is a member of the Commission. May I remind her that as a shadow leader, she has this role that goes with the job, and the Commission will be meeting on Monday. It is up to the Commission to deal with ICGS-related matters. It is not the responsibility of Her Majesty's Government, though obviously the Government has a view on this. But this House is not run by the government, and this is really important that people understand this, it is run by the Commission on behalf of all members. And that uh, ties in with the point the Honourable Lady was making about evil. There may always be discussions in government about how the procedures of this House operate, but the procedures of this House are a matter for this House. And in that, many members may notice that over the last year, evil has been suspended without any great consequence or complaint, that nobody seems to have minded uh, very much, and it's therefore worth considering how it will operate in future. And we should always bear in mind the fundamental constitutional equality of every member of this House, regardless of the size of their constituency, the location of their constituency, or indeed whether they are ministers or shadow ministers, front bench or back bench. There is a fundamental equality of members of this House, and that is an important uh, constitutional principle, as is the one that announcements are made to this House. And I would point out that over the course of the pandemic, I think we've had 40 announcements made at the dispatch box uh, by the Department of Health, many of them made by the Secretary of State himself. That's been one most sitting weeks during the course of the pandemic. So I think the record uh, of the government uh, in keeping the House informed is actually extremely good. The Honourable Lady then makes a broad list of socialist complaints about how the government is operating, but what would you expect, that the left like to say these things, but there are an awful lot of nonsense. First of all, trade deals. Free trade makes every country in the world that adopts it better off. Our deal with Australia is fantastic. For those of you who like Australian wine, Australian wine will be cheaper. It's good for consumers, but it's good for farmers too, because we want farmers who can be competitive, who can succeed. And farmers in North East Somerset, I know there aren't many farmers in Bristol, poor old Bristol, um, but... Farmers in North East Somerset are competitive. They're able to succeed. And I know the SNP is worried that the farmers they represent aren't efficient enough. I don't believe that. I think Scottish farmers are very efficient too. I'm as proud of Scottish farmers as I am of Somerset farmers. And they can be world leaders, as the Prime Minister was a world leader uh, at the G7, with an amazing list of successes uh, to his name from that. A billion doses next year for developing countries. Uh, of the vaccine. And the vaccine that will mainly go out will, of course, be the Oxford vaccine. Why? Because the Oxford vaccine is being done at cost price because of a deal so successfully done by my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, the brilliant, the one and only successful genius who has been running health over the last 15 months. And he has done so much to make not only the country but the world uh, safer. Um, there is going to be $2.75 billion for funding a global partnership uh, for education works to help ensure all children go to school around the world. And G7 leaders signed up to the UK's target of getting 40 million more girls into school. That's just the beginnings of the success of what my right hon friend, the Prime Minister, achieved at the uh, G7. And then we get carping about the support that is being given for people during the pandemic. £407 billion pounds of taxpayers' money. I mean, the socialist thinks money grows on trees, but the truth is, eventually you run out of spending other people's money. And that's something you have to remember. This furlough scheme is going on until 
Until September, the cut in VAT continues, the reduction in rates continues, the support is there, it is very considerable, but we believe on this side of the House in faintly living within your means. One day this money will have to be paid back. There is not a bottomless pit, there is not a magic money tree. The Honourable Lady then mentions the um, Building Safety Bill, but we've been getting on with it. An amazing amount has been done already. 95% of high-risk residential buildings uh, have either been completed or work uh, is underway. Um, that's for the buildings over 59 feet high. £5.1 billion of taxpayers' money, money that, as I said, isn't growing on trees, has to be earned by people going out to work. £5.1 billion uh, will be found to um, fund the cost of remediating unsafe cladding for leaseholders. But as the Prime Minister said yesterday, not all high-rise buildings are dangerous. It is not axiomatic that a high-rise building uh, is dangerous, so it's important to bear that uh, in mind. But may I finish on a much more consensual note? The Honourable Lady is so right to remember Jo Cox, whose shield, as she pointed out, is behind her, and which we see from this front bench every day when we are in the chamber. Eternal rest grant unto her and all the faithful departed. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. I, I am sorry to say that it came as no surprise to me when, uh, when Labour voted against tougher sentences for rapists and child rapists this week. My constituency in Dudley North has been waiting for a new police station in the centre of Dudley for many years, as was promised by the Labour Police and Crime Commissioner. Will my right honourable friend agree to explore this issue with me and perhaps with the Home Secretary and agree to a debate on the effectiveness of police and crime commissioners more generally? Thank you. Uh, my honourable friend um, raises a very important point. The socialists, as always, are weak on crime and weak on the causes of crime. Um, and they have shown their true colours in uh, recent refusal to support tougher sentences for violent criminals. It's continuing to back the police and to support the public in fighting to bring down crime. And I'm very glad to see my honourable friend, the policing minister, uh, is um, just behind the speaker's chair. We are um, taking the um, landmark PCSC bill through Parliament at the moment, which will tackle serious violence throughout the country. We have hired nearly 9,000 additional police officers, well on target to uh, track to meet our target of 20,000 new officers this Parliament. Um, so I am grateful to my honourable friend for the important issue that he raises. We now come to SNP spokesperson, Noreen Thompson, with two minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I echo the comments of the, the shadow leader and leader in relation to uh, Joe Cox. I think it is important that we do all continue to remember and uh, uh, share our thoughts with her family in what will obviously be a very difficult week. Uh, I would also join the tributes to uh, Sir Roy Stone. I think in my time in, in office, he's been a, a great help and support, um, and I know that that is a, a view shared by uh, others who have held this post, member for Glasgow North, uh, and, and the whips operation uh, from our part. It's, it's always great to have the ability to have that conversation and the advice that we've had from, from Sir Roy over the, the time, so uh, I'm sure he'll be missed, but uh, wish him very well uh, in whatever he decides to, to go on to do next. Um, Mr Speaker, Tuesday saw the publication of a written statement from the Cabinet Office announcing new measures to update campaigning regulations in the upcoming elections bill, including a crackdown on loopholes exploited by third party campaigners to introduce an in the introduction of digital imprints. And now, I am glad to see this uh, and that the Government here are following the, the footsteps of the Scottish Government in introducing digital imprints. But we need assurances that these measures will only be the beginning of the legislation and it will be continually updated uh, in light of ever-changing circumstances. So can we have a debate on these new measures on the Government time to give members a chance to feed into them at this very early stage? Uh, Mr Speaker, this week is uh, also loneliness week and I think uh, uh, particularly given the, the year that we've all had, um, I would ask if the Leader will join me in thank thanking organisations such as the Red Cross who have helped to reach out to people struggling alone uh, during the pandemic. And, well, the Government set out how it plans to build a more connected community after COVID, uh, ensuring those most at risk of loneliness are able to access the support that they need. Now, Mr Speaker, this week I, I bring good news. Uh, the Perthshire one has been freed. Uh, so uh, he shall be returning uh, to, the, to, his, to his rightful place uh, in this session uh, from next week. 
Um, so, in, in, in one of my final efforts in this session, Mr. Speaker, uh, could I ask the leader, uh, given that there was a, a historic backlog of opposition days that our party did not uh, secure, uh, could I ask for consideration to be given to that? And, and finally, Mr. Speaker, if I may, uh, tomorrow both of our nations are independently represented at the Euros uh, tomorrow evening. And while I have a dream, uh, I'm sure many would agree that neither the leader I perhaps would be the, the best examples of who could boogie. Uh, but will he join with me in wishing both teams uh, all the very best for a Scotland victory? I'm not sure if the last bit needs to be. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. I may be willing to go further than the House would expect, because um, the corridor of the Chairman of Ways and Means has a sweepstake. And in this sweepstake, I have been fortunate enough to draw Scotland. So I, I shall have very divided loyalties tomorrow, but I'm glad to say uh, that it is very encouraging for the Union. I was pleased to see Wales do well yesterday, uh, and uh, my, the Reese side of me was coming to, to the fore. And I am looking forward to supporting whichever side does best, because I have an interest in all three of them. Uh, 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 doing, doing well. And I'm uh, delighted to hear that um, his honourable friend, uh, the honourable gentleman, the member for Perth and North Perthshire, uh, will be returning to his place. But it's been very enjoyable crossing swords with uh, the honourable gentleman, who brings a great tone uh, to these exchanges. Um, uh, loneliness Week is important. It is um, something that it's very hard for governments to take control of, though uh, we had a very distinguished minister for loneliness. We have to try and work with civil, civic society, with people like the Red Cross and the Samaritans, uh, to help people as we begin to get back to normal. I think as we do get life back to normal, that will help reduce uh, loneliness. Um, though as we're on what's happening during the course of the week, it is worth bearing in mind that the 18th is Waterloo Day, and a day always of celebration in this country, and we can celebrate it all together, which will make us less lonely. But it's also wonderfully um, Unionist Day, Mr Speaker. I don't even know this, because uh, there were Scottish, Welsh and Irish regiments there. The Black Watch, the Gordon Highlanders, the Royal Scots, the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, the Welsh Regiment, the Inniskillin Fusiliers, the Inniskillin Dragoons, and I think... Sharp was there with the Prince of Wales' own, but I'm not sure that that was a real regiment or whether it was invented for the purpose of fiction. But no doubt, <laughs> otherwise people will be able to tell us. So um, we have those, that date happening too. Um, finally, uh, um, on digital imprints and so on, uh, the um, Electoral Integrity Bill will be an opportunity to debate what may go into it at the second reading. So I can confirm that when that comes forward, there will be an opportunity to do that. But I'm very grateful for his support. And I would say that it is always open to the government to learn from what the devolved authorities do. We want to work collaboratively with the devolved authorities, even if we have an ultimately different vision for our nation. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I also join the tributes to Roy Stone? Um, Sir Roy Stone. Um, could I ask my right honourable friend if we could have a debate in government time about the imminent changes that the government is about to make to... Uh, the NHS integrated care system boundaries to make them coterminous with upper tier local authority boundaries. This is in fact a wholesale reorganisation of NHS commissioning in some areas like as in Essex, as in areas like Waveney or the Frimley ICS which covers parts of Berkshire, uh, and, Berkshire and parts of Surrey and Hampshire. Uh, why is this being done before we've even seen the legislation that is necessary to make it effective? Who is advising ministers to implement this major change when they should be leaving things be while we catch up with the massive NHS waiting list? Why has there been so little consultation with MPs uh, about this uh, until very late in the day? And why is NHS England withholding a consultant's report, which ministers promised to us last week and has still not been given to us and is apparently the basis on which the decisions are being made, but we're not allowed to see it? There's a real failure of scrutiny here. The House. I thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm, I'm grateful to my honourable friend for, for raising this point. And there are uh, issues of scrutiny around um, arm's length bodies which are of fundamental importance to this House and are rightly brought to the uh, floor of this House. But it's worth bearing in mind that NHS England is a quango and is not invariably under direction from uh, ministers. Uh, however, the point he makes is a very serious one. I'll ensure it is taken up uh, with my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State. Let's go to the Chair of the Backbench Committee, Ian Mearns. Ian. Very, very grateful, Mr Speaker. And, Mr Speaker, can I echo the sentiments expressed about our late colleague, Joe Cox, who we commemorate this week. 
And can I also add my best wishes to Sir Roy Stone for a very long, happy and healthy retirement, which he fully deserves. He's been of great help and assistance to me during my time as chair of the Backbench Business Committee, Mr Speaker. And can I also thank the leader for announcing the Backbench Business Debates on the 24th of June and the 1st of July, when we have debates to commemorate Windrush Day and the end of Pride Month. And if we get time on the 8th of July, Mr Speaker, we have a debate lined up on the Independent Medicines and Medical Devices Safety Review, the Cumberledge Report, regarding historic dangerous flaws in elements of healthcare. And, and lastly, Mr Speaker, uh, the Backbench Business Committee is having an additional meeting at 1pm today to determine the subjects for the Estimates Day debates that the leader has, an, has announced for the 29th and 30th of June. Into the House. Um, uh, uh, thank you, um, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Honourable Gentleman makes a very good plea for time on the 8th of July because um, uh, I was part of the APPG that was very brilliantly chaired by the Honourable Lady, the member for Bolton East. Uh, yes, been correct. Yes, been correct. Uh, yeah. um, I'm sure Hansard will get it right, even if I haven't, um, uh, who, who worked so hard. <laughs> who worked so hard on um, the Prima Dos issue, so it is one I take very seriously. Uh, unfortunately, the particular interests of the leader don't necessarily determine how business is set, um, but his uh, uh, appeal is heard. Sir David Evans. I join with others in paying tribute to Sir Roy and remembering the murder of one of our own Joe Cox. Will my right honourable friend find time for a debate on erecting a permanent memorial to Dame Vera Lynn. Tomorrow marks the first anniversary of her death, and at 11 a.m. on the White Cliffs of Dover, a public appeal will be launched uh, to raise the memorial, and a record will be released called Unforgettable. And I would like to thank you, Mr. Speaker, for your support for this project and the starring role which you will be taking. As long as it's not singing. Leader of the House. Well, Mr Speaker, we are looking forward to your karaoke efforts in due course. Um, it seems to me, as the, uh, my old friend raises this question, uh, that you could try and turn the White Cliffs into Mount Rushmore and have a statue of Dame Berylin there, but then I'm worried that, as they're made of chalk, it might not be as lasting uh, as Mount Rushmore has proved for American presidents. But I think uh, my honourable friend is so right to raise this. I know he's got an adjournment debate on the subject. I had an adjournment debate on the subject on the 11th of May, but Dame Vera Lynn was inspirational to this country uh, at one of its lowest points and was, um, was held in the highest affection and continues to be fondly remembered. Uh -huh. Let's go to Ellie Reeves. Ellie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today is Clean Air Day, yet independent analysis has found that almost a quarter of schools across the country are located in areas with high levels of small particle pollution, exceeding the World Health Organization limits. This means an estimate, estimated 3.4 million children are living and learning in an unhealthy environment. And given that air pollution has already been linked to increased asthma, obesity and mental disorders in children. Can we please have a debate in government time about finally introducing ambitious legal limits for air pollution? Leader. Um, uh, Mr Speaker, the Honourable Lady is so right to raise this very important uh, issue and it's worth reminding the House of the terrible scandal involving um, the Blair government, the European Union and the German car manufacturers that encouraged everybody to buy diesel cars pumping out particulates and nitrous oxides and lowering the standard of our air quality. The government is involved in a project to improve this, is doing what it can to see that um, uh, cleaner cars are in use, but also um, uh, general policies to remove noxious substances and particularly particulates uh, from our air. Andy Carter. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, quite rightly, during the height of the pandemic, the government introduced restrictions to protect the most vulnerable members of society in care homes. But I wanted this morning to raise uh, with my right honourable friend the experience of uh, Frank Thompson, one of my constituents, and his wife of 57 years. Mrs Thompson is in residential care in Warrington, and prior to lockdown, Frank visited her every day from 8 a.m. in the morning until 8 p.m. in the evening. During lockdown, he didn't get to see her at all. 
And as restrictions were eased in May, and the roadmap moved forward, and everybody in the care home was vaccinated, and Mr Thompson was vaccinated, and the care staff were vaccinated, Mr Thompson was allowed to see her, his wife for 30 minutes once a week. The Honourable Member mentioned that it's Loneliness Week this week, and even those in care homes suffer loneliness. And I wonder if my Right Honourable Friend would agree with me that it's now time for the Government to be clear with those that provide care that the rights of residents are crucially important to ensure that they do not suffer loneliness and their families can get reasonable access to see them. Leader. Um, my, um, oh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, my honourable friend raises a very important and sensitive point, and I think members across the House uh, will be concerned about this and will have heard from constituents suffering difficult um, circumstances in visiting family and friends in care homes. Um, there has been a recent liberalisation on care home visiting rules announced in the latest COVID regulations. Residents will be able to spend more time with family and friends, including overnight stays, as part of an easing of visiting restrictions announced today. From the 21st of June, people admitted to a care home from the community will no longer have to self-isolate for 14 days on arrival, so residents will have a less disruptive introduction to their new home. This has been a really difficult time for people uh, in care homes, and as the Prime Minister himself said, we will soon reach the terminus day, and the terminus means the end. Some people have thought it means an interchange, but it is Paddington, not Crewe, and when we reach the end, the restrictions will go. Kim Johnson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The British Government is responsible for a grave injustice to the Chinese community in Liverpool. After the Second World War, thousands of Chinese merchant seamen were forcibly deported back to China without the knowledge of their families, and it would be decades before they found out the real truth. In March, I asked the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary to acknowledge this crime and to provide a apology to the descendants of those families. I have not had a response, and that was over three months ago. Mm. So will the leader provide time for a debate in government time to discuss and um, debate this most important issue? Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Leader of the House. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, it is always important that the government uh, recognises mistakes that may have been made by predecessor governments. Um, I would encourage the Honourable Lady to seek an adjournment debate in the first instance, but if there is correspondence awaiting a reply that she is expecting, I will of course take that up by my office to ensure that she gets a reply. Robert Morgan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Royal Oak Inn, just up the road from my home in Glossop, is celebrating its 200th anniversary this year. It was built in 1818 and first opened its doors in 1821, serving thirsty travellers heading over the Snake Pass between Manchester and Sheffield. It's a lovely pub. I've enjoyed drinking on it on a number of occasions. Yeah. It even used to be run by my good friends George and Jean Warmby. However, instead of properly celebrating their 200th anniversary, the future of the pub has been cast into doubt as a planning application has just been submitted for the pub's demolition. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, can we have a debate on how we can reform our planning laws to strengthen protections for historic pubs like the Royal Oak? Yeah. The house. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And, um, I do sympathise with my uh, honourable friend um, that we want planning applications to appreciate and understand local heritage and culture, and there is a listing scheme in place that tries to protect buildings. There are also means uh, of buying community uh, assets that have been in place for some years now. Um, but we do need new homes as well, and it's trying to get uh, the right balance in the planning system to protect what needs to be protected, but also to develop where development uh, is needed. Um, my right hand friend, the Housing Secretary, has been doing an excellent job in engaging with members of Parliament, listening to and understanding their concerns about planning. Um, but we have this balance to achieve, um, though I hope in the meantime my honourable friend will manage to get to the Royal Oak before any planning application is completed and drink a yard of ale. We look forward to seeing the picture on Instagram. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. You have just missed a lovely exchange um, on a tribute to Dame Vera Lynn. And I have to admit, I use her for my own purposes. Whenever ever people struggle to pronounce my name, I say, just think of Dame Vera Lynn. <laughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, because of delays from the Home Office in granting indefinite leave to remain, two of my constituents have been refused student finance. In one case, the deadline was missed by just three days. If they pay the 
fees for this year. The rules stipulate that they are privately fin financing the course and they will have to pay the student fees for the whole length of the course. This will put them into severe financial difficulties and has taken already a huge toll on their mental health. Can we have a statement from the Department for Education outlining how student finance could apply some discretion in situations where delays to granting indefinite leave to remain have been caused by the Home Office? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. This is very concerning when one arm of the government uh, causes a cost to be created with another arm of the government. Um, the requirement for a student hold uh, status on the first day of their first academic year is a condition that is defined in the Education Student Support Regulations 2011, and Student Finance England doesn't have any discretion in that. Uh, however, um, I would be very happy to help the Honourable Lady and any other Honourable and Right Honourable Members um, in liaising with the Home Office if there are delays. I actually visited the Home Office parliamentary team in Croydon recently, and they do do an excellent job with very high demand put upon them. But if there are cases that have urgent consequences, uh, I would certainly be more than happy to do anything I can to facilitate uh, a speedier response. Martin Vickers. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I refer to the case of a brutal attack on my constituent, Gwen Kaplan. Three years ago, her neighbour was attacked by her boyfriend outside the house. Mrs Kaplan opened her door and tried to help. The attacker then smashed her window, got into the house, smashed a hole in the bathroom door and proceeded to stab Mrs Kaplan on the scalp, face, neck, shoulder and hand. He was, a char he was charged uh, with attempted murder and sentenced to 20 years. Her application to the Criminal Injuries uh, Compensation Authority was rejected. She appealed and was rejected again. The Ch uh, Chief Constable of Humberside, Lee Freeman, wrote to the authority in her support, uh, but uh, to no avail. Can my right hon. friend find time for a debate on the work of the Criminal Injuries Compensation Authority uh, when we can uh, consider the criteria by which they award, uh, make awards? Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a deeply troubling case and I am grateful to my honourable friend uh, for raising the matter and for holding the Criminal Injuries Board to account. Um, the Criminal Injuries Compensation Scheme's rules are approved by Parliament um, and are ind independently administered. Under the current approach, strict eligibility criteria apply and awards under the scheme are determined in accordance with a detailed tariff of injuries. All applicants have the right to request that their initial decision is reviewed and, if dissatisfied, they have the right to appeal to the independent first-tier tribunal. But I assume from what my honourable friend has said that Mrs Kaplan has already done that. I will therefore pass on his concerns to the Lord Chancellor. Kirsten Oswald. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. My constituent, Olivia Dixon, is 13. Last year she was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukaemia. What Olivia and her family don't understand is why, with five children in the UK diagnosed with cancer every day, there has been such a dearth of research into treatment. We're still actually using adult-focused treatments developed decades ago. So can we have an urgent debate or statement on what specifically the UK government will do to make swift progress on this vital research and how they will support children's cancer charities, which have been hard hit by COVID, to make sure that this vital research has progressed as a matter of priority? Yeah. The highs. Um, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, the Honourable Lady is so right to raise this case, and um, cancer in children is such a worry for parents and so difficult to deal with. Um, and carrying out research is fundamental. It is amazing what advances have been made in cancer treatment in recent years. I, I will pass on her comments to the Department of Health because uh, I think it would be better if she had a fuller answer from them. Jessica Morden. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Too many ill people and their families should not have to spend their final months grappling with the cruel benefit system. On July the 11th, it will be two years and since the government announced its review into the welfare system for the terminal, and in that time, thousands of people have died waiting for a benefit.
benefit decision. When, with just weeks to go until recess, will a minister come to the House and announce the scrapping of the six-month rule? Yeah. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And once again, I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady for raising this issue. The reason it's taken so long, it is, it is not a difficult or easy one to determine. It is very hard to know with any certainty how long life will last, and that is a problem that it is difficult for um, a system to deal with, and the uncertainty is something that makes it problematic to find a good solution, whereas everybody wants a system that is sympathetic to those who are in that final uh, weeks and months. I will obviously take this up once again uh, with the Department, but it is not torpor that means there has been no full response. It is simply the complexity of the issue. Lydia Link. In Little Granger. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. My right honourable friend knows about the patience of King Alfred, as we all do. He had to wait 25 years before the Danes stopped bothering us. I sincerely hope ministers will take less time to answer my questions about official consultation on local government reform in Somerset. Two months ago, I asked a series of parliamentary questions on how many responses were received and how many genuine Somerset residents put, took part on the government's own consultation. Since then, silence. I think it's rather strange. The District Council have just held a full and fair independent referendum. Two thirds of registered electors supported their plan. All the figures are public and were sent straight to the Secretary of State. So why do the government's own consultation results remain secret? King Alfred, I would say, Mr Deputy Speaker, wouldn't stand for it, neither should we. Can we have a debate in this House as to what on earth is going on in local government? Um, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I understand there were some problems with the um, District Council's uh, website that didn't have entirely the desired effect and caused some uh, considerable and understandable distress to people uh, who were linked to a website of ill repute. So I think there are questions to be raised about that. Uh, however, with regard to honourable and right honourable members not receiving responses to written parliamentary questions, it is part of my job to trace that up, and I will do so for my honourable friend. Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I find it astounding that we don't have a statement from the Chancellor today following the passing of extending the public health measures. In my constituency, I know that businesses, charities and my community is really, really struggling. York, as the leader of the House will know, depends on 8 million visitors visiting it each year. It's a visitor economy. And with tourism down, people are really, really struggling. And yet the Chancellor seems invisible. So can the leader of the House take a message back from my city to say that we expect the Chancellor to bring forward a statement on Monday so we can scrutinise over what measures he's going to give to our communities in order to help them survive this next season, or else there may not be a future for them. Thank you. Um, th thank you, um, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, the Honourable Lady, the Shadow Leader, asked me on Tuesday for a statement by the Treasury, and one was provided on Wednesday. I, I wish I could say it was immediate cause and effect. It w was in the pipeline anyway, but the push from the Honourable Lady moved us in the right uh, direction. And that was in relation to the Treasury support uh, around the pandemic. And it is worth bearing in mind, as I have said already, the total cost, the £407 billion that has already uh, been spent, that supported 14 million jobs uh, and, and people through furlough and self-employed schemes. Um, furlough continues until uh, September. There are retail grants of up to £18,000 for retail, hospitality, leisure and personal care businesses. The business rates holiday continues to the end of June, but then tapers for another nine months. The 5% VAT cut continues until the end of September. Of course I share the Honourable Lady's concern. It is a really difficult and uncertain time. Uh, the need to extend to the terminus date of the 19th of July is one that nobody wanted but was necessitated by uh, events. But the end is now in sight and the support has been extremely generous and I'm glad to say effective and we do see uh, the economy beginning to bounce back. But I will of course pass on her comments to the Chancellor of the Exchequer. William Rag. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I wonder if we could have a debate on the subject of working from home. 
It's been reported that a consultation will soon be launched. But what is being done to support those who wish to return to their place of work but are prevented from doing so by their employers? Uh, loneliness and isolation has become endemic uh, during this pandemic and people's experiences of working from home has been very different. We must have a, a balanced debate about relying on assumptions, not least because of the implications of our public transport system and the prosperity of our towns and cities. You uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, my old friend is absolutely right uh, about this. And the guidance is clear that if people need to go into work, they are allowed to go into work. If employers think that they need their employees to come into work, they're entitled to ask them uh, to come into work. Even within the civil service, managers are advised to accommodate uh, requests to work in the office where home working is not suitable for well-being reasons. And these can be a whole variety of reasons. They could be loneliness, they could be the unsuitability uh, of the accommodation that um, particularly younger people uh, who are part of the workforce don't necessarily have an excessive space in their flats in which to, to work from. And it's really important that we get back to normal. We want to have vibrant towns and cities. We want people coming back into work. We want um, commuting systems, trains, buses and so on that are financially viable. And that means people coming back to work. So as soon as we get back to normal, the better. But in the meantime, Anyone who wants to go into work should have a conversation with his or her employer and say, I want to come back into work, and employers uh, should facilitate that. Video link. Martin Day. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, I'm increasingly concerned that the exploitation of vulnerable customers through energy suppliers and providers pricing strategies, such as the exclusion of existing customers from the cheapest available energy tariff on offer, could we therefore have a statement or a debate from government about including exclusive tariffs in Ofgem's cheapest tariff messaging rules? This is a scandalous loophole which needs addressed. Um, I'm very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for, for raising this point. I and I think it's um, wider uh, than electricity tariffs. Um, I don't tend to tell personal anecdotes, but my car insurance earlier this year with Churchill came in £2,800. And I managed to get it from LV, the people who sponsor the cricket, I'm glad to say, for under £600. I mean, it is quite extraordinary how existing customers are taken for a ride. And I would encourage honourable members and all our constituents to shop around. But I'm also glad to say uh, that the Financial Conduct Authority um, has introduced rules on this recently that will help, uh, that will help protect people from this type of, uh, of, of rip-off. But it... My example, I, does, I, I, feel, I do feel, shows that just a little bit of going online to shop around can save a very significant amount of money. Nicola Richards. Mr Deputy Speaker, I've been alarmed by reports this week that Samuel Council's Cabinet were due to sign off on a reduction of the number of SEND transport contracts awarded from 20 to just two. Following interventions from the media by Councillor David Fisher and others, this decision has been deferred. Both of these companies are owned by the same person a former council employee and son of a former Labour deputy leader of Samwell Council named in the damning rag report, where both father and son were revealed to have been involved in land deals amongst other interesting activities. Will the Leader of the House make time for a debate on the way that Samwell Council are continuing to let down residents of the borough with these very questionable dealings and misuse of public funds? Yeah. Leader of the House. Um, my honourable friend raises something that is extraordinarily troubling. Um, that there are problems uh, sometimes within councils. I understand that MHCLG is monitoring the situation at Sandwell Council closely uh, following a recent report. Councils have an absolute duty to manage taxpayers' money responsibly and must be held to account when they do not. I understand that the RAG report highlights that hundreds of thousands of pounds of public money were misused by a cabal of councillors. I know the Home Office was alerted to its findings at the time, but I will, of course, pass on my honourable friend's uh, concerns to the Home Secretary and the Secretary of State at the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. But it may also be something that the police ought to be looking into. This sounds a really serious prima facie case. Trouble. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I, I know you'll be pleased at last night's result, and uh, I know the yeah, Leader of the House yeah, is yeah. very proud of his Welsh roots. And yeah, yeah. Congratulations to the Welsh team earlier on. Can he pass on my commiserations to the Prime Minister, who I know is equally proud of his Turkish roots, at the 2-0 defeat of Turkey last night? 
a good reminder to him that Wales are in the tournament, which of course he, he didn't realise last week. I do want to raise a serious issue about um, my constituent Luke Simons, who is still incarcerated in Yemen by the Houthis, uh, and I've asked uh, on behalf of Bob Cummings, his grandfather, for a meeting with the, uh, with the Foreign Office Minister concerned uh, in the near future. Are there any plans of the government to have further debates or statements on the situation in Yemen, and in particular the plight of this young man who's done nothing wrong other than hold a British passport? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, thank you. Um, I'm very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for his point about the Prime Minister's Ottoman antecedents. Um, those the Ottoman Empire has fallen away. Uh, I have a feeling he was probably more behind Wales than Turkey yesterday. Um, uh, however, with, with regard to, to Luke Simons and the issue in uh, Yemen, um, the Government is working closely with our partners in the region uh, to make sure Mr Simons is released and reunited with his family as soon as possible. That is work that continues. Uh, I do view it as part of my role to try to facilitate meetings between uh, Honourable and Right Honourable Members and Ministers when they request it. So if the Honourable Gentleman has any difficulty in that regard, uh, I hope he will contact my office. Mark Fossil. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, in rugby, we are providing new homes at 25% faster than the rate in the country as a whole. And the consequence of all of those extra residents is that now 83% of people live more than 15 minutes' drive from a major accident and emergency unit. While the residents of rugby, time after time, have expressed a very firm wish for that service to be provided at our local hospital of St Cross. Um, the matter of NHS commissioning has already, already been raised this morning and I wonder if any debate we could have would include on how population changes should drive the provision of NHS services. Um, uh, thank you uh, Mr Deputy Speaker and I will certainly raise this with health ministers uh, on behalf of my um, honourable friend and uh, there was a bill referred to in the Queen's speech uh, on health, so there will be an opportunity to debate these at length in due course. But the health infrastructure plan will deliver a long-term rolling programme of spending in health in infrastructure, including district hospitals. These hospitals have benefited from our £600 million critical infrastructure risk fund and our £450 million spending to upgrade A&Es. Uh, University Hospital Coventry and Warwickshire NHS Trust have received £2.2 million from the Critical Infrastructure Risk Fund to address backlog maintenance at St Cross and £3 million from an emergency department expansion as part of the a and &E upgrades investment. So I think that there is <coughs> a recognition that there are population pressures and spending does seem to be following accordingly. Clay Bafford. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I can understand why the uh, Leader of the House would want to dismiss the text messages published by the Prime Minister's former uh, adviser, uh, but if he were a member of a family who lost someone in a care home in the last year, I don't think he would dismiss them so lightly. These, these messages expose the fact that the Government knew that there wasn't a protective ring put round our care homes, that testing of people being discharged from hospital to care homes wasn't taking place. So if, we, if, if we're going to be subjected to this public spat between the Prime Minister and his former advisor continuously, in the interests of those people who lost someone, shouldn't we be calling the public inquiry now, yeah. or at least have the Prime Minister here to answer questions on this? Yeah, yeah. Um, the Prime Minister is regularly here to um, answer questions. He was here uh, yesterday at considerable length, both with um, Prime Minister's questions and then with a statement. So there are many opportunities to raise these points directly. For some reason, the Leader of the Opposition um, either hadn't noticed or didn't want to discuss uh, these text messages. Um, what I would say to the Honourable Gentleman is it's right to have the inquiry at the point at which uh, the pandemic has ended and a considered view can be taken. Uh, there is some difficulty with the Opposition's um, position that on the one hand it complains that there wasn't enough equipment and on the other hand it complains that procurement wasn't done according to the most bureaucratic systems. The Opposition can't really have it both ways. Video link. Bob Blackman. Thank you very much Mr Deputy Speaker. On Sunday we commemorate uh, World Refugee Day and we commemorate, commemorate the plight of the Kashmiri pandits forced out by jihadists who are still uh, in the position of being refugees in their own country. But on Monday, we celebrate International Yoga Day, uh, which is India's gift to the world. So could we arrange for statements to be made 
to the House next week on these two vitally important subjects, um, which I think the House should attend to, and indeed uh, could celebrate and use Monday uh, for some yoga exercises before the House meets. Into the House. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm not sure I shall be joining in on the yogic flying exercises, which I think were the policy of the Natural Law Party, which stood in some previous elections. Um, but I do think Refugee Day is very important. This country has a proud and long record of providing a place of safety for refugees. And one of the really important things about uh, the changes that are going to be made to our immigration system is that they will protect those who are in genuine fear uh, and who come here as refugees and will make this country continue to be a safe place for them to come. Lydia Link, Catherine McKinnell. Thank you. Emerging from the pandemic as a healthier country is one of the government's key priorities for this parliament, but it's communities already facing some of the country's worst health inequalities like West Denton in my constituency that have sadly seen their local fitness facilities close for good during the pandemic. Reducing health inequalities is essential to delivering on the commitment to level up the poorest parts of the country and access the modern local fitness facilities is a key part of it. And that's why the government should back Newcastle City Council's levelling up fund bid to develop a new state of the art net zero carbon leisure development in the outer west of Newcastle. So can we also please have a debate on using the Level Up Fund to manage the recovery in a way that helps people to lead healthier lives? Um, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm delighted the Honourable Le Lady is so supportive of the Leveling Up Fund. It is a great opportunity to help communities across the country uh, have additional resources so that they can improve their local communities. And engagement from MPs is greatly to be encouraged. Uh, and so I thank the Honourable Lady for her enthusiasm for government policy. Philip Holloway. Learner drivers in Kettering, presently awaiting a test date, are currently being offered November as the earliest available, if they're lucky. If we're going to get our economy moving again and give people their lives back, particularly for young people, this is simply not good enough and urgent action is required. So can we have a statement from the Department for Transport and urgent action from the Driver and Vehicle Standards Agency to increase the number of driving tests being made available in Kettering and across the country so that the huge backlog caused by the COVID restrictions can be reduced far faster than currently planned. Um, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I notice that um, the use of private cars has increased post the pandemic uh, as people are very keen on driving, as I must confess uh, I am. Um, but I can assure him that the um, Driver and Vehicle Standards Agency does have in place a number of measures to increase practical driving tests. It has, um, after the lockdown, it went to six tests per day rather than seven, but from the 14th of June uh, that is going back to seven tests a day per examiner, which increases capacity across the national network by an average of 15 to 20,000 tests per month. Um, there are transport questions on the 24th of June where my honourable friend may wish to raise this, but yes, we are going to have backlogs and we have to make a really big effort to get Britain moving, and most of us want to move in our motors. Chris Stevens. Yes, thank you, um, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Leader of the House, firstly, for his kind words for uh, Scotland uh, tomorrow evening as we're playing a country which Honourable Members opposite regularly remind us is aspiring to its own independence. But on a more serious point, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, individuals like my constituent Mohammed Goha find themselves stuck abroad having visited dying relatives uh, because of cancelled flights, are now struggling to get back because the Department of Working Pensions in its wisdom has decided to stop their universal credit because they've been abroad for three weeks. This seems a very heavy-handed uh, approach. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, can we have a debate or a statement for people who find themselves stuck abroad visiting dying relatives to ensure that they don't have their universal credit stopped so they can have the money to find themselves coming back home? It does. Um, Mr Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman raises a difficult point because there are very sensible rules in place for normal times, but these are abnormal times. And therefore, when, because of a reduction in flights or the complexities of international travel at the moment, people through no fault of their own are delayed, there is certainly an argument for sympathy. What I don't know is whether the systems Parliament has passed into law allow for any discretion. However, if he would give me the details, I will take the case up directly with the Department of Work and Pensions on his behalf. 
Robbie Moore. Mr Deputy Speaker, many of my constituents who live in Silsden and Steeton have been waiting for years for a pedestrian bridge to be built over the extremely busy A629 dual carriageway so that they can safely get from one side to the other. In fact, five years ago, 700,000 was secured by my predecessor, Chris Hopkins, for Bradford Council to carry out a feasibility um, study into this project, which has only recently just been completed. We need to get this bridge built, so can my right honourable friend permit government time for a debate so that I can continue to raise this so we can get the funding that we desperately need so we can secure this bridge once and for all? Um, th thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I mean, the honourable gentleman has successfully raised it on this occasion. I, I think a debate on a bridge is probably more an adjournment debate. I, I think justifying a day's debate in government time might upset other honourable and right honourable members. However, I can tell him that £51.3 billion of taxpayers' money uh, will be going to local government next year, 4.6% increase and so I would encourage him to lobby his local council. It is the biggest year on year increase in core spending power in a decade. Um, there's a further forty five billion to help local authorities support their communities and local businesses, including four point five billion for Yorkshire and, and the Humber. Um, now I understand that um, the Socialist Council of Bradford has not been working very fast, but sometimes the tortoise comes through, so may I suggest he gives the tortoise a prod. Jim Shannon. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Leader of the House uh, will be very aware of deep concerns in Northern Ireland that this Parliament and this Government has on a number of occasions now gone over the heads of the people of Northern Ireland and their elected representatives and imposed legislation on marriage, on abortion, on the Northern Ireland Protocol and without the consent of the people of Northern Ireland. Now the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland proposes to do it again and proposes to do the same on legislation related to sensitive matters on the Irish language and other cultural issues. Will the Leader of the House uh, ensure that the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland comes to this House and makes a statement on this at the earliest opportunity? This goes against all that is democratic. The Northern Ireland Assembly is the correct place for legislation. Again, unfortunately and disgracefully, this place rides roughshod over regional administrations and the democratic process. Um, the House. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman and I normally see eye to eye on most issues, but on this one I must diverge from him because the new decade new approach deal was an historic achievement that brought to an end a three-year political impasse in Northern Ireland, and commitments in that deal were negotiated and agreed by all parties in the executive. But there has now been a delay, a problem, in bringing forward some fulfilment of those commitments. That is why the Government has now committed to deliver these important commitments through the United Kingdom Parliament. And I would say to him as a Unionist, ultimately it is this Parliament, and we rejoice in it being this Parliament, that is the uniting focus of our nation. So when something is agreed at a political level but then not implemented, it is absolutely right that it should be implemented through this Parliament. I happen to think that the other issues which were done when there was no clear majority in this Parliament uh, were done for more political rather than constitutional reasons. Peter Bain. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. On Monday, the media were given at 3 o'clock an embargoed statement uh, on the Covid roadmap and its changes. At 6 o'clock, there was a glitzy press conference. Uh, featuring the Prime Minister. It wasn't until 8.30 that evening that the Secretary of State came to this House to make a statement. Mr Speaker has already said that that is unacceptable and he is meeting with the Prime Minister. So I'm not going to ask the Leader to comment on that because the Speaker has ruled. But I would guess privately he was making similar noises within government. So what I'd like to ask the Speaker is whether he would like the government to adopt my private member's bill, which is going to be presented on Monday, which would increase his authority. He is an extraordinary parliamentarian and a great leader of the House. But if this House in future was to elect the leader of the House from the governing party, 
he would have further authority and he could not at any time be put under pressure to be removed. So would the government adopt my private member's bill uh, and then I won't need to present it on Monday? <laughs> That. Well, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, flattery may get you everywhere, but not on this occasion, because I think it misunderstands the role of the Leader of the House. Um, up until Lloyd George, uh, who handed the post over to Bonner Law, the Leader of the House was the leader of the governing party in the House of Commons. The Prime Minister, when the Prime Minister was in the House of Commons, and somebody like Stafford Northcote, when um, Disraeli was in the House of Lords. Because the role of the leader is to ensure that government business passes through the House, and that cannot be done by somebody who is not uh, an integral part of Her Majesty's Government. It couldn't be done in the way that a chairman of a select committee uh, does it and has the mandate, or indeed the Speaker does his job, and has a mandate from the House of Commons. So I fear that constitutionally his proposal doesn't work, though I will reassure him that the Leader of the House has a dual-facing role and also has to make representations uh, to Government on behalf of the House of Commons. And members may have noticed that when it comes to questions relating to uh, written questions not getting replied to or correspondence not being replied to in an efficient way, I do my best to ensure that the Commons' views are represented. I'd like to thank the Leader of the House for his business statement and responding to questions for over one hour. Uh, we will now suspend for three minutes for COVID protection measures. Order. Order. We now come to the Select Committee statement, and Clyde Betts will speak for up to 10 minutes. At the conclusion of his statement, I'll call members to put questions on the subject of the statement, and we'll call Clyde Betts to respond to these in turn. I call the Chair of the Select Committee on Housing, Communities and Local Government, Clyde Betts. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Backbench Business Committee for the opportunity to make this statement on the 
Housing Committee and Local Government Select Committee report on planning system in England. I'd like to thank uh, all members of the committee for agreeing this report unanimously, uh, and for our committee specialist Edward Hicks for producing a technically challenging and detailed document with the excellent support of our specialist advisers Kelvin MacDonald and Christine Whitehead. Uh, the report was launched, Mr Deputy Speaker, partly in response to the Government's publication of proposed reforms of the planning system back in August. Uh, but we also build on previous reports by the Select Committee on Local Plans, Land Value Capture, Social Housing. It's a comprehensive document and it was drawn up uh, after, uh, with widespread public interest in it. 154 pieces of written evidence, 14 witnesses came to give evidence. We had 6,000 responses um, to a public survey that we did and 38 members of the public came to join in our de deliberations and we're grateful to all those who participated. I've only got time today, Mr Deputy Speaker, to deal with some of the key recommendations of our report which was followed. A plan that system, which is generally supported in this country, is rightly seen as the uh, heart of, of the planning process and local plans are seen very much at that heart. The committee recognised that the government wants to place increased emphasis on local plans. We're supportive uh, of the proposals to digitise them and also to make the process of formulating local plans simpler and to see them updated more regularly. Many of these ideas, together with making local plans a statutory requirement, were proposals the committee made itself in 2016. So we're pleased to see the government now has recognised their importance. In the report, however, we expressed significant concern about the proposals to reshape local plans by zoning every single site into either a growth, renewal or protected area. We simply don't believe this process can be done in 30 months, bearing in mind many local authorities currently haven't got a local plan in place, uh, or many have got plans which are significantly out of date. There is both a shortage of financial and staff resources in planning departments, and it's crucial the government produce a comprehensive resources and skills strategy which they have promised. The committee were all concerned about uh, uh, the, how the zoning system would operate in practice. The proposals lacked detail, which made them very difficult to assess. We asked for greater clarity about what detail would be needed in local plans to give necessary certainty to developers and other stakeholders um, for the future. We were unpersuaded that the government's zoning system approach as proposed, would produce a quicker, cheaper and more democratic planning system. And we recommend the government reconsider the proposals they put forward. This leads on to a real concern that was expressed very strongly to the committee, that the government's proposal in the White Paper would lead to a lack of ability of councillors and their local communities to influence decisions on individual planning applications. At present, most public involvement is at the point when a planning application is made. The government are right to want to see more local involvement at the local plan stage, as local plans should set the scene for future development. However, to change the system so that local plans are the only point at which communities can get involved, and then to tell communities they have no say afterwards, risks undermining support for the planning system and undermining the democratic process at local council level. Our report emphasised the importance of ensuring members of the public can continue to comment meaningfully on individual planning applications. We call for further research into public involvement in the planning system so we can have nationwide figures showing what's actually going on at present and how it can be improved. The committee are concerned at this stage that the government plans are in general terms, uh, 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 very general terms. And ultimately, planning policy and planning law will need to be written in great detail. It will be the content of this detail which determines whether the government's proposals are workable in practice. That is why the committee believes that producing a planning bill in draft form and making it subject to pre legislative scrutiny by the Select Committee would help ensure that whatever proposals come forward are workable and ensuring that planning lawyers and consultants will not be the greatest beneficiaries from any changes. We were warned the real possibility of a flurry of judicial reviews. One of the very forceful points made to the committee was that the government's planning proposals were essentially house-building proposals. The White Paper contained no mention of commercial property, for example, as the British Property Federation pointed out, and virtually no mention of employment, leisure or climate change. All these issues are absolutely central to having a holistic, integrated and complete planning system which shapes the places where people both live and work. 
With emphasis on housing, however, uh, in the government's white paper, our report also looked at the housing formula and housing delivery. We call for clarity on how the government intends to achieve its housing target of 300,000 new homes a year, which the committee strongly supports, something that's only been achieved in a handful of years in the 1960s. We ask for further information about changes to the housing formula, including how the government's proposed urban uplift, which came during the course of our inquiry, in 20 major towns and cities will work in practice, why those areas were chosen and what's the rationale for the scale of the uplift. We must also ensure that changes to the housing formula do not reduce the level of house building in other parts of the North and Midlands, as this could not contribute towards the levelling up agenda. Our report argued that the government should be very cautious about sweeping away Section 1 and 6 agreements. These are legally enforceable contracts between developers and local authorities, which ensure the delivery of new infrastructure, such as schools and roads for new developments, and the provision of affordable housing. If the government wants to proceed, then they should bring in levies at local rates, which reflect local land values. The government should also guarantee there will be no reduction in affordable rented housing due to the reform of the levy and through the introduction of the First Homes programme. Our inquiry considered the pace at which developments with planning permission were being completed. We concluded it's too slow. Local councils complain regularly. It is not the lack of planning permissions that's the problem, but the slow build-out rates over which they have no control. We recommend that if 18 months after the discharge of planning conditions on a site, local authorities are not satisfied with the extent to which work has progressed, they should be able to revoke the planning permission. And if after that work starts, but progress uh, isn't uh, moving ahead uh, satisfactorily, we recommend local authorities should be able to take into account a whole variety of factors to levy council tax on each uh, uncompleted unit. We hope the government will take that proposal seriously. Our report also makes recommendations on the countryside, the environment, the use of brownfields, the green belt, and many other issues in a very comprehensive document. We are currently undertaking a separate inquiry into permitted development rights. As a committee, we look forward to the government's response to our report. We also stand ready, as I've said, to undertake pre legislative scrutiny of the planning bill to ensure the changes to the planning system that will always be a necessity be complex are given the full and detailed scrutiny they need. This is vital to ensuring that our planning system, Mr Deputy Speaker, builds on its past accomplishments, of which there are many, addresses its present challenges and is fit for the future. Sir Peter Bottomley. Mr Deputy Speaker, the whole House, those who are here virtually and those who are here physically, will want to thank the members of the committee and the chairman of the committee for the work they put into this and for the work they do in other sides, parts of planning and of housing. And I'm glad he said they're going to do a review of permitted development rights because the notorious statutory instrument 2020 stroke 632 is causing chaos all round England. I want to add to what he said, he said he couldn't cover every point, about reinforcing the absence of the word local councillor in the planning statement. It seems to me that government needs to realise that members of parliament matter, so do local councillors, especially in the planning process. I'm glad that the chairman of the committee raised the point about non-housing development, whether it's commercial or it's making provision when you have large-scale development for churches, for sports areas, for children's facilities and the like, to have a whole community being held in mind. I'd like to end by inviting the chairman of the committee to come with the minister to my two planning authorities, to Arran District Council and to Worthing Borough Council, to look down from the chalk garden at High Down, well renovated now, and look at the vineyard, and then look at the north and south Goring Gap, and give assurances to my constituents that this green area around the town of Worthing, the largest one in West Sussex, will not be built on as a result of anything in these proposals. If it were much policy it would be green belt and protected. It's not. It still should be protected. You should not have to build between every strategic gap between one town and a village, or the village of Hamlet of Kingston, the village of East Preston, of Ferring and of Goring. Please come. Clever.
Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, thank the Father of the House for his question and his invitation. I'm happy to take up the invitation, so let's uh, hope there's two of us uh, uh, accept it uh, uh, and come along. Uh, yes, he's absolutely right. Uh, there, there are many issues not contained in the initial proposals. We hope the government addresses them um, in its response to the consultation and, and the, the, the eventual bill. Uh, again, a major omission, local councils aren't mentioned, and local councils are absolutely key to the local planning system, and we must, must recognise the amount of work they do and ensure that they aren't bypassed by any proposals ultimately adopted. Lydia Link. Mohamed Yazan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I thank my honourable friend for his statement and for his tireless work in producing this report? Does he agree with me that the government's approach to permitted development undermines the government's own policy objectives in the planning white paper, in particular the emphasis on local and neighbourhood plans? Honourable Member, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, who is uh, a very valued member of the Select Committee and uh, contributed to this report. He's absolutely right. Uh, the Housing Minister, of course, came yesterday to the Select Committee to talk about permitted development rights. And a point I think we made in our questions uh, to him was that uh, overall reform of the planning system and giving greater certainty to what development will or will not happen in a local plan must not be undermined by permitted development running contrary to the proposals in the local plan. Local authorities must have the right to shape the place which they are responsible for. And I think that's something we'll be looking further at in the report we produce on permitted development. Did you link? Bob Blackman. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, and it will come to, uh, as no surprise to the Chairman of the Select Committee that I agree with every word of his statement and indeed of the report uh, that we've published. Uh, does he agree with me, however, that the, one of the prime concerns here is that if we're going to have uh, the government come forward with zoning of particular areas within their local authority area, that if a growth area is going to be used with um, permission, planning permission not going through the normal process, it's absolutely essential that those areas are subject to full public consultation by the local planning authority, setting out very clearly what the boundaries will be in terms of height, density and other aspects of development on that site before any developer is allowed to get on site and do what they choose. Well, that's Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the, the Honourable Member again for his role, and uh, he's a, a long-standing member of the Select Committee and was around in 2016 when we did our previous report on the changes that we want to see to, to local plans. He's absolutely right. It is this level of detail, which is just so uncertain at present, um, that if, if we're going to produce a zoning system, particularly on growth areas, with major development proposals effectively given the go-ahead without much more uh, scrutiny at the local plan stage. There has to be an awful lot of detail and consultation put into that local plan stage. And it comes back to the point, can realistically be this be done for every single site in a local plan within 30 months? The committee simply didn't believe so. Rachel Hopkins. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I thank my honourable friend uh, for his um, work on the report and, of course, all the hard work of the committee clerks. It's been an excellent report. Um, we heard as a committee how local people want to continue to be able to comment on specific local planning applications. So the proposal to remove the legal requirement to publish planning notices in local newspapers and on lampposts and the like, um, so that it becomes only a discretionary element, would just create a postcode lottery as to you know, uh, where they will continue. Um, this would undermine local democracy and create barriers for those who don't have digital access, such as the elderly or those on, on low incomes, um, and would also damage local and regional newspapers, which are an important source of local information for people. So does the Chair agree with me that the existing statutory notice requirement must be retained for all local authorities to safeguard transparency, equality and democracy in our communities? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank my honourable friend for her contribution to the report. And she's absolutely right. We made this point in our recommendations that we welcome the government's proposals to digitise the system, thought that could bring a better system with more community public access to it. 
but we shouldn't then take steps which exclude those people who are not comfortable in the digital environment and therefore the, 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 the continued retention of statutory notices uh, in a physical form in newspapers or on lampposts is something we'd want to see alongside digital arrangements. Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown. Mr Deputy Speaker, could I congratulate the Chairman uh, and his committee for producing a very comprehensive and constructive report on this uh, very all-encompassing subject? In his report, he says, we think the government's abandonment of its proposed formula for determining housing need is the correct decision. So for many areas, like the Cotswolds, where the formula will have produced a staggering 144% increase in housing numbers, but it wouldn't have addressed the, house, the uh, uh, um, affordability ratio. Could he suggest what his committee's recommendations to the government would be on a revised approach? And importantly, if affordability and housing mix, as in the need for smaller properties or flats for first-time buyers and elderly uh, people who are going to uh, downsize, will be considered. Clavette. I think the housing needs formula is a, is a desperately difficult one, and I, I think the government, government has a difficult job. It's right we should ha try and have a housing needs formula because it can it reduce the amount of time that's taken at planning inquiries on the local plan, uh, which nearly always devolved down to long arguments about housing numbers, which is not really helpful. So I, I, I think it is, and, and if local areas have got particular problems, I think they should highlight them because a, a one-size-fits-all needs assessment doesn't necessarily meet the requirements of every individual authority. In terms of the particulars of sorts of housing, yeah, I think local councils ought to be given an opportunity to be more granular in their approach to the sorts of housing. Indeed, we made a past recommendation in a past report that specifically in every local plan, there should be not an assessment just of housing numbers, but particularly about elderly persons' housing, how many of that sh uh, those units should be built and where they should be built to make sure uh, uh, that, that, that there is provision for elderly people going forward. Ms Twist. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'd like to thank the Housing Communities and Local Government Committee for the very thorough report on the uh, future of the planning system in England. And I particularly welcome the Committee's recommendation that all individuals must still be able to comment and influence upon all individual planning proposals. Now, I see from paragraph 226 of the report that a major feature of responses as part of the public engagement work was the importance attached to nature and wildlife. So would my honourable friend, uh, the Chair of the Select Committee, agree with me that the government must be absolutely explicit about how the provisions of the proposed planning bill and the environment bill will work together to ensure that the key issue of safeguarding our natural environment and ensuring biodiversity gain is actually achieved? Yes, um, thank my uh, uh, honourable friend, who is also a past member of the Select Committee, uh, for those comments. And it's these, this sort of omissions in the government's proposal so far about how um, you know, house building is connected to other issues, for example, how the planning system deals not just with house building but with a whole variety of environmental concerns that do need fleshing out. One thing we did uh, comment on was that uh, in, in terms of the environment, the Canals and River Trust, uh, Natural England, are statutory consultees on individual planning applications currently, but they're not statutory consultees on the local plan. But if all the details in future on particular sites are going to be in the local plan, how do the statutory consultees relate to that? And they're most of the same. They couldn't possibly do all this in 30 months. So some real challenges around that need bringing together in, in the eventual proposal when they come forward. David Johnson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I add my thanks to the Honourable Gentleman and his committee for this report? Does he agree with me that, that most of our constituents are not necessarily opposed to planning reform or to more housing, but they want to feel that their area is not getting a disproportionate share of that housing? And what goes up needs to be good quality, good for the environment, genuinely affordable, but also supported by the right infrastructure. How about uh, absolutely right, the, the Honourable Gentleman, uh, and it's those sorts of issues that, that are often resolved at the uh, planning application stage. Whether they can all be dealt with in, in a local plan, uh, have a well intention, I think is, is, is the real challenge. Uh, and it isn't often the particular designs of, of, of a scheme uh, and, and how it relates to the environment, how traffic issues are dealt with, that really cause the most concerns and problems for people. And we must ensure that, that the public voice on those issues is not lost in any reforms. 
video link. Tim Fang. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, and thank you to the Chair of the Select Committee for an excellent report. Um, congratulate him on a valuable report and such an extensive consultation. Amongst the responses that uh, have been garnered have been those which have uh, raised the, the failure to tackle excessive second home ownership in, in areas like mine. I wonder if he's aware that over the period of the pandemic, a very bad situation has got much, much, much worse. Uh, the proliferation of excessive second home ownership in places like the lakes and the rest of Cumbria robs those communities of a permanent population and can kill the communities altogether. During the pandemic, there's been a 32% increase in the number of homes in the holiday let market, and something like 80% of all the new purchases in the lakes have been to the second home market. Would he agree that the planning bill is a place where the government could very quickly tackle this problem? by making holy lets and second homes a different category of planning use so that communities like mine in Cumbria can protect themselves from being cleansed of local people. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I hear the problem. Uh, it wasn't one that the committee specifically considered uh, in our report, uh, but I think the member is absolutely right uh, that this is something the government could take into account uh, in its legislative proposals. Video link. Sir Robin Neal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I refer to my entry in the register of interests. Uh, I too congratulate the Chairman of the Select Committee and his colleagues upon an excellent report, and uh, particularly welcome the emphasis that's been made today on the need for a continuing involvement for elected representatives of local communities and the communities themselves. Because done properly, planning isn't just about building, it's about shaping communities and the infrastructure and other services that make them a part. But can he also help us as to what might be done to increase the supply of qualified planners? Because many local authorities struggle with their staffing levels. What more can we do to get good people into the system and keep them in the system? That's, um, I completely agree uh, with the, uh, the right honourable gentleman. It's, it's absolutely essential that we recognise the, the shortage of financial resources and the shortage of staff resources, particularly skilled expertise. Uh, and in past years, I think there's been an exodus often of the, some of the younger, uh, brighter people out of the planning system, often gone into private uh, consultancies. Um, so yes, the government have promised, promised that they are doing a strategic review uh, of planning resources, including uh, staffing expertise. Uh, the minister said to us yesterday uh, that that was something he was looking to um, give further information on. I think at the time when the, when the government responds to its consultation uh, on their proposals, we very much want to see that because unless we get that right, there is not a chance of bringing any reforms into play uh, and getting the system to work as it should. Ruth Capper. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I'd also like to add my congratulations to the Chair of the Committee and to his members and to his team for what was a comprehensive report uh, into quite a detailed and, and lengthy uh, white paper. The government sets great store on its levelling up agenda and also has committed itself to net zero. Uh, and the planning system is central to delivering both these and many other uh, key objectives. So does the Honourable Member believe that the White Paper has enough detail on either of these two issues? Um, I don't think we really mentioned either of them in the White Paper and that's something we drew attention to, the lack of mention of, of climate change. It comes back to the lack of linking to some of the environmental proposals from the government. Um, but also on levelling up, uh, I, I do refer to the fact that uh, the government changed the uh, housing needs formula midway through our inquiry uh, and moved some requirements to build homes from uh, southern more rural areas to major cities, many of them in the North and Midlands. Uh, many cities are going to struggle to deal with that without building on their green belts and that's the feedback we're getting, including uh, problems in London as well. But the, 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 the requirement to build homes for areas in the north outside the major cities is going to be reduced. And so it doesn't quite square up with a, uh, a, a, an, an ambition uh, to get more development, more infrastructure, uh, more jobs in the north if, uh, outside the major cities 
if there's a requirement there to build fewer homes. And of course, with that lack of requirement goes lack of support from Homes England as well uh, to get the building underway. So I think that's a major concern that we've drawn attention to and does need addressing. I'd like to thank the Select Committee Chair for his statement and responding to members' questions today. We'll now suspend the three minutes for COVID protection measures. Order. 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 We now come to the general debate on the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971, and I call Jeff Smith to move. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I beg to move that this House has considered the 50th anniversary of the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971. I'm grateful to the Backbench Business Committee for granting us the time, for the cross-party honourable members who supported the application, and particularly to my honourable friend, the member for Reigate, for co-sponsoring it. This May marks 50 years since the Misuse of Drugs Act received royal assent. Back in 1971, there were three television channels, smoking indoors as normal everywhere from schools to doctors' waiting rooms, and women could be legally sacked for being pregnant. Our culture and our society are completely different from that time, but our drugs regime remains the same, focusing on prohibition, criminalisation and punishment, rather than looking at the evidence of what reduces harm to in individuals and to society. It was intended to prevent the use of controlled drugs, to eliminate illegal drug markets and to reduce the harms of drug use. It's not working. 
In 1971, the data suggests that there were fewer than 100 drug-related deaths in England and Wales. In 2019, drug-related deaths in England and Wales rose for the eighth year in a row to 4,393 a 52% increase in drug-related deaths over the last 10 years, and there were 2,883 deaths directly from drug misuse. These people mattered. Many of their deaths were preventable. With better laws and properly funded treatment services, many could still be with us today. In the late 60s, about 1% of adults had used drugs at some point in their life. It's now 34%. And while the drug market remains in the hands of criminal gangs, drugs are getting stronger and more adulterated. People are dying because they don't know what is in the drugs they're using. Even the government acknowledges the failings. A 2014 Home Office report reviewed the evidence and said there's no relationship between tougher punitive sanctions on drug possession and the level of drug use in the country. Last year, Carol Black's review of drugs for the government so the evidence suggests that enforcement crackdowns have little impact on the overall drug supply and can often have the unintended consequence of increasing violence, for example by creating a gap in the market for dealers to compete over or increasing distrust in the drugs market. The police force in County Durham published evidence where drug users were interviewed about a large-scale undercover police operation. It lasted six months, cost over half a million pounds and resulted in the arrest of over 30 people involved in the supply of Class A drugs. When users were asked how long they thought the operation had strangled a heroin supply for, one estimated four hours and another just two hours. And if, if people want more evidence than this one, I'd recommend the books by former undercover cop Neil Woods, who, who gives a graphic illustration of how, um, how the, the, the market uh, is, is there, and even if you interrupt the market, yeah. people come in and, and fill the gap. We cannot arrest our way out of this problem. Through county lines, through dealing and exploitation, more and more young people have been pulled into drug supply and into a life of crime. In 2017 alone, 38,000 people were criminalised for possession of drugs in England and Wales, almost 3,000 of them under the age of 18. People are unnecessarily criminalised, limiting their future life chances and their education and employment opportunities. A third of the prison population are there because of drug offences or offences relating to drug use. Putting people in custodial settings as a result of their substance use is, punishes those who need help, doesn't address the root causes of their issues, and is more often than not counterproductive. All those things add up to part of the human cost of our drugs policy, but what about the financial cost? According to the Home Office, in England alone, Policing and enforcing current drug policy costs £1.4 billion annually. Half of acquisitive crime is related to illegal drug use. A different Home Office Commission report said that the failure of drug policies cost the taxpayer £10.7 billion a year in policing, healthcare and crime. And the total societal costs of harms relating to illegal drug use are now £19.3 billion. Another consequence of the Act is how it's held back scientific and medical developments. Drugs in Schedule 1 like psilocybin, MDMA, LSD and DMT are showing real promise as potentially life-changing treatment options for conditions like depression, PTSD and addictions. And while it's technically possible, it's slow, it's difficult and it's very expensive to do medical research into Schedule 1 substances. So under this policy regime, we're wasting money we're wasting the resources of the criminal justice system. We're wasting the chance to do better research and to find evidence to inform our drug policy and our medical interventions. And we're wasting lives. Well, my honourable friend, Graham. I'm really grateful to my honourable friend for setting out the, the scope of the impact of uh, the drug scene today and the implication that has on residents, including in my constituency of York Central, where there's an incredibly high level of drug deaths, and this is how I got involved in the issue. But I have been on a journey and I have learned how a public health approach can be transformative in using diversion of people away from crime, ensuring there isn't exploitation, 
good treatment, including uh, engagement of drug consumption spaces and taking that full public health approach. Does he agree with me that we need to see a sea change now to see harm reduction, as has been tried and tested elsewhere, and has real uh, incredible outcomes that I, I know he has seen as well? Mrs. Mr Deputy Speaker, my, my honourable friend is absolutely right. And this anniversary is surely the time to take stock, to change our approach, and as she says, to, to, to one that's rooted in evidence and doing what's best for public health. And in 2019, the Health and Social Care Select Committee recommended such an approach. They said, a radical change in approach to UK drug policy, moving from the current criminal justice approach to a health approach with responsibility for drugs policy moving from the Home Office to the Department of Health and Social Care. It supported a consultation on decriminalisation of drugs for personal use. And by the way, decriminalisation is supported by the World Health Organisation, the United Nations Office for Drugs and Crime, <coughs> the Royal College of Physicians and the Royal Society for Public Health. The, the government published its response earlier this year saying it had no intention of decriminalising drugs. It said, and I quote, drugs are illegal because scientific and medical analysis has shown they are harmful to human health. Apart, of course, from alcohol, a drug which is more harmful to the user than most drugs aside from heroin, crack and methamphetamine. Certainly less harmful to the user than cannabis or ecstasy, for example. And it's legal. So let's think for a minute, following the government's logic, what would happen if we made alcohol illegal because it's harmful to human health? People wouldn't stop using it. They'd get it from the black market, as they did during Prohibition in the USA. People would die from badly produced moonshine, as they did in the USA. And the profits would go into the pockets of criminal gangs. So instead of that, we mitigate the harm from alcohol use by legalising it, regulating it, making sure it's not poisonous, making it safe, and we can invest the tax raised from its sale into the NHS and into public messaging. And no one has ever given me a convincing argument why we don't take the same approach to cannabis as many US states and increasing numbers of countries around the world are now doing. There's simply no logic to the government's approach. Now, th there will be different approaches to different drugs, but what I think is common is that the current regime isn't working. And over the last half a century, there have been calls for reform from a wide range of parliamentary committees and public bodies. And we have an increasing body of evidence to look at for how things could change for the better. Uh, the evidence from countries that have liberalised their approach to drugs doesn't suggest an associated increase in use. And the example of Portugal is uh, worth highlighting again. In the early noughties, Portugal was in the grip of Europe's worst heroin and drug death crisis. In 2001, they ended the criminalisation of people who use drugs and established a health-led approach instead. Since then, the drugs-related deaths fell and have remained below the EU average. The proportion of the prison population sentenced for drug offences fell from over 40% to 15%. The number of annual drug overdose deaths reduced from 318 in, in the year 2000 to 40 in 2015 an 18% reduction in the social costs of drug use in the first 10 years of decriminalisation, problematic use and school age use both fell, and rates of drug use in Portugal have remained consistently below the EU average. Even within the current regime, the government could stop blocking some proven harm reduction um, measures like overdose present prevention centres, drug safety testing, and could ramp up and even out the provision of naloxone and heroin assisted treatment. It could have uh, encouraged more diversion schemes, more deferred prosecution schemes, and properly reinvest in the treatment budget that have been cut in recent years. On that point. Mm. I, I'm really grateful again for my humble friend giving way. On the issue of diversion, I was told a powerful story about how young people, instead of getting a criminal record, were given that opportunity in life for someone to invest in them, and as a result went down and, and got apprenticeships and then got a job instead of a criminal record. Surely that is a better way forward for these young people's lives. Uh, she's absolutely right, and we, and we have the evidence in the UK. There have been some very good diversion schemes yeah. in Durham, I can think of, in the West Midlands, and there are others. And we, we only need to, we don't even need to look at the evidence abroad. We can look at the evidence in the UK on how these things work. Yeah. Except that, particularly in relation to cannabis, that uh, you know the initial warning and a fixed penalty notice that we use at the moment doesn't prevent in any way, shape, or form people from being also given to a 
a diversion scheme and other, other steps being taken. There's no barrier to that at the moment, for example, in relation to cannabis. That, that's true. My, my problem with cannabis is that the supply is still in the hands of organised criminal gangs. And that, for me, is not a sensible way to approach, uh, approach our drug policy. Um, so we, we, can, we can explore models of, of um, decriminalisation, uh, and we know that those are, are known to be associated with re reduced rates of recidivism, to reduce burden on police resources and savings to the public purse related to social costs. Or we could look at models of legalised regulation. Whatever happens, we need a wholesale new approach to this problem. The government needs to be honest that the last 50 years of drug policy have been a failure, have come at a terrible human, societal and economic cost. We need to commit to a public health approach rather than a criminal justice approach to drugs policy. One focused on saving lives rooted in support and compassion from those who have used drugs. Among the MPs who, who want to speak in today's debate, there will not be, I think, a single view on the way we go forward about what an alternative to the current approach to drugs policy should look like. And there will be different approaches for different substances. And I look forward to hearing the views of members. But I suspect we will probably mostly agree that on the, the 50th anniversary of the Misuse of Drugs Act, it's worth looking honestly at the legacy of this 50-year-old legislation and considering what needs to change to better serve our constituents and our communities. We should take this opportunity for political parties and the media to stop weaponising drug policy and have a, dr a grown-up discussion about how we protect our communities. And, we, and, and today I'm calling on the government to launch a full, open-minded review of this legislation to learn from our mistakes because, Mr Deputy Speaker, we can't afford another 50 years of failure. And I will leave the final words um, to Anne-Marie Coburn, who is a, a campaigner for anyone's child in the families for safer drug control. Anne-Marie's daughter, Martha, um, like, like people through generations for thousands of years, just wanted to get, have a little bit of fun and get high. She, she researched on the internet how to get high safely, and she was 15 years old when she took um, an overdose of an MDMA that killed her. And Anne-Marie says, as I stand by my daughter's grave, what more evidence do I need that UK drug policy needs to change? The question is, uh, as on the order paper, this is a very important debate and we've got another important debate following. I'm not going to uh, introduce the time limit at this juncture, but I would ask members making contributions to be mindful uh, of the length of those contributions in order we can get everybody in. Video link. Chris Blunt. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Let me first draw the House's attention to my unremunerated interest as a chair of the Conservative Drug Policy Reform Group Limited. And let me congratulate the Honourable Member for Manchester Willington, my co-chair of the APPG for Drug Policy Reform on securing this debate. Uh, I also commiserate on his promotion from whip to spokesman on local government. It's been a real pleasure working with a decent and humane colleague from a very different career background uh, to mine, and I hope this can continue despite his new opposition policy responsibilities. And I appreciate his leadership in delivering today's debate. 50 years ago, this House passed the Misuse of Drugs Act. Its laudable aim was to deter unlawful con uh, controlled drug use and stifle supply. And this followed 1961, when the United States persuaded UN members to sign up to a global narcotics ban. Had the House then seen through the clouds of both excitement and worry about the Woodstock generation, magnified by a popular press, who then, as now, were prone to more than a modest amount of exaggeration, to the evidence of the extraordinary success of what was then known as the British system, in addressing problematic drug use by comparison to the American system, they would surely have thought twice. They perhaps also should just have paused at the American invitation to follow the same principle towards all other drugs that the USA had deployed with such disastrous consequences towards the drug alcohol in 1919 we perhaps should not be surprised at the global disaster that has now overtaken us. If they had known then what we know now, passing this act, 
would have been an appalling betrayal of their duty to the public interest. In the UK, we've invested countless billions in the approach put into law by the MDMA in 1971. With what success? Illegal drugs are today cheaper, more available, potent, widely used than ever. Most of all, victims of drug policy related crimes are off the scale. They range from exploited children to young, usually black men, knifed on our streets to half, half of acquisitive crimes in the UK. And as Honourable Gentleman for Manchester Willington said, we have seen a 40 fold increase in drugs deaths in the, this period. This is a policy choice we have made. In 2001, Portugal implemented a policy that has the key aspects of the British system from the 1960s. And Portugal has dropped its drug deaths in some years by up to 90% as a consequence. Mr Deputy Speaker, we listened with proper attention when the Honourable Member for Birmingham Yardley, when she's read out the list of names of women killed by men each year. 125 in 2016, 113 last year. If I did that in respect of women, men and children, dead as a consequence of the way in which successive governments have implemented this act, I would need to read out an equivalent list of names killed by law and policy accountable to this House every single week this Parliament sits, and still that wouldn't be enough. In the late 1960s, about 1% of adults had used drugs at some point in their life. Now it's 34%. In 1971, heroin use was below 10,000. It's now over a quarter of a million. In 1971, there were under half a million of people who used cannabis. Now it's over 2.5 million, and users of cannabis supplied by criminal gangs today also consume a much more potent drug of real danger to growing young minds. There are those who say we just haven't implemented the powers in SAG hard enough. One of those is Peter Hitchens. To his credit, he's prepared to debate. But to my astonishment, the last time I debated him, he referenced a collection of relevant newspaper headlines. Does he have no idea of the harm that his industry has done through these lurid, fear-mongering headlines that so mislead about the pathetic lives put beyond rescue by this act that creates the innocent victims from the victims of our policy. Rather more academic research and experience take us to a much more reliable conclusion. Last year, part one of Dame Carol Black's review of drugs stated that even if enforcement agencies were sufficiently resourced, it's not clear that they would be able to bring about a sustained reduction in drug supply. And she went further. Enforcement activity can sometimes have unintended consequences, such as increasing levels of drug-related violence and the negative effects of involving individuals in the criminal justice system. As soon as I can, I want to ask Dame Carroll whether she could also have said, almost always, or simply always, instead of can sometimes, as I'm unaware of any evidence to the contrary, ever, anywhere. 34% of UK adults admit to consuming an illegal drug at some point in their life. And having debated this with the then Chief Constable of Durham, Mike Barton, the most authoritative operational police chief on this issue, when 80% of an audience of hundreds of fresher students make the same admission in front of a serving police officer, I rather expect this proportion is growing fast. Our policy has a third of the British population potentially facing a two to five, two to seven year sentence, including senior members of the government. I'm now convinced that this is actually precisely why so few colleagues are really prepared to engage in this debate. It's personally politically dangerous, asked the Chancellor of the Duchy. We represent the population in this as much as anyone else. And I would be surprised if most members of this House hadn't enjoyed what the former Prime Minister dismissed as the normal university experience. The leader of the opposition implied as much about himself. 
but even he wasn't prepared to be candid. Yet this is far, far too important for colleagues to take a pass on. We have a duty to engage and personal experience should not be used to drive colleagues out of considering the wider evidence about the success or failure of this policy. And so my advice to colleagues is don't answer the personal question. You have a wider duty to the public so all parliamentarians can contribute to the consideration of what is in reality an appalling policy failure with 50 years of evidence uh, to draw on. So we wait for the publication of part two of Dame Carroll's report. And we wait. Dare I hope that the government has run into someone prepared to state the inconvenient truth. Only yesterday she reported a meeting of the Criminal Justice Alliance her shock at finding so little research and science to underpin policymaking, commissioning and practice in the UK. The government might point to the role of the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs, yet its members are overworked, unremunerated and supported by a very limited secretariat. They are also appointed on the basis of political vetting, which inevitably compromises their necessary objectivity. And of course, they have the example of Professor David Nutt's inconvenient truth in 2008, which had him sacked. But the damage done by this act of public health and its devouring of the criminal justice system is only half the story. What opportunities have we also missed? The powers to schedule drugs under regulation are derived from the 71 Act. These 2001 regulations should allow for the lawful possession and supply of controlled drugs for legitimate purposes such as research and medicinal use. But our drug scheduling so plainly lacks scientific validation and hasn't been subject to analysis or any recent official analysis of harm. The Home Office has no plans to commission a comprehensive review of the relative harms of the drugs that have been put into Schedule 1. This evidence-free approach must change. Cannabis-based products for medicinal use were only rescheduled because the mother of one child with a severe form of epilepsy was prepared to challenge the system to confiscate her son's medicine, which had been prescribed overseas. Billy Caldwell duly became seriously ill, and to his credit, the then Home Secretary returned the confiscated medicine to Billy under special licence and asked the Chief Medical Officer if there was any evidence for this medicine's efficacy. In two weeks, which is a record-breaking time in medicine assessment, she confirmed there was. There's rather a lot of it, in fact. It appears to go back about three millennia. It should hardly have been a surprise to the House. A House of Lords Committee had recommended it 20 years earlier, but the system is still broken today for patients to get access uh, to medicine from cannabis. Only yesterday we witnessed a wretched plea from a sick child's brother to the Prime Minister for his medical cannabis. This should never have had to be the case. And it's not just cannabis. There, we have denied ourselves 50 years of research into, amongst other conditions, MS, pain control, and it seems all too probably a significant advance in cancer treatment. Evidence is emerging of a number of substances that have found themselves in Schedule 1 that also have great potential. The current scheduling of substances such as psilocybin, MDMA, LSD and DMT now appear to have prevented a probable step change in more effective mental health interventions for conditions such as PTSD, OCD, anorexia nervosa, addiction and depression. We continue to hinder medical research at a time when there have been no new pharmacological treatments for depression since the advance of SSRIs 30 years ago. With a mental health crisis in waiting following this pandemic, we must immediately remove barriers to research. If we want an example of why, look no further than our recent active service veterans. Seven and a half thousand of them have returned from active service in Iraq and Afghanistan with PTSD. The charity Wounded Veterans believe 2,400 of them are beyond available current treatment. So many of them turn to alcohol and street drugs to manage their service inflected pain. Destroyed in our estimation from military hero 
to alcoholic and junkie because we have not enabled the research to break their spiral down to death by their own hand or otherwise. Finally, given what she said yesterday, Carol Black will ask for accountability for coordinated delivery across government that acknowledges drug dependency to be a chronic condition. Drug policy owned and led by the Home Office vainly trying to enforce the provisions of this act over decades through a criminal justice enforcement approach must change to a public health cross-government approach. We've tried and tested 50 years of policy based on instinct and what now appears to be prejudice towards drug users that we have put outside the law. Meanwhile, we knock back our alcohol and smoke our tobacco as drugs inside the law. Prohibition of either is plainly going to drive drinkers and smokers underground with all the accompanying wider costs the overall public good. Yet we've accommodated their undoubted harms, massively greater than those we've criminalised. Yet we can and are starting to control them to a better degree inside the law as the recent substantial public health progress over tobacco consumption shows. This act has failed. It ended the British system towards drug users of the 1960s. Our oldest ally, Portugal, faced with its own drug crisis of the late 1990s, turned to it in 2001 with conspicuous success over the last two decades. Their politicians climb over each other now to claim responsibility. After 50 years, it's about time we all took up our, our responsibility to understand the evidence as to how we can best mitigate this policy disaster that arises from this law passed 50 years ago here in the United Kingdom. Tommy Shepherd. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I wish to associate myself entirely with all of the comments that <clears throat> my two colleagues have just made from either side of this House. I wonder, Mr. Deputy Speaker, what it says about our ability to function as a body which makes and reviews legislation that such a significant piece of legislation dealing with such a major social problem can lie on the statute book for 50 years without review or amendment. All the more incredible when we consider that by any conceivable measure it has been an abject failure in trying to achieve what it set out to achieve. As we have just heard, back in 1971, 1% 1 of the British population said that they used the drugs which the MDA would go on to criminalise. Today, that figure is 34%. We are facing the biggest social policy catastrophe of our generation. We have thousands of people dying every year needlessly because they do not know what they are taking and help is not available for them when things go wrong. We have tens of thousands of people every year who get a criminal record at the way in which we try and tackle this problem. And there are hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people, living in communities up and down this land whose lives are blighted, not just by the misery of people dependent on those drugs in those communities, but by the brutal violence which is used by organised crime to enforce their regulation and supply of these products. By any measure, this policy ought to be reviewed, this legislation ought to be reviewed. But of course it's worse than that, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's not just the fact that the legislation hasn't been able to do what it wanted to do. It's worse than that because the legislation is now an active cause of the problem because the entire area is looked at not as one of public health or well-being but as one of criminal activity and the centre of the misuse of drug, drug act is to criminalise people who use drugs and that does a number of things. First of all, that immediately means the state has no role in the supply and regulation of these products and that responsibility is given to the private sector and to organise crime within the private sector. That is the first consequence of the Misuse of Drugs Act. The second is that if people are getting into trouble and need medical help because of their substance addiction, 
Many of our health and social care staff working in our public agencies are unable or unwilling to put themselves at risk of criminal prosecution by offering that help. And of course, I'd happily give way, yes? If that's true, how does, how does he account for the fact that we have tens of thousands of heroin users on methadone replacement therapy? I will come on to look at the concept of drug consumption rooms in a minute, but what I'm talking about is the fact that people have no ability to come to a health professional and say, what is this? They've no ability to ask for clean needles because these, uh, these actions are prohibited under the 1971 Act and the schedules to it. But the third thing, which has already been remarked upon, is that what the Misuse of Drugs Act does is it stigmatises big time those who use drugs and puts them in a position where they are unlikely, because of social opprobrium, to come and ask for help. Now, we surely need to have a review and a fresh think about a problem which is so manifestly out of control and where the existing legislation is so manifestly unable to provide any assistance. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, I always like to try and see the other side of the argument. So, I want to try and put myself, I, I want to ask the question, why is it that people are resistant to review? Why is it that they want to hold on to things as they are? And I can only conclude that it's because they fear the consequences of decriminalisation or of changing the law. They must, they must somehow think that if we were to do that, that we would unleash floodgates of supply into communities where there aren't already drugs, that there would be many more millions of people who would get caught up in this problem because we would not have the criminal mechanisms that we have at the minute. And I say to any colleagues who think that, wake up. Wake up and see what is happening on the streets of your own constituency. Come with me to any medium-sized town in this country. Come and stand in a bar and make your intentions known what you would like. And within one hour, you will be offered any drug of your choice. If you don't want to have the personal contact, order in advance. Go on the internet and you will find a mobile phone number where you can, through the County Lines Network, order whatever you want and it will be delivered to your door. Sometimes you will even get a customer service message asking for feedback on the supply. That is the extent of what we have at the moment. And it is just fantasy to suggest that there are loads of people out there who might otherwise get into drugs who are somehow prevented by, from doing so by the misuse of drugs. Act. It is not the case. So we need to surely have a grown-up conversation about what we do of the situation where a third of our citizens, a third of our citizens potentially, could be made criminals by the existing legislation and where it is so manifestly unfit for purpose. I'd like to hope that the Home Office and current ministers could begin that process of review with an open mind, rather than just defending the status quo, and be prepared to look at an evidence-based approach, drawing in international comparisons, and try and work up a better system which is grounded in protecting public health and well-being, rather than trying to criminalise behaviour. I would support, my party will support, I think support will be there from all across the House for any bold minister who wanted to take that initiative and begin that dialogue. I'm not saying prescriptively what should be in it. I'm not saying how it should be done. I simply want to have the dialogue, the discussion and the debate because too many people are dying for us not to do so. But while we are doing that, there are some immediate things that we ought to do. And I want to just turn for a moment to the question of drug consumption rooms, probably better called overdose prevention centres. These are medical facilities, and I have been in them and seen them working in Portugal, in Germany, and in Canada. These are facilities where someone who is using drugs can go and can use their own drugs under medical supervision in a medical facility. This isn't going to make the overall problem any better, but what this will do is drive a focus into the very sharp end of the problem, the point at which people are dying. Because what happens at the moment is not that people voluntarily overdose because they're fed up with life and they, they want to just commit suicide. That's not the case at all. What is happening is that people are taking substances and they don't even know what's in them. Sometimes a lethal concoction, sometimes much, much stronger than they thought it was going to be. And, by, and, and because it's all criminal activity, 
They do this activity behind closed doors. It's not something you do in the open. You have to do it behind closed doors. And by the time you realize you have a problem, by the time you can't breathe or you have your heart attack or you need medical help, it is too late to call for assistance. So for the limited number of people in those circumstances, being able to, do, to, to, to fulfill their immediate addiction under medical supervision would literally be a lifesaver. That is what happens in other countries. It is you know, it's blindingly obvious that we ought to try and consider that happening here, but the law forbids it. And even pending a change in the law, I do believe that by regulation the Home Office should allow pilot centres of this to emerge so that we can see for ourselves whether it would work here. After all, what is there to lose? Nothing to lose. Everything to gain. Lives to gain. Now, this doesn't stop people using drugs. This doesn't get rid of the problem. This doesn't make people, you know, get their life back together. It doesn't get people the, the medical help they might need, the, the social services help they might need. It doesn't get them a job if they haven't got one. Of course it doesn't. But it keeps them alive long enough so that those interventions can then take place further down the line. And you cannot give help to a dead person. So that is why it is so vital that we have a sensible discussion about these drug consumption rooms and supervised facilities. And the Scottish Government stands ready and has been pressing the Home Office to allow them to go ahead and do this in Glasgow. Which brings me to the final point. I know you wanted people not to, to go on too long, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. So my, the final point I want to talk about is this, and that is the interrelationship between the devolution of political authority and administrative action in the United Kingdom uh, and this particular problem. Because we have a bit of a disjuncture in that the whole criminal uh, framework, the 1971 Act and others, is a reserve matter here for Westminster, which sets the, the problem, if you like. But dealing with the consequences of that, the health and social care and the economic fallout from that policy is a matter for the devolved administrations. And it would seem to me a matter of ultimate sense, not, not getting into the arguments about Scottish independence or whatever. It would just be a matter of grown-up policy to have the same part of government responsible for the regulation as is responsible for mopping up the consequences of the problem. And that's why I think when the time comes we need to urgently look at devolution of the controls currently in place in the 71 Act and whatever replaces it to go to the devolved administrations and to be located within a health and social care context which is all already devolved. Now, in advance of that, and I asked the Minister, I've, I've spoken with the Minister several times on this, this matter, and I trust that he, he is thoughtful on the matter. I do think he is prepared to consider uh, other points of view. I think he's prepared to consider evidence, but I think he feels himself mightily constrained by tradition, convention, and perhaps by political pressure elsewhere. I say to him, though, he has received a letter now from the Drugs Minister in Scotland, Angela Constance, asking for a Four Nations Summit to consider, amongst other things, working on a pilot basis to establish these types of medical facilities. And I hope very much that in his remarks today he will confirm that he's taking a positive reaction to that response and that he is prepared, if we can't change things overnight across the whole of the United Kingdom, let us employ the apparatus of devolution to allow one part of the United Kingdom to go beyond where other parts perhaps are willing to go at the minute and to collate the evidence, to point a way to the future which could then lead to best practice being adopted throughout the entire place. We have a responsibility not to continue to stick our heads on the sands in this matter. It's been a collective exercise of ignoring the blinding obvious for far too long. And I appeal to colleagues, we're not having a vote today, but I appeal to colleagues to do what they can through the various structures of this place and within their political parties, because this should not be a matter that divides us on party grounds. To, to consider the question about why we need a review after this half century, why things are so clearly wrong that we must do something. And we cannot continue to stick our head in our sands and pretend that things are okay now. Now, the moment, 50 years after the passage of this Act, is the time to, to admit that it isn't working and to do better. And the citizens of this country deserve that. Yeah. So, uh, 
everybody contributing now really focus on about five minutes please if they could i'm not putting the time limit on yet but uh, i may be forced to, to protect other business nick fletcher thank you mr Never speaker what politicians are often criticized most for is sitting on the fence and while i'm sure the whips across the house like to believe they are skilled in the power of persuasion there is no hiding the fact that often many mps have made up their minds on issues long ago Yet it is clear with this subject that the time for open and honest debate and the future of the UK's drug policy is desperately needed, not least because the current strategy does not appear to be working. When I speak to individuals from South Yorkshire Police, the problem is self-evident. While time spent catching dealers does temporarily reduce the supply, there appears to be no lack of criminals. Mr Deputy Speaker, an ex-police officer told me recently about a huge drugs bust in April, where everyone from the top ringleaders to the small dealers were arrested. After thousands of hours of police work and millions of pounds of the drugs were discovered, yet according to the former police officer I spoke to, the raid managed to keep cannabis off the streets for a whole two hours. So being tough on dealers doesn't seem to be working. The gains made by the police are small and for this reason I have conclu concluded that enforcement alone is never going to get us to a solution. We know that every time someone buys drugs, they become part of the criminal supply chain. Put simply, it links them directly to dealers who have no problem in carrying a knife or a gun. Due to the fact that suppliers are operating outside the law, they don't have the police to protect them, so instead they protect themselves with weapons. They don't pay taxes either, nor do they give a receipt. Equally, not, they are not held responsible if their product leads to hospitalisation or even death. So while we are talking about drug reform, decriminalisation where users are not penalised for possessing drugs would not fix these issues. So the answer may be to totally legalise cannabis and potentially other drugs. I have heard some say that putting drugs in the hands of the government or a legal partner takes the production supply chains and any customer transaction out of the hands of criminals. I have also heard that such a policy makes sense as it would ensure that the quality of products would be controlled, leading to fewer deaths from consumption. Taxes could be raised and we could get consumers out of the supply chain. Yet I am not so convinced adopting these policies will be trouble free. For one, are we to believe that the persons that are involved in drugs would simply leave and go and find employment in a regular job? I am not convinced. After all, research from the Institute of Economic Affairs concluded that current black market in cannabis is worth £2.6 billion per year with 255 tonnes have been sold to 3 million users in 2016. Any movement of good government controlled legislation of cannabis would be a huge loss for current criminals and I fear they would simply move into selling harder drugs that would be grossly irresponsible to ever even consider regulating. Secondly, while the legalisation of something like cannabis may lead to an upsurge in usage, there is conflicting evidence but a recent peer reviewed study conducted in the United States concluded that cannabis usage increased in states where the drug was legalised. With cannabis usage increasing, like being linked to psychiatric disorders including depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, what toll would liberalisation have on our NHS and its mental health services? Uh, he, he makes an important point, but is he aware that the, 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 dif the difficulty with cannabis is that it's made up of different compounds? THC and CBD are the two main ones. And the problem with the cannabis that we buy on the streets, which is mainly skunk, is it's very high in THC. And it's that that causes the problem. Now, if you legalise cannabis, if you make the product safer by regulating it, you have a, a better balanced product that is not uh, dangerous and will not be leading to the kind of consequences he's talked about. Thank you. I thank my honourable member for saying what he's saying. But I still go back to what I said before. I think if we legalise the cannabis that he talks about and make that safe, I still think there would be the illegal, the criminal element that would continue selling the, um, um, the, the cannabis that is... Um, in Amsterdam. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a good place to be. The questions I have raised today are not new to those involved in policy making, yet such arguments will be new to many of my constituents who unfortunately have had to deal with the effects of illicit drug dealing in their communities. And that is why I believe this House and the Government need to have an open mind when considering about reform of this area. And before we rush into anything, we must ask, the ask what the potential effects of reform are, especially for our children and young people. I therefore believe that as a compassionate individuals, the best thing for us to do is to deter people from starting the habit in the first place. 
With regards to drugs, this means doing everything we can as parents, family members, community members, society, government, to educate our children and look out for them too. Look out for who their friends are, have high expectations for how they behave, keep them entertained and encouraged, keep them fit and healthy, and most importantly, give them a vision of a great future. We also need to take responsibility for our own actions. Mr Deputy Speaker, that means the minority of successful people out there who are earning good money need to stop their weekend coke habit or their marijuana habit because contrary to what they think, this practice is hurting communities and putting lives in danger. They need to think again because they are part of the problem. They are part of that chain and they are fueling demand. Every time these people take drugs in expensive bars and nightclubs, they are part of the chain that gives a nine-year-old running drugs. They are part of the chain that puts a knife in the hands of a 16-year-old. And they are part of the chain that leaves grieving parents mourning the loss of a son or a daughter who has just overdosed. Put simply, there will be a lot less demand if the people who aren't addicted but take drugs rec recreationally stop doing so. This reduction in demand would ensure that the market would shrink and the number of dealers and crime would be reduced. And when our police do the big drugs bust, maybe the streets wouldn't be drugs free for two hours, just maybe it would be permanently free from these dangerous substances. In summary, we need to stop our young people getting involved in drugs by educating on the damage they cause. We also need to put more support into helping those lives who are already affected by drug addiction. These two simple policies alone would help drastically reduce demand and therefore the size of the market. In turn, this will give our police forces a fighting chance to catch the dealers and other criminals involved in these supply chains. Thank you. Uh, and I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to introduce a time limit of five minutes, which is still fairly generous compared to what I know a number of backbenchers are used to. Sorry, Adam, but I know you're a seasoned contributor and will be able to do it within the five minutes. Adam Holloway. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, in my experience, drug addiction is very clearly an illness. Opiate addiction, for example, is a health problem. And as we've heard very passionately from, from uh, three of the speakers today, we urgently need to move from a criminal justice response to a health response. A couple of weeks ago, I, I spent um, 10 days or so in the US going around um, homeless shelters uh, on the East Coast and looking at what is probably a historic opportunity to stabilize uh, the street homeless population coming out of the pandemic. And of course, the, the, the problem of, of street homelessness in the US is somewhat different to the one we have here, given our, 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 our benefits available to, to pay for housing here. Um, but they share the common thread that uh, very, very large numbers of the street homeless are mentally ill or drug addicted. And I spent an extraordinary day with uh, Professor Jim O'Connell, um, who set up Boston Medical Care for the homeless back in the mid 80s. He realized street homeless people didn't have medical records, and he's now got an in, in, in enormous um, uh, uh, operation. One of the things that he does is what the, uh, the member for Edinburgh East described very movingly as overdose prevention. He has uh, a, an area, it's, 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 it's tarmac, it's half the size of a, of, a, of a tennis court. It's called the Southampton Comfort Station, and it's there that drug addicted, opiate addicted people come and shoot themselves up with fentanyl. And I, did, I used to be a TV reporter and I had the same emotional response to just seeing these 200 people shooting up, staggering, preparing to, to inject themselves as if they were on a picnic or you know, rolling, up, rolling up a cigarette. There's just appalling scene. It was like, I don't know, it's like I would imagine somehow hell would be. And I wouldn't want to, to live one second of any of those people's lives as Pam and Sue from Professor O'Connell's operation wait there to get these people breathing again when they've had an inaccurate dose of, uh, of, of, of fentanyl. So as I say, here, the, the overwhelming majority of street homeless people 
are drug addicted or mentally ill. And look, whatever your route to addiction, whatever judgments we want to make about these things, the reality is that these people are addicted. They have a very serious illness. You know, I've taken uh, opiates for, for pain relief, and I can absolutely see how you could very, very quickly become addicted to this stuff. So, you know, as, as the member for Rygate has said, as the member for Edinburgh East has said, as the member for, for Manchester Withington has said, you know, we've got to be pragmatic about this. We've got to have a grown-up discussion to find a humane way out of it. You know, not just for them, but, you know, also for the wider society. So I think we need to think about all things, you know, at the very least having overdose prevention places, but, you know, prescribing, you know, decriminalisation, moving it out of the criminal justice sphere. These people are ill. And uh, as the, the member for Manchester Withington said, you cannot arrest your way out of this problem. Thank you. Thank you for your cooperation, Adam. I'm really grateful. Ronnie Cowan. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. The stated purpose of the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971 is to prevent the misuse of controlled drugs. By any measurement that we wish to employ, the Act has failed. The fact that it has been allowed to fail for 50 years is an abomination. We have gone, as was stated, from under 100 deaths in 1971 to over 5,000 in 2020. The legislation is flawed, and the job we are asking the law enforcement agencies to do is impossible. The fallout is picked up by the NHS and the many, many third sector organisations. A lot has changed since 1971. Asbestos is no longer a popular building material. Women can no longer be fired for being pregnant. In many situations, we have moved forward with the times, but in drugs policy, we are firmly entrenched in the past. When we changed our drug policy in 1971, we junked the British system in favour of the misguided policy of Richard Nixon's America. The result has been an increase in crime, increase in corruption, an increase in harm, and an increase in the number of drug-related deaths. This involves our communities being subjected to violent crime, vicious turf wars, the corruption of the young and often vulnerable members of society. We cannot, we never will, be able to arrest our way out of a drugs war. Substances that are once legal are now made by criminals with scant regard for consumer safety. They're often cut with other products and potency can't be guaranteed. As a result, many young people have died experimenting with drugs. One tablet, one tablet, that is all it takes and a life can be lost because they are not regulated. Other countries are not inflicted by this paralysis. They have decriminalised and legalised drugs. They have drug consumption rooms. They have diversion schemes. I have visited Portugal and Catalonia to see what they are doing, and it works. It saves lives and it rehabilitates. These are humane schemes because they treat drug addiction and harm as a health issue, not a criminal justice one. They're creating an environment where people are not marginalised and ostracised and, as a result, are not experiencing prejudice because of their health issue. And that can only happen when there's a change of a mindset that facilitates the provisions of services. We need to waken up to the reality that the policies we're pursuing are not doing any good and, in some cases, are actually making the situation worse. Recent evidence from Canada as quoted in the Scottish Affairs Select Committee Drugs Inquiry report, showed overdose prevention centres in British Columbia alone saved between 160 and 350 lives in 20 months. And yet the UK government's attitude is that the establishment of drug consumption rooms would condone drug use. This lack of empathy and refusal to bow to evidence makes me wonder if the UK Home Office thinks of the life of a drug addict is a life not worth saving. Because neither the Home Office nor the Department of Health has provided any evidence to contradict the findings of numerous reviews, including by the European Monitoring Centre on Drugs and Drug Addiction and the ACMD, who said that such facilities have not been found to increase injecting 
drugs use or local crime rates. Listen to the United Nations Executive Board, chaired by the UN Secretary General and representing 31 UN agencies, including the World Health Organization and the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. They have called on member states to promote alternatives to conviction and punishment in appropriate cases, including the decriminalization of drug possession for personal use. Minister, please drop the coming down hard on criminals rhetoric. It may sound good, but it does not work today. It has not worked for 50 years. It's time to end the war on drugs and start the war on the causes of addiction. And please, will you engage the Scotland's drug minister, Angela Constance, help her remove obstacles so we can create a more progressive and more effective drug policy, one that has health at its core. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ronnie. And I'm sorry you couldn't have the, the, the timing clock uh, visible, but my goodness me, you did finish within the five minutes, so thank you very much. Kenny McCaskill. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I, I come at this debate from the experiences of Justice Secretary in Scotland for seven and a half years. It would also be fair to say that I think I reflect the views privately of many senior individuals, both in law enforcement and in the judiciary. Uh, Mike Barton was mentioned. Only a few have had the courage to speak out. But privately, many will tell you, uh, as I have come to see, that this cannot be solved by justice. It has to be treated as a health problem. I always recall that when I started as Justice Secretary, a drug debt was seen as being recovered or paid off by a stab in the buttocks. By the time I was demitting office, it was the production of a firearm. Now in Scotland, it's almost invariably the use of that firearm. The levels of violence are escalating. What was seen in the streets of London is now seen in the streets of Glasgow. What was viewed as the norm in Glasgow is now prevalent in Edinburgh. The whole equivalent of the county lines, this is spreading across our country and we are not defeating it in any shape or form. If it could be done by law enforcement, if it could be done by military power, then the United States would be drug free as it is, it isn't, and it's a total failure despite all their weaponry and all the assets that they have at their disposal. That's why there has to be a change. Because not only is it affecting our safety in terms of the escalation of crime, the level of the corruption of our economy, there are, oh, there are whole areas of our economy that are literally being taken over by the drug trade and laundered money. There are aspects, and I recall asking senior police officers in Scotland where there are particular trade in Glasgow that would be viewed as clean in terms of, I won't name that trade for those who are the clean ones in that particular aspect, and asking if there's a clean one. And the answer was, uh, there probably was, but not that they knew of them. So that won't just be in particular cities in Scotland, it's across the United Kingdom, the so-called colourful businessmen. We know who they are, we know where they get their money, and actually the Misuse of Drugs Act fuels that and provides for it. That's why we have to change. Of course it would take the wisdom of Solomon to provide a solution, because at the heart of the drug addiction problem, it's deep-rooted, it's poverty, it's health, it's inequality, it's hopelessness. Of course there's some elements of hedonism, but in the main, those who suffer are people who are tragic, who are individuals who are captured and who are caught, and we require to help them, to treat them not to punish them and to worsen their situations. As other people have mentioned, other countries have shown that a different path can be taken. I do believe that the Portuguese method is the way that should be chosen. I do believe that the power should be devolved to Scotland so that we can go on a different path. If we get it wrong, then it won't impact upon the rest of the UK. If we get it right, then we will be a method that you will be able to see what has happened. After all, there has been no calamity in the Iberian Peninsula no effect upon Spain, all the suggestions that every drug addict in Spain was going to depart to Faro and the Algarve has shown to be false. Portugal has managed to improve the situation. It is no Valhalla, but it's better. But if the Minister is not prepared to devolve drug policy in whole, then I do believe that there has to be some flexibility. And my friend from the Edinburgh East mentioned earlier the request by the Scottish Drug Secretary uh, for a summit to discuss aspects that can be changed because the Scottish Parliament has control over justice and health. We have control over abortion and end of life. And yet, because of the restrictions of the drug policy, we are not able to deal with, whether you call them drug consumption rooms or overdose prevention rooms. We're not able to test street tablets. The people are going to take drugs. It's surely better that we should know that what they're actually buying is something that can be consumed safely and won't be the equivalent of getting the proverbial black spot in your hand that will result in death or a, or a living hell thereafter. 
All of that can be dealt with by simply allowing some latitude and some powers. There will be no danger or difficulty for the rest of the United Kingdom. It can be used as a testing ground because there is an issue in Scotland. People are dying. It's entirely inadequate to say that it could all be solved simply within the current powers of the Scottish Parliament because it can't. I'll be the first to accept that there's more that has to be done, that more should have been done, and that blame has to be accepted by the Scottish Government, especially providing treatment orders and the availability for people to get support. Equally, that on its own will not address the fundamental problem. There has to be a radical change, which I believe should come pan-UK. But if the Minister is not prepared to accept that, if the Minister, as I think he does, accept that there is a particular problem that is worth in Scotland, then we have to be able to address that. And that means that we have to have, if not the powers in whole, we have to have the powers in part. We have to be able to provide the drug consumption rooms to ensure that addicts can take safely. We have to be able to ensure that what is being bought and traded is in fact capable of being consumed, even if we don't want it consumed. There has to be a better way, because the intransigence being shown by Westminster is being paid in the communities of Scotland and the deaths of far too many individuals. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in both my time as a doctor and a volunteer special constable, I've got to see up close the harms that drugs do to our society, and I've also seen it in my personal life. And I want to begin by focusing on areas of agreement that I share with the members for with Internal Rygate and others. It's clearly right that the best outcome for an individual addicted to drugs is to be supported to overcome that addiction. It's clearly better for individuals who end up using drugs that they can do so in a way that minimises the risk of harm. It's clearly true that often... Uh, it's going, not going to be the best use of police time to pursue individuals who are, are, are using drugs on a personal basis. These are things I think we can all agree on. But I'm afraid some of the other arguments put forward today fail on a number of fronts. They fail to understand the reality of the policing of drugs use in society at the moment. They have failed to understand the nature of criminality associated with drug production, and they fail to understand the complexity of addiction and recovery. And as so often the case from those on the left, they take for granted all of the quiet benefits of our current approach to drugs that could be potentially lost with reform. Fundamentally, abstinence-based policies are stopping very many people from taking illicit drugs. The overwhelming majority of people don't take drugs. And what members have done today, without any evidence whatsoever, is to draw association with cause. There are an enormous number of social ills that have exploded over the last 30 years. You cannot say that because our approach was X. It's been the cause of that. It's, there are many, many factors that drive, drive drug use, and you have no idea what drug use would have been had we had a different approach. I would ask the member for Withington, who I know DJed in nightclubs that I frequented a long time ago in, in Leeds and Manchester, how many times his nightclubs were raided by police bent on catching everybody that was taking amphetamines? How many times he's seen a, a police sniff a dog outside of a festival desperate to catch people for uh, taking these types of drugs? As I mentioned earlier, with cannabis, the overwhelming majority of people who are caught with uh, cannabis and are, have it only for possession, if they're an adult, they're not causing any other kind of problems for the local area, like uh, smoking it publicly or being involved in criminality, will end up with, with a warning notice and a fine. Very, very, very few of the people you've talked about being in prison for drug offences are there for consumption. They're overwhelmingly in there for dealing, and if they're there for consumption, it's usually because they've had a string of other interventions, whether it be a suspended sentence, a community order, other things. And actually, I think it's fair, ultimately, they continue to, to cause misery in their local communities that they face a prison sentence for that. It's not, they're not there because, fundamentally, we're sending people away to prison because they smoke cannabis or because they take ecstasy. That's just not the reality of the situation. And uh, the, the question that might provoke, of course, is, well, why don't we just decriminalise it then if, if people are kind of relatively able to, to use it in proportion? Um, and it goes back to what I said uh, before. Firstly, I don't endorse that situation. My strong view is that the criminalisation deters an awful lot of people from using it. And members can't have it both ways. They can't say, on the one hand, there's all this stigma with drug use, you can't get treatment, you can't speak about it, you can't be freely open with it, and then say decriminalisation won't increase uh, usage because it's freely available anyway and people can just get at. You can't have those both scenarios. You must have one or the other. It's, there there is, is a stigma which will have a social effect or there isn't. You can't have it uh, both ways. And when it comes to the nature of criminality related to drug dealing, drug dealing and, the, and drugs being illegal does not create criminal gangs. Criminal gangs exist because there are sections of our society that are willing to step outside of the rules of the norms, use violence, be thugs, and do things we, the rest of us won't do to make a quick buck. They happen to be doing that with drugs, and in two ways, decriminalising won't change that. First of all, they'll just do more of other things. There'll be more racketeering, there'll be more counterfeit money, there'll be more people trafficking. There will always be people that will, will look to make money and be violent as, as a result of that. And as my member mentioned, 
whatever limits we put on drugs, unless people really here think that Boots are going to be giving out injectable heroin, there will be limits on the drugs that would be criminalised. And, and counter to what my honourable friend has said, actually the evidence is, for example, in Amsterdam, they have one of the biggest problems with potent uh, cannabis. One of the biggest problems with potent cannabis, decriminalising the use of, of cannabis in Amsterdam has not stopped that. So whatever we do, there will always be people that want. It's the nature of addiction. The nature of addiction is that you want a bigger hit, you want more than you got the first time. So you always eventually can hit those limits and want someone else to go above what the law will allow if we're accepting that there will be some kind of barriers. And I think I want to draw finally on my experience of, uh, at, at university. As a doctor, we had uh, a, a former heroin addict come in to, to speak to us. This was a lady who had multiple goes at addiction. Her ongoing addiction was not, her, was not as a result of not being able to get uh, treatment. She had multiple opportunities to seek treatment. She went on some treatment courses. Actually, it was hitting rock bottom, having no help from anyone, having exhausted everything that was available to her that actually turned it around. And even the very best addiction programs I'm afraid aren't particularly successful uh, unless people go through them multiple times and they go on a bit of a journey. So the idea that you know, we're going to fix this problem because we're going to give people treatment is, is, is naive, I'm afraid. It will carry on regardless because of the inherent nature of these substances, which I think on balance should be banned. And you have to weigh up the cost to society of even a small increase of the number of people that take these drugs in the efforts to, to perhaps save those people, of course, we feel sorry for who've ended up taking them anyway. Yeah, th thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I, I really do feel privileged to speak in this debate. It, it's been an absolutely terrific debate. And some fantastic contributions and that that isn't to denigrate the contributions of the honourable members uh, you know, who take a different point of view but I particularly want to associate um, myself with the, the remarks of my uh, good and honourable friend the member for Manchester uh, uh, Withington uh, uh, and the uh, um, right honourable member for Rygate uh, and the honourable member for Edinburgh East and the honourable member for Inver Clyde and for, for East Lothian because I think this is a, 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 an important subject and I'd like to thank the Backbench Business Committee for granting the time. Clearly we've had 50 years of failure with the Misuse of Drugs Act. You know, any, any analysis, objective analysis, it indicates that, that current policies are not working and for me that means it's time to try something new. There's been some terrific suggestions about pilot schemes, so something that I've advocated uh, for, for a number of years now. I, I might say, originally, I, I had the same views as the, uh, as the members opposite, but um, I, I've taken the time um, to, uh, to, 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 to get involved with the subject, to, to meet people like late Ron Hogg, who was extremely brave, uh, uh, our former Police and Crime Commissioner in Durham, <laughs> Who, who, who introduced some heroin assisted treatment programs, diversionary programs, Mike Barton, our chief constable, extremely brave, it isn't a popular measure with the, with the general public, but it was effective, it was effective in reducing crime, in reducing the number of uh, avoidable drugs death, uh, and successful in removing some of the burden from the criminal justice system. Problematic drug or alcohol deaths higher in areas of significant deprivation. I think that's a given. It's another reason why I'm very concerned about it. I don't consider it an individual moral failing. I don't make such judgments. But there's a complex interplay of economic and societal and, and, and family factors which affect someone's chances of developing substance misuse issues. But I think we need to ask ourselves what the Misuse of Drugs Act has achieved. In the late 60s, as we've heard, about 1% of adults had used drugs at some point, we're now, which are now criminalised. It's now 34%. Heroin use has risen exponentially, 25 fold since 1971. Cannabis use has risen five fold. Tens of thousands have been imprisoned and hundreds of thousands of years have been served. More enforcement won't solve the problem. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I'm a member of the Drugs, Alcohol and Justice Cross-Party Parliamentary Group and, and that stands for evidence, not prejudice in policy and treatment, not punishment in practice. The groups advised by Humankind, With You and the Westminster Drug Project 
charities which together support around 150,000 people across the UK each year. And although the, the third sector is well placed to support those with complex needs and with vulnerabilities, and also has the necessary talent and tenacity and experience to do this, it has lacked resources due to a number of years of cuts to local budgets. Significant and sustained investment is needed now to rebuild and reinvigorate our services. If we don't, we're simply storing up problems for the future in the way the services are delivered at present. In order to address health inequalities effectively and create change for people who are most affected by these inequalities, the government must commit to a public health approach rather than a criminal justice approach to drugs policy. I would like to also recommend Neil Wood's book, Good Cop, Bad Cop. It's a very instructive read in undercover policeman in his experience. It is an inconvenient truth, and indeed Paul Townsley, the chief executive of Humankind said, after 50 years, it's high time government really committed to taking a health first approach to drugs use. Locking people up hasn't worked, but we know that access to high quality treatment and support does work. Over 25 countries across the world have decriminalised possession of some or all drugs, and the international evidence shows an alternative policy is possible and effective. Thank you. Thank you very much. The timing clock should now be visible for the uh, video connections. Alison Thewlis. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Misuse of Drugs Act has failed. It has not stopped the, the flow of illicit drugs into our country, it's not prevented people taking drugs, and it's not kept them alive. In communities up and down these islands, predominantly but not exclusively in communities where deprivation has been rife, families bear the scars of loved ones criminalised and lost to drugs. Generations of policy and politicians have failed them. It's inexcusable and it can't go on. Drugs legislation is reserved to Westminster under Schedule 5 of the Scotland Act, which specifically mentions that B1, the subject matter of the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971. In small areas such as needle distribution, life-saving naloxone provision and the excellent heroin-assisted treatment programme operated by the Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership under licence from the Home Office, allowances have been made under the Misuse of Drugs Act. The UK government could go much further, and I'd have them tear up the Misuse of Drugs Act and start again, or devolve it all to the Scottish Parliament, but in the meantime, they could allow the Scottish government to take further action to reduce harm and save lives. Medically supervised drug consumption rooms or safe injecting facilities or overdose prevention rooms, there are different names, but the purpose is the same. To get those who are injecting drugs inside, out of the pouring rain, the bin sheds, the filthy waste ground and the lonely back lanes, get people into a place where they will be looked after, where people can access support, advice, a cup of tea and some dignity. Where if people overdose, they can receive treatment right away, not whenever a passerby happens to find them. Where people can move towards treatment and recovery when they're ready and stay alive long enough to get there. It's not asking much. It's what we'd all want if someone we loved in that, was in that position. DCRs won't fix everything, and I would never claim that, but they are part of the picture. I was lucky enough to visit the k um, DCR in Geneva in 2019. Caniff marks its 20th anniversary this year with some reflection on where they have come from. In 1986, Switzerland had amongst the highest reported HIV prevalence in the world. According to Miriam Wolf and Michael Herzig, between 1991 and 2010, overdose deaths in Switzerland decreased by 50%. HIV infections decreased by 65% and new heroin users decreased by 80%. And this is the result of public health rather than a criminal justice intervention. And Switzerland are not alone as Colleagues have laid clear uh, countries around the world have taken similar paths. I still recall the astonishment of the staff in Cana when I described the situation in Glasgow and showed them the pictures of where people inject in waste ground near my constituency office. I pay credit to Serge Longier, Garan Sarn and the team at Cana for all they are doing to ensure that those who use their service are given hope and dignity. They offer access to support, to training, to jobs, as well as providing a place where people can take drugs in safety and move towards recovery. Glasgow has had a plan for a similar facility since the 2016 taking away the chaos report. It's the Home Office who stands in the way of this plan. An amendment to the Misuse of Drugs Act, a simple statutory instrument, without a stroke, protect from prosecution those who seek to operate, work in or use such a medically supervised drug consumption room. 
In a brave attempt to provide the beginnings of the facility, the campaigner Peter Crikant has been operating an overdose prevention project using a refurbished ambulance as a safe injecting van. And he puts himself at risk in doing so, and I thank him from the bottom of my heart for that work. Peter is reducing harm and he is saving lives, but it shouldn't just be up to him. I think of all the people who might still be alive today had the Home Office approved a proper facility for Glasgow five years ago, had they not fallen back to the same tired old political rhetoric. The cowardly home ministers in the Home Office who won't even come to my constituency to walk the streets, to listen to the campaigners with lived experience like Peter Cricker, and to meet with those who such a facility would support. It won't solve everything. We know this, but it would help. And if it saved one person from being added to the grim total of drug deaths in Scotland, it would be worth it. The UK government must give up their damaging rhetoric, stop listening to the Daily Mail and instead listen to the overwhelming global evidence of how medically supervised drug consumption rooms reduce harm and save lives and do it now. Thank you very much, Alison. Video link, Janet Davey. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm very grateful to my honourable friend for securing this significant debate. 50 years of the Misuse of Drugs Act, according to Charity Transform, are saying this is 50 years of failure, and I agree. It's time we took a public health approach to drugs policy that puts people before prejudice. And it's time we had a review and reform of this act. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm first going to speak about the prejudices before I speak about the public health approach. Professor Robert Reiner, a retired lecturer at London School of Economics that I had the privilege to learn under, spoke about the over-policing of black young men and the under-protection. He has spoken about this for decades, and for decades very little has actually happened to improve the plight of young black men. He experienced stigma by officers during stop and search, often for suspected drugs. They experience inequality of strip searches that lacks adequate monitoring. They experience inequality of due care and concern while in a police cell. And they are less likely to be given a warning and more likely to be given a caution. They are often released from custody early hours of the morning and have four miles to return home. They experience inequality of sentencing and often receive a harsh sentence. You may be wondering where am I getting this information from? Most of this comes from my constituents. The impact on children especially heartbreaking. I've heard stories of young boys from the black community as young as 12 years old being groomed and exploited by gangs to sell drugs and to carry knives. These boys may have been doing well at school and had dreams for their future. But once they're caught in the net of drug dealers it is almost impossible to leave without your life being unharmed. The stories I've been told are of older men offering them buy them trainers, giving them money, offering them a place to hang out in their homes. And when they cannot be coerced, manipulated and bribed, they are often threatened. We know where you live. We know your family, your sister. It becomes sinister. And then they are made a slave to crimes. That is not a sin. They are powerless to their masters. And we must remember they are children. Where is the government in this? Where is the policy? Where is the national campaign message? Where are the messages to children, to parents, to carers, to teachers? Where is the advice and the support? Who is it safe for children to confide in and where should they go without being stigmatised, criminalised or threatened by the very officials who are meant to protect them? The government keeps children exploited by gangs between a rock and a hard place and this should not be so. Many, uh, like myself, will remember Grange Hill, the song, campaign about Just Say No. It was a national incentive and what followed was saying no to alcohol and drugs. I know times have changed, but we need these campaigns. We need strong campaigns and we need to remember that young people, boys, are victims and not criminals. They, their family and carers and the public need the government to step up and to protect vulnerable young people, no matter what colour of their skin tone. And when it comes to the public health approach, addiction is an illness. How many of us choose to be ill? They have deep-rooted deep issues that, need, that they need help with. It has never, it has never made sense to criminalise people for harming themselves. Of course, everyone should face the consequence of their actions if they commit a violent crime. But criminalising people for drug possession or supply and uh, apply punitive prison sentences just aren't the answer. Criminalising people for drugs, drugs is also an inadequate use of public funds. Instead of building prisons, we should be investing in youth centres, women's centres, hospitals, community outreach centres, advice centres and preventative initiatives. In countries like Norway, 
a focus on rehabilitation has led them to having some of the lowest numbers of incarceration and reoffending in the world. We need to learn from other countries who are doing better than us. We need transformation policy and it's time we review, review and reform this act. Thank you, Janet. Video link. I'm a Glocklin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I trained some 15 years ago as a primary school teacher in a very deprived part of what is now my constituency. I won't name it because they are rightly tired of their community being characterised by drugs alone. There is, however, a huge drug problem. I was doing a placement with primary sevens, so they would be about 11 years old, just getting to be gallus, but still quite clearly innocent kids. It didn't take long for me to become attached to every single one of them. Some of them were funny, some super smart, some very caring, others artistic or musical. They all had things they were good at, distinct personalities. One day during the lunch break, the wonderful woman who was their teacher told me that every single one of them had a live connection to drugs. I'm changing names here, but she told me, for instance, Connor's brother died of an overdose. Sharon's mum was murdered because she owed a dealer money. Peter's dad is on the run from the police. You can see Nicole's sister on the street most days asking people for money to feed her habit. Every single one of them had a live connection. And the most heartbreaking thing to hear was that she believed that most of them would not be able to avoid that connection in their adult lives, because that's what she'd watched over the previous 20 years. She had taught Nicole's sister, and she said she was every bit as lovable as Nicole at that age. She pointed out to me that if I saw Nicole's sister in the street asking people for money to feed her habit, clearly off her face, I'd possibly feel irritated or even angry with her. And I might even wonder why she didn't just pull herself together. We've all been there. None of us are saints, but we've all judged. But she pointed out to me, I know you're very fond of we, Nicole. And if you saw her doing that, you wouldn't be angry. You'd be terrified for her. And I know, Anne, that you would want to scoop her up and find a way of helping her anybody would. She explained that she had known Nicole's sister now 20 since she was five years old. So when she saw her in the grip of her addiction, she saw that little girl. And now some 15 years after my teaching practice, I'm acutely aware that this group of 11 year olds will be in their mid 20s. And if that teacher is right, many of them will have some connection with drugs. Some will be dead. Some will be addicted. Some will have escaped, but some will be dealing and some will be in jail. I know, and the evidence, as we've heard from so many honourable members today, tells us that a very different legislative approach to drug use would undoubtedly have seen their lives turn out very differently. It's well documented that most addicts are self-medicating to deal with unresolved childhood trauma. And I've just given a number of examples of the trauma some of those children I taught experienced. When trauma is unresolved, it's very common for adults to respond to triggers as their five or seven or 10 or 12 year old selves. So I'd ask everyone listening to think about that and think about what that teacher taught me that day, that we should not abandon a child just because their body takes on an adult form, that rather than turn our backs, rather than lock them up, rather than ostracise them, we should be recognising drug abuse and addiction as an illness, as a public health matter, now a public health emergency. And we should be doing, as that wonderful teacher was sure I would do, was sure anyone would do with any child in trouble, and scooping them up to get them to a place of safety and help them recover from their illness, as we do with every single other illness. We've heard the evidence today, Mr Deputy Speaker, so much evidence that the public health approach works. It's better for drug users, of course, but if I can't convince the government to care about that, then surely the evidence that it's better for, better for our health services, our economy and our justice system will encourage them to think again and make this a public health matter rather than a criminal justice matter. Thank you very much. Alan Dorrance. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and good afternoon. Mr Deputy Speaker, the United Kingdom Government must urgently commit to adopting evidence-based solutions to drug use. This means no longer rejecting evidence-based recommendations and ignoring evidence which shows that the current approach is simply not working. Mr Deputy Speaker, may I briefly provide the House with uh, my personal experience of being a frontline police officer in London and a detective in London during the 1970s and 1980s. At the time, the Misuse of Drugs Act was well established as the government's preferred method of dealing with drug use on the basis that people would not use or be found in possession of controlled drugs for fear of arrest and prosecution. Their solution was to arrest the way out of this problem 
by criminalising every aspect of illegal drug supply and possession. Some of the provisions in the Act were very successful and they introduced specific offences making involvement in the production or supply of drugs punishable with long prison sentences. It is right that those concerned in the supply of drugs continue to face these increased penalties. However, where the government got it wrong at that time was the criminalising of even the smallest amount of controlled drugs and in particular the possession of cannabis. The police prescribed method of dealing with possession of cannabis was the same as for drivers who provided a positive breath test for alcohol. It was a zero tolerance approach with absolutely no discretion. When someone was stopped and searched for whatever reason and cannabis was found, irrespective of the quantity, they were immediately arrested. The suspected drugs were then analysed by a scientist to provide legal proof that the substance was in fact cannabis. The arrested person would be taken to a police station, uh, bailed to return at a later date, where they would be formally charged with the possession of cannabis, their fingerprints and photographs taken and bailed to attend court. Mr Deputy Speaker, that was in the days before the Crown Prosecution Service, where the arresting officer prosecuted every single individual case personally, requiring the arresting officer to attend court. The defendant invariably pleaded guilty and would receive a fine probably no more than £30. This happens in hundreds of cases every week and remained the procedure for many years. All that for a few grams of cannabis for personal use. Mr Speaker, on reflection, what a complete and utter waste of everyone's time, police and court resources and taxpayers' money. It benefited no one, absolutely no one. The enforcement of this legislation for possession of cannabis undoubtedly created serious tensions and distrust amongst the police, community, amongst the police and communities and led to increased racial tension and it continues to do so to this very day, Mr Deputy Speaker. Another serious consequence of this is that tens of thousands of people, disproportionately young black men, already facing barriers to employment, would receive a criminal record and be deprived of the opportunity to improve their life chances by disqualifying them from ever entering certain professions. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, drug misuse must be treated as a public health issue and people who use drugs should be, who use drugs should be helped and not just punished. Advice, support and education should be provided in the same way as it is for other health issues, including alcohol and tobacco. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Misuse of Drugs Act criminalised and failed millions of people, often the most disadvantaged in our society. I call upon the Government to order a review of the law and, to reduce, and introduce an evidence-based drugs policy that is founded on principles of multi-agency public health approach rather than a criminal justice approach. The success of such an approach has been demonstrated by the Scottish Violence Reduction Unit, established in 2005, which has since reduced the number of homicides in Scotland from 137 to 64 last year. That policy and procedure and strategy works, Mr Deputy Speaker. If the Government are not minded to adopt such an approach, then the responsibility for drugs policy must be devolved to the Scottish Parliament in order that we are no longer bound by this discredited legislation and approach. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Very much. Video link. Christine Jardine. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm relieved to be able to speak in this powerful, emotive debate today, but I am also angry, very angry, that half a century on, this country is still somehow clinging to an act that has signally failed in its intention. It has failed more than one generation, and it's time we listen to the voices raised against it, the families appealing for help. I am sure beyond any possible doubt that when the Misuse of Drugs Act was originally debated in this place, it was the genuine belief that it was needed to tackle a problem that had already taken lives, destroyed families, and promoted crime and antisocial behaviour across this country. But can anyone now be in any doubt that the Act and the war on drugs which it epitomises has failed. Oh, if criminal convictions were the measure, you might be able to argue for its success. More than 1.8 million convictions under the Act since 1971. But those convictions are actually also another indication of failure. Failure to change the fact that the illegal drugs trade has been a driving force in crime in this country. And if we look at the real impact, 
in terms of lives, destroyed and lost. It's clear that the belief in the Act was, although well-intentioned, misplaced. If we look just at Scotland, in 1969, with 244 drug deaths, in 2019, that figure was almost 1,300. But those are just numbers, and there are so many more. Heroin misuse has risen 25-fold. The UK drug-related death rate is five times the EU average. Scotland's drug-related death rate is more than 15 times the EU average. It's about so much more than statistics. It's about every life lost and family left desolate by the death of a loved one. Lives stamped out amidst an epidemic that is destroying and has destroyed futures every day for the past 50 years, and yet somehow seems to go unnoticed. My constituency is not immune from the problem. None of our constituencies, indeed none of our communities, no family can be sure it is safe from it. And in response to the Honourable Member, who talked about the role of families, we do know parents who have worked hard to educate their children, spend time with them, talk about drugs, provide for them, create a good, stable family life for them, but that couldn't protect them. Yes, drug problems can be more prevalent in areas of deprivation, we know that, but not exclusively. We are all vulnerable. Recently, a mother in Scotland allowed the BBC to film the funeral of her son who died of an overdose of street Valium. Heartbreak was difficult to watch. His mother wanted his story to serve as a warning to others, to remind politicians of the grief caused by our common failure to tackle successfully the problem of drugs on our streets. She let us witness it. And what makes that failure worse is that there are examples close at hand how it can be tackled. Portugal, for example, as we've heard, had one of the worst problems in Europe. In 1999, one in every 100 people there had a problematic drug addiction. The country's HIV rate was the highest in the EU. Then in 2001, they completely changed tack from criminalisation. Now if someone is caught with a personal supply, they receive a warning, a fine, or are referred to a multidisciplinary team of doctors, lawyers, and social workers. The rates of overdose deaths and drug-related crime plummeted, as did the HIV rate. It's clear what we need to do. Where prohibition has failed for 50 years, control and regulation can work. We need education, social action, health spending on projects designed to help, and I firmly believe we need to look at where the decriminalisation and regulation of drugs, specifically cannabis, has worked. More than 25 countries have decriminalised possession of some or all drugs. Cannabis has already been legalised legalized and regulated for adult non-medical use in Canada, Uruguay and 15 US states. Decriminalisation is supported by the World Health Organisation. To take away the power that control of drugs has given the criminal world, to break the stranglehold of the gangs, we should reform, regulate and license. Offer medical treatment to those found in possession and criminalise them. Recognise that this is a public health and economic problem. We've tried one way for 50 years and it has failed. It has failed families up and down this country. It's time we tried another way, a better way. Your link, Angela Crawley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Misuse of Drugs Act has damaged individuals, families, communities, and it's entrenched social injustice. The war on drugs has been lost. This government has failed. There is nowhere more evident of the problem with criminalisation than here in Scotland when we consider the stark number of drug related deaths. Rather than adopting a public health approach, this government ignores the possibility and has failed on an unprecedented scale. In Scotland, this is a public health emergency and it must be treated as such. This government has an opportunity on the 50th anniversary of this legislation to consider whether this legislation is still fit for purpose. This government wishes to take a hard line on the issue, but that simply isn't working. The introduction of safe consumption facilities to reduce public harm is one solution. But this government has blocked reform at every turn. 
The UK government is entrenching the problem by refusing to amend or replace this outdated legislation. And the Scottish government, who wishes to follow in line with international best practice by decriminalising the use of drugs and introducing safe consumption rooms, is unable to do so. By comparison, Portugal ended the criminalisation of drug use 20 years ago. In this time, drug-related deaths have fallen and have remained below the EU average. The number of drug offenders in prisons has more than halved, and the drug injection-related HIV diagnoses have dramatically fallen. Does the Minister agree we should aim for a similar outcome in the UK? And if he does, when will he take action to make that happen? Mr Deputy Speaker, the UK Government must now allow the Scottish Government to implement a range of public health-focused responses, including the introduction of supervised drug consumption facilities or devolve the power to the Scottish Parliament to do so. We are facing a public health emergency. This act continues to fail too many families and too many have lost loved ones. You can change this. You must change this. If this union is truly strong, then surely it can withstand this. It can take a pragmatic approach and it can act. If this government will not act, then it must devolve the power to Scotland to take that action. Inaction is not a solution. Your compliance, your ignorance is complicity with the problem. Drug related deaths are real. These aren't just figures. These are real people, real families, real communities, and it needs real action. Thank you very much. Video link. Neil Hanvey. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I would like to start off by saying that I'm really encouraged by voices across the UK and across the chamber, indeed from uh, Manchester, Wellington, Rygate, Edinburgh East and West, and the compelling contribution by my colleague in the Alba Party from East Lothian. Um, I would also like to pay tribute to frontline workers in my Kirkcaldy and Cowden Beath constituency, Pauline Buchan, Kelly Rogers and their team at the Kirkcaldy Family Centre and Dave Dempster and his team at ADAPT. They're dealing with this problem head on and I've spoken to them recently and will continue to meet with them uh, as a result of the crisis that exists in Scotland at the moment and I will give them all of my support. But the challenge that they face uh, is a, a frightening number of drug deaths. Uh, 1,264 drug deaths uh, occurred in Scotland in 2019, and behind each number is a person with hopes and dreams. Not one of them dreamt of becoming addicted to drugs or having a criminal record. That has happened in the context of the 1971 Misuse of Drug Act prohibition. It's unacceptable and change is, is essential. Becoming a drug user is not a rational choice. And the idea that was uh, put forward by Nancy Reagan, the ineffective soundbite of just say no to drugs, well, it sounds easy. But that involves often saying, just saying no to poverty, just saying no to abuse, just saying no to neglect and deprivation, just saying no to hopelessness, and just saying no to joblessness, and just saying no to childhood trauma. Just Say No only serves to demonise and stigmatise, criminalising and other, othering the most vulnerable in our society and in our communities. Addict, dopehead, junkie, waster, stoner, user. Just like poverty, this is not an accident. Users are blamed for their substance use and their social circumstances and the failure of scant treatment schemes available to them. Substance misuse is undoubtedly associated with deprivation and unemployment, and users are blamed for the lack of opportunity and shamed for their failure to meet neoliberal notions of a productive citizen. The pejorative strivers versus skivers, as was used by Mr Cameron, really illustrates that sentiment. All the while, the structural causes of substance misuse and inequality are ignored and dismissed, reinforcing that stigma. Demonising and criminalising vulnerable people only serves to misdirect the public from the abject failure of drug and social health policy in this area. I would like to tell you very briefly about a case in my constituency of a person with deep childhood trauma who became involved in drug misuse. They were able to be supported by services in my constituency to, get, to overcome that challenge 
to go to university, to secure a business degree. But every opportunity they tried to secure uh, for a new future was rejected because of their background and the criminal criminality, all related to drugs. And they have since returned to drug use. That is absolutely heartbreaking. Current drug policies are criminalizing people who have already suffered greatly, exacerbating that deep trauma. This act and a continuation of prohibition only serves to, to lock some of the most vulnerable people in a cycle of hopelessness. Release, the National Centre of Expertise in Drugs and Drug Law in the UK, have rightly characterised the Misuse of Drugs Act as 50 years of failure. Tinkering around the edges with drug legislation will simply not do. Dependency is a health issue, but it's not the core problem. It is but a symptom of an equitous social policy and the state's indifference to grinding poverty. The money spent criminalising our most vulnerable would be much better spent and more effective if redirected to public health and social policy initiatives. Devolving every lever required to adopt a public health approach to the Scottish Government is essential, and a failure to do so is a dreadful dereliction of duty. Control over drug policy must urgently be reviewed, and as a minimum, I would suggest devolution of all policy to Scotland is essential to help us save lives. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Stuart MacDonald. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. In, in a sense, it is a real pleasure to take part in this debate, as has been said, principally because it has been a terrific one with some fantastic contributions right across the House. And I commend the honourable members for Manchester, Withington, and for Reigate for securing this debate on an incredibly important topic. And I commend them also for their persistent pursuit of a, a policy-based approach to, to this subject, and the same commendation could be made to lots of honourable members in this chamber, including honourable uh, friends. But there are other ways in which I very much regret having to take part in this debate, and the first is because, like other honourable members have said already, I don't think it should be Home Affairs spokespersons or policing spokespersons that are here today. It should be our health spokesperson, and we should be having this debate absolutely through the prism of public health and not through uh, criminal justice. And secondly, like I think every honourable member in this debate, I wish we didn't have to be here because drugs have been suppressed uh, or eliminated a long time ago. But clearly we are as far away from that being a reality as we ever have been. And that is really the fundamental point about why the members are pushing for reform. There is no sign of significant change under the current regime. And honourable members have illustrated eloquently today in terms of scale and in terms of the impact this is having on individuals, this is a crisis. And yes, absolutely addressing this crisis will require uh, the full range of tools at the disposal of governments to be used, measures to address poverty and inequality, education, prevention, tackling stigma, treatment, harm reduction, recovery, mental health and housing. And yes, of course, law enforcement and criminal justice to every arm of government must be involved. We have and we will continue to debate all the different policy responses, but today the focus is on the Misuse of Drugs Act at 50, the legislation which underpins and, I am afraid, casts a shadow over, over everything else that we do to combat drugs. And I share the analysis of the vast majority of honourable members today that in the 50 years since it was passed, the evolution and sadly growth of the drugs trade has been extraordinary, as is our understanding of it. Uh, but our legislation has failed tragically to move on in response. And indeed, many would argue it was the wrong response at the outset, as the Honourable Member for it Raigi eloquently said. I'll take a short intervention. Thank you for giving way. If uh, the central analysis today is that the, uh, it's, the, it's the legislation that, that is the cause of, of, of the problem, and the legislation is exactly the same in Scotland as it is in England, how does that account for the fact that the problem on some metrics in Scotland is more than twice as bad? Well, two things. Yes, the, the metrics in Scotland are very bad. The metrics for the whole of the United Kingdom are terribly bad, but I don't think it, it, on some, some metrics, I'm not sure which particular ones he's referring to, but that is not the point. And it's also with respect, I don't think, the point about what is the cause. You can, you can see that in some ways this has caused all sorts of harm, but the, the fundamental, what is beyond dispute is it's failed to fix the problem. And what we are all calling for is to have an evidence-based debate on can we do better? Are there different legislative approaches which can do better? I can't really see how honourable members opposite can say this is as good as it gets. Yes, there are other things that both governments are doing, all governments are doing, but if this is as good as it gets, then I think we're a hopeless bunch, and I think we should be trying to provide some hope to our constituents, and that's what we're trying to do today. So I don't think this really should be a debate about whether reform is needed. Rather, it should be an evidence-based 
uh, debate about the nature of that reform and how far we go. And I think even honourable members on the other side think there are changes that can be made. Some of us would want to go much further, and I will come to that right now. Um, I think there is an abundance of evidence, not just about the need for reform, but about what sort of reforms work. You know, evidence comes from health and medical experts, law enforcement, as we have heard, those working on the front line with, those, uh, with addiction, to those who have experienced addictions uh, directly. And international best practice really can be a guide as well. And that is why report after report, including reports from cross-party committees of, of this House, have all called for reform. I just want to focus on three brief recommendations that, that both the Health Committee and the Scottish Affairs Committee have, have flagged up. First of all, as I have already said, so I do not need to expand any more, um, this should be a, a policy area that is led by the Health Department and not the Home Office. It, it should not be the Home Office in charge. But secondly, both of those committees have, have said, at the very least, we need to pilot and look at uh, the use of overdose prevention facilities or drug consumption rooms. And We have heard from numerous honourable members about how these have been shown to save lives and reduce harm. They assist in ensuring that those who most need it can access support and treatment and they protect the public from antisocial and dangerous public injection. And both those cross-party committees have also said there should at least be consultation about decriminalisation of possession. On these benches, we believe that there already is enough evidence. Um, and we acknowledge that international evidence shows that that leads to less problematic drug use and less harm as a result and less waste of police and justice resources. But let's at least look at it and review it. Now, I absolutely appreciate the government isn't going to rip up the, the Misuse of Drugs Act and start again. It's not going to make that announcement uh, today. But knowing that the government isn't willing to do that and knowing that it is conservative and cautious about the possibility of reform, it surely to goodness must at least trial and research some of these possible new approaches. If it doesn't want to do that, devolve powers so that we can try to Scotland, yes, but to other parts the UK who are also willing to pilot a new approach. And as has been said, we will all benefit from what we learn as a result, whether it's success, whether it's failure. Let us try. And instead of being scared of public opinion, test it. Put it to our citizens' assembly. Build consensus. I believe that the more folk understand about this issue, the more they see the need for reform. If nothing else, people see that it's their brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, sons and daughters that the government is criminalising rather than helping. Finally, in responding, just one or two nuts and bolts questions that I'd, I'd be keen to, to have the Minister's response to. Uh, first of all, as has already been asked, uh, will they respond positively to the request for a Four Nations Drugs meeting? Uh, and it could include, hopefully, discussion of the issue of drugs overdose prevention facilities. Can you update the House on uh, the issue of pill press regulation? What is his, his latest position on naloxone and widening distribution? And will he look at drug checking facilities and allowing that approach to be trialled as well? Madam Deputy Speaker, let's work constructively. Follow the evidence and leave no option unexplored as we seek to tackle this crisis. And that should include the possibility of radical reform of drugs legislation. Thank you. Shadow Minister Conham again. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's always a pleasure to follow the SNP spokesperson. Before I begin, Madam Deputy Speaker, in the last hour, the Manchester bombing inquiry has published its first report. And while the findings, no doubt, will be debated, I think it's right and appropriate that we send our sympathy and our thoughts today from this House to the families yes. uh, and those who are bereaved and indeed to the city of uh, Manchester. And it's fitting that my honourable friend, uh, who is such a tenacious campaigner on the issues we have discussed today, uh, secured uh, this debate along with the honourable gentleman from Reigate. And I congratulate them and indeed all members who have spoken in the debate this afternoon. I think it's been thought-provoking and, uh, and, and impassioned, and I think the perspectives that we've had from uh, those who've worked in the NHS or in the police, as well as colleagues with a long-standing interest in this area, has been hugely beneficial. We know that the issue of drugs, the wider causes and effects, are a huge issue for our country. We know the restless grip of drug abuse and substance addiction has a shattering and pervasive impact on people right across this country in every community. It causes not only desperation for individuals and families alike, but of course the very fabric of our communities and indeed wider society. We know the harms resulting from illegal drug use and the tragedy of drug-related deaths in this country has been on a disturbing trajectory, I think it's right to say, for some time ago, as has been mentioned. Already in 2019, there were nearly 4,500 drug-related deaths in England and Wales alone, the highest level, Madam Deputy Speaker, since records began. 
and it represents a shocking 52% increase over the last decade. The total cost to society of illegal drugs, including drug-related crime and social harm, is estimated to cost £20 billion. And the UK has one of the highest drug-related death rates in Europe. It's clear that we, as a country then, are not where we would want to, or indeed should be. And while this is an admittedly profoundly complex area, I'm afraid I'm duty-bound and obliged to say that the government's current strategy is failing badly. Whether that is taken on the key metrics of reducing harm to those vulnerable to drug addiction and to those exploited within the drug trade, of providing adequate education and awareness of the associated dangers, or of backing our police with the tools needed to tackle the serious violence and crime that proliferates uh, from drugs, the government has fallen short. They have failed to get a grip on the use, prevention and treatment of harmful Class A narcotics, the use of which was on a downward trend between 2009 and 2013, but since has continued upwards. I mean, even the Minister's own department admitted they were too slow to notice the rising levels of harmful substances like crack cocaine back in 2014, and the truth is they have been playing catch-up since, because despite drug use and violence rising, we have had debilitating cuts, including the underfunding of local government budgets, national services, and of course systemic police budget cuts. And frankly, that has eroded the foundations on which any credible, comprehensive treatment or prevention strategy needs to thrive. Our young people are being let down as well. We know more of them are being groomed into violence that is fuelled by drugs. It was in a leaked research document, again, the Minister's own department authored. Yet, Government has continued to gut young people's services, spending cut by 73 per cent, closing 900 youth centres and 4,500 youth worker jobs being cut. I mean, how can the Minister justify that? So the Government is nowhere near to matching the scale of the action needed. Our focus has to be on protecting the public, and that means reducing harm, harm to users, harms to community, and similarly tackling the insidious crime that underpins it. We recognise a wide and comprehensive response is needed to reflect the diverse, complex arenas over which the issue surrounding drug use and supply intersect, but it means effective prevention and early intervention measures, properly resourced education programmes, decent housing, as well as tackling potent social drivers of drugs abuse, such as poverty. It also means building and supporting substantive health services for vulnerable people, basing those on dignity, respect and clinical need. We also need a strong and robust enforcement policy, and it has to be critical to the approach that we take. We need to do more to disrupt and cut off the wider factors of drugs and serious and organised crime to prevent that exploitation, grooming and criminalisation, especially with regard to young people and the scourge of county lines. Now, the scale of that challenge is grave, and I don't underestimate it, to be fair to the Minister. There are approximately 600 county gangs operating in the UK. The Children's Commissioner estimates 27,000 young people in this country identify as gang members. I mean, that is an absolutely shocking and appalling figures. Murders where the victims are aged 16 to 24 are growing, and the figure has almost doubled in the last five years. Now, if we are serious about tackling this, we need to ensure the police and their partners are given the tools they need to carry out their work and have the services required to support it. We know that deep cuts have inevitably affected the police's priorities and overall operational capacity to tackle this, but despite that, the work that is being done has yielded impressive results. And I want to pay tribute to the National Police Chief's Council Lead for County Lines, Deputy Commissioner Graham McNulty and Director General Lynn Owens of the NCA, whose teams across the country have pursued a relentless campaign against these criminals, often putting themselves 
in harm's way. Just a few weeks ago, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, we saw a coordinated crackdown on county lines leading to over 1,000 arrests, as well as nearly 300 weapons and hundreds of kilograms of illicit substances seized from criminals. 80 drug dealing lines, vital to the operation of the network, were identified. That is great work. That is great work. And we need to boost those efforts and ensure officers can be free to get on with their job effectively. The police are not the problem. The criminals are the problem, and I would urge all colleagues right across the House to remember that in any of the discussions that we have. So, to conclude, it's been a constructive debate. I think it's right that we continue to monitor the drivers and effects of drug use on our country and consider evidence-based uh, solutions. It's clear to me we need a fuller, more holistic, and comprehensive approach to a complex issue, but one that I think is urgent, as we've heard today because of the effect that it is having on our communities. The challenge is great, and I will work where I can with the government to support anything we can do to address it. Only then can we ensure that people are protected and reduce the devastating harm that comes from drug use and the trap of addiction. Minister Kit Malthouse. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, I am grateful to you. Um, I would like to thank the Honourable Gentleman uh, from Manchester and indeed uh, my honourable friend from Reigate for calling this important debate and indeed for members across the House for their um, commitment and indeed passion in what I think is, uh, my opposite number has rightly pointed out, has been an interesting and thought-provoking uh, debate. There are obviously a wide range of views um, on the best way to tackle drugs and the harms they cause and I remain open to listening to them. Uh, to ensure that our approach is both balanced and evidence-based. Uh, and I do recognise the importance uh, of a balanced approach, with both tough enforcement against the right people in the right way, alongside treatment and recovery support for those dependent on drugs. On the issue of drug controls, I do think it's important that we come at this from the perspective of what keeps the public safe, while enabling healthcare and legitimate business and research to flourish. Controls on harmful drugs continue to be adjusted in the light of new evidence and information, including, for example, the changes over recent years to allow specialist clinicians to prescribe, where appropriate, uh, cannabis-based products for medicinal use. Uh, but please, Madam Deputy Speaker, make no mistake, drug misuse has a profound and tragic consequence that has felt rice across society, and that can occur even in the official and regulated sector, as we've seen, sadly, in the United States uh, with the opioid crisis. It devastates lives, communities and neighbourhoods with the most deprived areas facing the highest prevalence of drug-driven crime and health harms. The Government recognises that this is a problem that demands a whole system cross-government approach, and that is exa exactly what we are now pursuing. The Home Office is working extremely closely with partners, including law enforcement, the Department for Health and Social Care, Public Health England and others right across government. Our activity in this area of policy is necessarily broad, but there are two key elements of the strategy uh, that I'd like to emphasise. First, the use of targeted enforcement to restrict supply, and secondly, our focus on providing truly effective treatment and recovery services. This approach responds to the evolving threats and challenges that continue to emerge from drug misuse. This includes uh, changing drugs markets, changing patterns of use, and an ageing and more complex group of people who need wide-ranging support to recover. I'm grateful to, to the Minister for giving way. And just on that s specific point, is he willing to commit to work with police and crime commissioners to try to ensure that in all force areas there's a commitment to ensure a treatment-first approach to offenders with a history of substance misuse. Minister. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I don't have to commit because that is exactly what we're already doing um, in five parts of the country. As uh, the Honourable Gentleman may know, we have, uh, I instituted a series of uh, projects going by the acronym ADA uh, in five areas of the country to build a new modus operandi around drugs, building, uh, bringing police uh, and crime commissioners and enforcement alongside health, local authority, housing and other therapeutic providers to see if we can shift those numbers in Blackpool, Hastings, Middlesbrough, Norwich and Swansea Bay. Um, and if we are to refine and improve our response, Madam Deputy Speaker, we must have a comprehensive picture of what's happening on the ground. 
and that is why part one of Dame Carol Black's review of drugs, which a number of members mentioned, the findings of which were published in February last year, was such a valuable and insightful contribution to our understanding of this problem. That report underlined the impact of the so-called county lines criminal business model, where illegal drugs are transported from urban areas to be sold in smaller towns and villages. This is one of the most disturbing and pernicious forms of criminality to emerge in our country in recent years. As the Honourable Gentleman mentioned, uh, we're making significant progress, which I'm going to talk about shortly. In July uh, last year, the Department of Health and Social Care commissioned part two of Dame Carol Black's review on drugs, focusing on prevention, treatment and recovery. This will build, it will build on Dame Carol's work to ensure vulnerable people with substance misuse problems get the support they need to recover and turn their lives around. It's going to look at treatment in the community and in prison and how treatment services work with wider services that enable a person with drug dependency to achieve and sustain recovery, including mental health, housing, employment and the criminal justice system. In 2019, the government appointed Dr Ed Day as the government's recovery champion to provide national leadership around key aspects of the drug recovery agenda and advise the government on where improvements can be made. His first annual report was published in January. When I've spoken to Dr Day, he talks passionately about the importance of recovery and the work he's doing with a huge number of fantastic advocates in the sector, including people with lived experience of drug misuse who are celebrating being in recovery. It is very motivating to hear their stories and the extent to which recovery can provide hope and help people to turn their lives around. We also continue to work closely with the devolved administrations in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland to ensure drug misuse is tackled as a UK-wide problem. Following the UK Drug Summit, which I called in Glasgow in February last year, in September, the Minister for Public Health and I jointly hosted a meeting bringing together academics, experts and government ministers from across the home nations of the UK to discuss topics such as drug-related deaths, treatment and recovery services and the impact of the pandemic on illegal drug taking. The government remains committed to tackling the harms uh, caused by drug misuse on a cross-UK basis, and I will happily, I'm happy to confirm, be holding another such meeting uh, uh, in the autumn uh, for all the home nations to discuss these matters further. But, yes, by all means. I'm grateful to the Minister giving way um, and um, welcome the fact that he's talking about the impact of harm. What's his assessment of a harm reduction model and particularly that deployed in Portugal? Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm just coming on to what we're doing about uh, harm reduction. Um, and I, as I said right in my opening remarks, I do think that should be at the forefront of our mind. Where we may differ, uh, or where, um, I guess, uh, opinions may differ across the House, is about the balance uh, between uh, enforcement and treatment and recovery um, in the mix of dealing with this very pernicious social problem. Uh, my view is that they do have to be balanced, and I'm not sure necessarily that the experience that we've seen around the world, um, uh, for example, of decriminalisation, is leading quite or giving us quite the silver bullet uh, that members have mentioned, but I'm going to come on to that in a minute. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, in January this year, we did announce £148 million of new investment to cut crime and protect people from harms associated with illegal drugs in this area, £80 million for drug treatment services, uh, the biggest rise in funding for 15 years, £28 million invested in the added projects um, uh, that I've already outlined across the UK, building a new uh, modus operandi, if you like, for tackling drugs, creating a foundation from which I hope we will expand, and £40 million to tackle drug supply in county lines, surging our activity, which the Honourable Mention illustrated, against these awful groups, focusing on them in particular as a business, as much as a, a group of criminals, uh, where we're seeing significant success. And while there has been some um, uh, opinion uh, during this debate that enforcement doesn't work. I would point out that our new approach, the new tactics uh, that we've agreed with the police are resulting in some significant results. So Norfolk, for example, uh, 16 months ago, over 100 county lines, now down to under 20. Bangor in North Wales declared county lines free, along with Swale uh, and uh, Tunbridge. Kent, I think, now halved the number of county lines uh, tra uh, moving drugs into that particular part of the world. So there's lots that we have done. Over 780 lines closed, 5,100 arrests, 2.9 million pounds in cash seized, uh, 1,200, importantly, 1,200 vulnerable young people uh, safeguarded. Uh, this funding demonstrates our, our commitment in this area and the effect that we can have uh, when we focus. Now, finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, I wanted to move, if I may, uh, crave your indulgence, to uh, deal with one or two of the particular issues that have been 
uh, raised. Uh, the member for Reigate um, and I have been in ongoing correspondence and conversation about the impact on research um, of the legislation and uh, uh, the business that may come from it. Um, uh, he raised it during his speech. As he will know, particularly on psilocybin, there are already um, uh, clinical trials underway into the use of that particular compound, um, and I'm hopeful that they will uh, produce positive results. If they do, as we have done in the past, if there is a proven clinical and medical use, uh, then obviously we'll have to adapt to that uh, as we go. And I have commissioned the uh, ACMD to look more widely at barriers uh, placed in the way of clinical research uh, in all sorts of areas of narcotic uh, and other drugs uh, to, to make sure that we're getting the balance right to enable that legitimate form of research and the health benefits that may come uh, to be pursued. Uh, the member for Don Valley, in a very uh, thoughtful speech, I thought, raised the issue of cannabis, uh, and I would point him in particular, there's been quite a lot of calls for legalisation of cannabis to the Canadian experience, where he quite rightly identified, rather than legalisation uh, producing a, a reduction, um, if you like, or an elimination of the illegal uh, uh, sector, in fact, that business, like any other business, has adapted to competition, uh, producing a stronger product more cheaply, uh, provided more conveniently, and still exists. Uh, in Canada. Now, their experience uh, will be monitoring it closely, obviously, and other areas where it's legalised. Um, but as uh, was pointed out during the debate, uh, uh, the, where in Amsterdam, where consumption has been liberal, shall we say, for some time, um, I'm not convinced that criminal gangs aren't still uh, pursuing their trade. Um, uh, finally, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, we've had a strong showing uh, from the various factions of Scottish nationalism. Um, uh, this afternoon uh, during the debate, uh, which is no surprise given the truly appalling uh, numbers of drugs deaths that Scotland has seen over the last few years. And I'm not a man, um, I've just been moved to anger uh, very often, but I did find my blood boiling at being accused of intransigence, dereliction of duty, ignorance, uh, when I literally went to Scotland 18 months ago to beg the Scottish Government uh, to do something about this issue and spend more money on health. The whole point when I came into this job of immediately starting to convene a Four Nations uh, Drug Summit was to focus on the real tragedy, the scandal, the emergency that there was in Scotland. And when the member for Glasgow says she imagines the number of people that might have been saved um, if the UK government's actions had been different, I'm amazed that she has the goal, given the numbers that could have been saved, if the SNP hadn't sat on its hands for 10 years while the numbers mounted and only a looming election saw them step up to their responsibility. So please look to your own, the log in your own eyes, before you look to those uh, in others. Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, the member for Crewe and Natwich, who has a unique um, uh, experience and perspective on this, as both a former police officer and um, a doctor, um, showed us all the truth of this very complex situation, which is that there is no silver bullet. Uh, this is a complex area where government has a duty to listen, to look at the evidence, to consider what can be done both on enforcement and on public health to make sure that we uh, try to minimise, reduce, remove this most pernicious of social evils uh, from the areas of our society that are benighted by it. Jeff Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I thank the Minister for his response? I'm pleased that he is open to listening on this issue. Uh, and my good friend from St Helens North and the SNP spokesperson for their uh, contributions. Although I agree with the SNP spokesperson that it's regrettable that it was those three individuals rather than health uh, representatives uh, that should be responding to the debate on drug policy. Um, we, we await the second report of the Carol Black Review, uh, and the first report sets out very significant problems very well. Um, but the, the government were very clear that she was not able, in, in the remit that she was given, that she's not able to look at. Uh, legislative change, and I think that's regrettable, um, because I mean I agree with the minister. Actually, there is no silver bullet. This is a complex issue, and all I've been saying, really, and all that most people are saying, is let, let's look at the evidence, let's review this act, let's see if it's still fit for purpose. And I personally don't think that uh, is too much to ask. This is this is the first time we've had a, a debate on drug policy in this chamber since 2017, uh, which I think is a shame because it is an issue in many, probably most of our constituencies. So we need to look at. We need, we need to really, as, as politicians, address this issue thoughtfully and uh, with, with careful consideration um, to find the right way forward. And I, I hope it's not another four years before we discuss this issue, this issue 
uh, and look at the best way forward, looking at the evidence of how we reduce harm to our community. So finally, can I just thank all the speakers that have taken part in the debate today and again the Backbench Business Committee for allowing the time. Thank you. Thank you. The question is, as on the order papers, may that opinion say aye? Aye. Of the contrary, no, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Um, I will now suspend the House for three minutes in order to allow arrangements to be made for the next item of business. Order! Order. We now come to the general debate on the UK's Preventing Sexual Violence in Conflict Initiative and the G7. Anthony Mangnall. Yeah, yeah. 
Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I start by thanking the Backbench Committee for providing me with the opportunity to raise the Preventing Sexual Violence in Conflict Initiative, otherwise known as PSVI and G7, on the floor of the House today. I promise that I will stop pestering them for at least a couple of days. I stand before the House as the chair of the all-party parliamentary group on PSVI, and I'm delighted to see some of the members of that APPG, and indeed the chair of the Development Committee and the member for Rotherham, who has been a stalwart supporter of this initiative. And her being here today is a reflection of the importance of the Development Committee being maintained, sustained, and continuing to scrutinise our aid and development programmes around the world. I have been fortunate, Madam Deputy Speaker, having worked with the founding members of PSVI, the Baroness Hellich, Lord Haig and Chloe Dalton, and I have seen the evolution and success of that initiative over the last nine years. So I feel that I am quite well placed to be able to debate why it is important and why it cannot be allowed to fail. Conflicts, both old and new, are often viewed by the loss of life on the battlefield. The death and casualty list, the land conquered, the treasuries plundered, the armies and arms deployed. But in reality, conflict is also about those on the sidelines, the innocent bystanders, the, w the women, the children, those who bear the brunt of the conflict but receive little attention, recognition, support or indeed justice. And it is my hope in the course of this debate that I can remind the House and the Government about the purposes and the objectives of PSVI and reignite our global le leadership on this issue. Because now, more than ever, I believe that we not only have the moral duty to act, but an international landscape that is calling for action. After all, in a digitalised world, we are now greeted daily with recordings, news articles and accounts of systematic conflict-related sexual violence. Far from the issue diminishing, it is becoming more acute. And yet the objectives of PSVI have always been clear. To end the culture of impunity for perpetrators, to provide support for survivors, and to document crimes of sexual violence in conflict. These aims stood prominently at the initiative's inception, and today they hold true. In 2012, the collaboration between a Bosnian refugee, a Yorkshireman, and a Hollywood film star resulted not only in the UK government-led initiative, but a seismic collective collaboration from the international community to address this issue. Speaking in the Foreign Office, the then Foreign Secretary Lord Haig spoke of the need for a UK team of experts devoted to combating and preventing sexual violence in armed conflict. This short-noticed overseas deployment team was directed towards gathering evidence and testimony in the hope of supporting investigations and prosecutions. It used the expertise of doctors, lawyers, police, psychologists and forensic specialists. That team of experts were drawn down so as to be able to help protect victims, as well as supporting international organisations, leading training operations, developing laws and capabilities, all with a view to shattering that culture of impunity ending rape as a weapon of war, bringing perpetrators to justice and raising awareness. And in those early years, up to 2015, the UK deployed its team of experts no less than 65 times to countries including Kosovo, Bosnia, Turkey, Mali and Kenya. These operations proved useful in gaining insight and experience and revealed the systematic use of rape, rape and sexual violence in conflict areas across the world. These, these missions demonstrated not just that we were right to create such an initiative, but that there was a genuine need and requirement for action. So in 2014, the UK hosted the first ever global summit to end sexual violence in conflict, attracting 1,700 1, delegates from across the world, bringing together survivors, experts, governments, all with the aim of addressing rape as a weapon of war. And there are, I believe, plans for a further conference in due course, to which I hope the Minister might be able to uh, explain and reveal. Under UK leadership, we also brought together 156 countries at the UN to denounce the, uses of, the use of rape as a weapon of war through the UN Declaration of Commitment to End Sexual Violence in Conflict. The early success of this initiative was readily apparent. The teams of experts were being deployed. The UK political leadership was ever-present. The international community was full square behind the resolutions of the day and was supporting PSVI through their own domestic and international training programmes. The action was tangible. The results were measurable. 
and the optimism was infectious. Unfortunately, Madam Deputy Speaker, as is so often the case, a change of ministers and governments saw PSVI push down the agenda. The high funding levels of 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016 were steadily reduced. The PSVI team was amalgamated into different sections of the now FCDO, as opposed to remaining as a standalone body. The levels of deployment were scaled back. From 2016 to 2020, they were almost reduced by 50%, despite the number of conflict, conflicts and the documentation of sexual violence increasing over that period. Today, the international community is no more at peace than it was nine years ago, so the need to fulfil our obligations of P to PSVI is essential. In e yes. I'm grateful to my honourable friend for giving way. Clearly, we've had a change of administration in the United States uh, recently. What assessment does he make of that change of administration? Does he see any uh, greater willingness from, for example, the Biden administration to help his cause? I thank the Honourable Member for Grantham and Stamford for that excellent intervention, because we now have a president who has previous form in addressing gender-based violence, preventing sexual violence in conflict. America resurging and talking about multilateralism should be the hook in which we can hang our coat on to ensure that initiatives like this are able to flourish over the coming years. As I was saying, in Ethiopia, there is widespread sexual violence ongoing against the people of Tigray. And I asked the minister on Monday whether or not we would be deploying our PSVI team of experts to that area, and I hope he might be able to answer in his remarks. In Bangladesh, the Rohingyas are gathered in refugee camps detailing the appalling acts of sexual violence conducted against them in Myanmar. In Nigeria, the terrorist orga organization of Boko Haram kidnaps girls and forces them into marriage as well as subjecting them to acts of sexual violence. In Iraq, we're only just beginning to learn about the true extent of sexual violence committed by ISIS. The UN last year predicted that there would be 31 million more cases of sexual violence in conflict during the pandemic alone, and 2 million more cases of female genital mutilation. This is a crisis that has been, going on, has been ongoing and must be addressed. The list goes on and on, and yet the one common theme that uh, is thread amongst all of these instances is that the perpetrators of these crimes will in all likelihood escape justice. Tackling rape in war, providing justice, supporting survivors are integral to peace negotiations, to conflict resolution and to helping communities and countries recover and rebuild after conflicts. Madam Deputy Speaker, the success of the weekend past shows that the government can convene global leaders, reach international agreements and strike new trade deals, all of which I happen to consider to be part of global Britain's agenda. The pandemic, though, has reasserted the need for the international community to work together, not just in defeating COVID, but in addressing the major global challenges that humanity faces. From climate change to girls' education to tackling conflict-related sexual violence, the only resolution to these issues will arrive through international agreement and cooperation and designated leadership and action. Now, the UK has shown that leadership in previous years and can do so again. It was particularly welcome at the summit and in our own communique that we committed to consider how best to strengthen international architecture around conflict-related sexual violence. However, I might go further and ask if the government would consider to adopt the suggestion of the G7's own Gender Equality Advisory Council, which called for an international convention to eliminate the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war, with clear consequences for perpetrators and governments that fail to act. Given our own G7 communique calling for the strengthening of international architecture around conflict-related sexual violence, I have the following, I hope, helpful suggestions. First, a new international body should be created within the international community to collect and preserve evidence of conflict-related sexual violence and help bring perpetrators to justice. Providing support for survivors and delivering justice are necessities that cannot be overlooked. After all, it is not just the absence of conflict that denotes peace, but the presence of justice. Second, responsibility for PSVI must be restored to the Foreign Secretary. And at this point, I would like to apologise to Lord Ahmed because I'm trying to take a job away for him. But he has done a sterling job in promoting the Murad Code and Faith Leadership Declaration. But 
top-level leadership is needed on this issue. It must not be viewed as a supplementary matter, but an integral part of the government's agenda, and that is where it must be firmly placed. Third, PSVI must be run with a long-term funding cycle and strategy. The yo-yoing of budgets, as highlighted by the Independ Independent Commission on Aid Impact, restricts the initiative's ability to address deep-rooted issues. Instead, we should seek to create a long-term 10-year plan that regularly reports to Parliament on the progress made and the strategy implemented. Fourth, the PSVI team should be institutionally ring-fenced within the SCDO. Such a team or unit should be able to stand the test of time and the changing of ministers. In ring-fencing PSVI, we can build real institutional knowledge that is, a, that is to the benefit of us at home, but those abroad as well. Madam Deputy Speaker, the G7 has reminded us all that multilateralism is once again in the, in, in the ascendancy. We should seize that opportunity, create new bodies, lead successful initiatives. And the Prime Minister has rightly and admirably focused on the promotion of girls' education. I wholeheartedly support him in that mission. But the success of one should not mean the failure in another. If we are to address education for girls, we will have to tackle gender-based violence. So I respectfully ask, as I reach my concluding remarks, for the Minister to consider the following points. Will he work with members across this House and the other place to help create a new international body? Will he help to ring-fence spending and create that long-term strategy for the PSVI team? Does he agree that PSVI must be led by a Cabinet Minister, preferably the Foreign Secretary? When will the PSVI team be deployed to Ethiopia, as mentioned by Lord Ahmed on the 24th of May? Does he agree that the UK government uh, does he agree with the uh, G7 Gender Equality Advisory Council recommendations? And when will the PSVI Global Conference be held? I recognise that a election and a uh, global pandemic has got in the way of it, but we are eagerly awaiting the opportunity to be able to hold a second conference and to reignite that leadership. Madam Deputy Speaker, in Christina Lamb's book, Our Bodies, Their Battlefields, which should be compulsory reading for any member that is interested on this subject, she details the different communities around the world that have been victims of sexual violence in conflict. And she makes many, many powerful points, but perhaps the most powerful to me is the words, are the words that rape is the cheapest weapon known to man. It has become a tool of government forces, militias, terrorists, criminals. It costs nothing to the perpetrator and everything to the victim. It is the weapon that brings incomprehensible harm and damage to victims. It destroys communities and societies, and it is more often than not responsible for sowing the seeds of future conflicts. As I said at the start of my remarks, I'm only highlighting the commitment that we made in 2012 and asking the government to step forward to reignite its global leadership on this issue. Failure to act now not only lets down our allies and flies in the face of what we have already achieved, but can also result in the blocking of other countries taking meaningful action. Now, if the UK does lack the willpower or the ambition or the vision to renew its efforts in this area, then we must be prepared to take steps to hand this initiative over to willing partners such as America, Canada or Germany. For the sake of the government and for my own sake, I hope today that they will reassert their intentions to provide that global leadership, because the point of today's debate has been in the spirit to which we are being constructive and positive and reflecting on the very positive work that has been done to date. I look forward to hearing the words of other members who have far greater experience in this area than I do. But we have the opportunity, we have the international community waiting for us to take that step. And I thank the House for its time in hearing me. Thank you. We, the, the question is, as on the order paper, will we, we will begin with a time limit of seven minutes, but I envisage that that will later reduce to six or five, but with seven minutes, Sarah Champion. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It is always a pleasure to serve under your chairship. And, and can I just say what a huge pleasure it is to serve in the wake of the Honourable Member for Totnes, who is such a 
force when it comes to making the argument for why we should be investing in preventing sexual violence in conflict. Um, the work that he and his colleagues that he details have done over the years is truly admirable. And, and I am very proud that our government did this. I am very concerned that it is starting to drip away. And so I share his request to the minister to, to champion this moment and, uh, and make very clear that the UK is going to continue with its programme of PSVI. Um, the Honourable Member speaks about uh, the work that started in 2012. I want to bring this slightly more up to date because it, 2020 was set to be a historic year for women's rights, uh, marking the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration, which is the most progressive blueprint, a blueprint for advancing women's rights, and also the 20th anniversary for the UN Security Resolution uh, 1325 on women, peace and security. Um, but here we are, halfway through 2021, and the pandemic has pulled girls out of school, increased in, uh, unequal pay, uh, exposed women and girls to more abuse, and halted employment of women and girls, uh, often overnight and without any safety nets to fall upon. Progress on women's rights and gender equality across the globe is unfortunately in retreat. The International Development Committee's report on the secondary impacts of COVID-19 highlight the stark increase in violence against women and girls, noticing that the pandemic could result in an additional 2 million cases of female genital mutilation and an additional 13 million child marriages by 2030. This surge environment in violence is horrifying, but COVID-19 has unfortunately just exposed and indeed reinforced deep structural inequalities. When we think about um, PSVI, uh, one of the things that always comes to my mind is um, if someone was shot in the leg, we immediately identify that as a war crime, whereas raping someone is almost seen as a side effect and inconsequential because of it. Whereas, as the Honourable Member for Totnes has clearly outlined, it needs to be seen as rape is being used as a weapon of war and the devastating impact that it has as a consequence, which I'll go into in my speech. The anniversary uh, to uh, the situation in Tigray region of Ethiopia serves as a horrific reminder of sexual violence in conflict. Women have been raped by soldiers in camps for displaced people, while others were abducted from their homes in rural areas and held for days as soldiers repeatedly abused them. But this is not unique to Ethiopia. Sexual violence in conflict is pervasive, and despite being punishable by international human rights and humanitarian laws, the cases um, highlighted by the Honourable Member from Totnes, or as we see in Ethiopia, could have been in Afghanistan, in Yemen, in Somalia, and in Myanmar right now. Where there is conflict, it's very sad to say, sexual violence is very likely to follow. Women and girls, and indeed men and boys, are subjected to these horrifying acts, and it leaves lasting trauma and really intense long-term physical and mental health conditions as a consequence. The impact ricochets across communities, pushing peace further and further out of reach. My committee's report on the humanitarian situation in Tigray highlights this issue and calls for support services to be restored and expanded to meet present and future needs without further delay. These services are vital. On Monday, the Minister estimated up to 26,000 people could be in need of support in Ethiopia in the coming months. Astonishingly, though, the Minister could not say whether the PSVI team would be deployed, and I hope the Government and indeed the Minister can clarify this point today. The UK must act to set out how they intend to ensure services are there for those who need them in conflict zones the world over. This is especially important as vital programmes addressing violence against women and girls, of which sexual violence in conflict is of course a part, are currently being cut. Turning to the Preventing Sexual Violence in Conflict initiative, I praise the Government for initially showing real leadership on this. Women's rights organisations welcomed it as crucial to the global debate around peace, conflict and women's rights. But profile raising alone is not enough unless it is followed by positive impact on the ground. An investigation by the Independent Commission for Aid Impact, ICAI, on how the UK followed up on its PSVI summit commitments concluded, I quote, unsatisfactory achievements in most areas with some positive elements. The close association between PSVI and the then Secretary of State ultimately appears to have been detrimental 
to the programme's long-term success, and we can't let that happen. ICAI's report also highlights that the intervention suffered due to short one-year timeframes, a lack of investment in technical expertise, the lack of any overarching theory of change, and a failure for women's centres, for a women-centred and girls' voices to be part of a, of a survivor-centred approach, all led to a weakening of the programme. And this final point is key. It's one of my committee's key uh, recommendations. We won't make meaningful inroads into preventing sexual violence and abuse if we fail to take a survivor-led approach. Survivors' voices and the involvement of women's rights organisations can no longer be an afterthought or an add-on. This input must be built in from the, through consultation, through to design, through delivery, implementation and evaluation. We are at a crossroads in preventing violence against women and girls, including sexual violence and conflict. The G7 delivered on the rhetoric, but we need more than this, especially given the cuts to the AIDS budget. Ahead of the UK PSVI conference, the UK has a unique opportunity to scale up quality work on prevention, protection, responses in conflict-affected states, and ensure survivors are at the very heart of this work. I really hope that's exactly what will happen. Thank you. We now go by video link to Fiona Bruce. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I want to touch today on two concerns. Firstly, uh, on reports of the widespread sexual violence as a, a weapon of war by armed groups in Tigray, uh, something which has already been referred to uh, by the Honourable Member for Rotherham in her uh, excellent speech, uh, which I'm pleased to follow. But secondly, also the separate, but by no means disconnected issue of the importance of promoting the fundamental human right of freedom of religion or belief or FORB, and of the importance of preventing the abuse of FORB to help in turn to prevent atrocities like sexual abuse happening in the first place. Atrocities sadly occurring as we've heard in many parts of the world today. Societies which respect for the more likely to be stable, secure places in which to live and flourish. But sadly, where this respect is absent, a lack of respect for the right of another person to hold their faith or core beliefs and disrespect for uh, their culture or ethnicity are all too often the root causes of conflict. And it, even at times are used to justify atrocities such as sexual violence in conflict. And reports of the experiences of women in Tigray bear this out there. One Tigrayan woman was told by her rapists, our problem with, is with your womb. Your womb gives birth to Woyan. That's a derogatory term. A Tigrayan woman should never give birth. Hundreds of women have reported horrific accounts of rape and gang rape since the start of the conflict in Tigray nearly six months ago. Medics report of removing nails, rocks and pieces of plastic from inside the bodies of rape victims. Individuals are allegedly forced to rape members of their own family. We hear of sexual violence against women and girls in refugee camps, even of soldiers forcibly conscripted, child soldiers, being then subjected to sexual abuse. The UN Security Council heard evidence of an internally displaced woman who, when conflict began in her town, fled and hid in the forest for six days with her family. She gave birth whilst in hiding, but her baby sadly died a few days later. At the same time, her husband was also killed. When she resumed her journey, she met four soldiers who raped her in front of the rest of her children throughout the night and into the following day. Mark Locock, the UN's emergency relief coordinator, concluded, there is no doubt that sexual violence is being used in this conflict as a weapon of war, as a means to humiliate, terrorise and traumatise an entire population today and into the next generation. And so I welcome the statement from the Minister of Africa that the UK is working to prevent sexual violence in Tigray to provide support for survivors and their children and promote justice for them. And as co-chair for the APPG on Eritrea, can I ask the minister a number of questions before turning more specifically again to the issue of four? What steps is the UK taking to press for UN investigators to have full access to the region 
to conduct its assessment of such atrocities? How is the UK supporting the UN Office for the High Commissioner of Human Rights to ensure their joint investigation into atrocities with the Ethiopian High Commission are independent, transparent and impartial? Will this assessment look specifically at the situation of ethnic and religious groups? What update can the Minister give of plans to deploy the UK Preventing Sexual Violence Conflict Team to the region? What action has been taken following the recent mission by UK representatives to Shire Tigray to assess humanitarian access, emergency services in camps, and the support gaps that are needed to be filled, in particular for survivors of sexual violence and their children? And finally, what steps will the UK take to ensure that those responsible for such crimes are held to account and the implementation of a timely mechanism to collect and conserve evidence of sexual violence to give the best possible opportunity for perpetrators to be brought to account and for victims to see justice? And turning now, as I say, to the separate but by no means disconnected topic of freedom of religion or belief, and as the Prime Minister's special envoy for freedom of religion or belief, I welcome the G7 Foreign Ministers May Communique, Para 55, which I hope Hansard may perhaps print in full, that as representing nations engaging in uh, creating a safer, more stable world, the G7 Ministers are committed to promoting freedom of religion or belief for all and to coordinating further action to defend FORB for all. I also welcome last week's G7 Open Society's leader's statement, which similarly committed countries to working together and with partners to promote freedom of religion or belief, and the joint statement by our Prime Minister and the US President in the New Atlantic Treaty, again specifically referring to the UK and the US working together to support democracy across the globe, including by protecting freedom of religion or belief. This coming year is a vital one for the UK to demonstrate our global leadership in championing FORB and putting these words into action. I am doing so as the PM Special Envoy by actively working to oversee the full implementation of the Bishop of Truro's Independent Review by its three-year review deadline of July 2022. Recommendation 21B makes reference to matters relevant to today's debate. Um, and the UK looks forward to hosting the full ministerial international gathering also in July 2022, when we can bring together senior ministers and others concerned about FORB from across the world to discuss what actions have been taken and need to be taken in this respect. Another key platform for action on FORB is the International Religious Freedom and Belief Alliance, of which the UK is a leading member where over 33 countries meet regularly through representatives such as myself, mandated to take forward FORB internationally, including by specifically challenging violations and abuses. I look forward to continuing to work with ministers, partners in like-minded countries, faith leaders and NGOs, as we seek to put the webs on FORB from the G7 into action to help not only those suffering abuses of the kind we've heard of today, but equally importantly, to help prevent them happening in the first place. Thank you. We now go by video link to Hannah Bardell. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Sexual violence and conflict is not inevitable. It's often an intentional strategy to further terrorise vulnerable women, girls, men and boys. Sexual violence can be committed at the hands of state-affiliated perpetrators or indeed non-state armed groups, including terrorist organisations. Violence against women and girls, gender-based violence, is much more common, as we have heard, in conflict zones. And victims of sexual violence and conflict are often subject to rape, forced prostitution, genital mutilation and forced marriage. These unspeakable acts and their unspeakable consequences are almost unbearable to discuss but we must speak up and debates like this are absolutely vital. What is also vital though is the funding and resources that help tackle these horrific acts and support those who face it. As a developed family of nations, we have a moral obligation to do our bit. However, the disturbing direction the Prime Minister and his government is taking the UK, UK in breaks a legally binding commitment and yet again another of his own manifesto promises. 
Having set up the Prevention, Preventing Sexual Violence and Conflict Initiative, which 155 nations joined to commit to ending sexual violence as a weapon of war, the UK has sadly rolled back. The initiative has faced significant issues, and in a report by the Independent Commission for Aid Impact in 2020, it was found that despite initial strong leadership following the departure of Lord Hague's Foreign Secretary, senior ministerial interests waned and funding and staff resources fell. The initiative made some important achievements, it said, including creating an international protocol used to secure convictions, but also had no overall strategy, did not focus on learning and failed to include survivors systematically, which we have heard is absolutely crucial. Madam Deputy Speaker, this government is asleep at the wheel on this important issue, and the Prime Minister, who was previously Foreign Secretary, is front and centre of this folly. The UK is the only G7 member to cut its international aid as a COVID-19 response. That should shame us all, and is not supported by the majority of Scottish MPs, or I suspect the majority of the Scottish people. The Scottish Government recently conducted a review of its international development policy and committed to offer at least £500,000 for projects that promote gender equality in partner countries across the world. Rather than claim to be hampered by it, our review in Scotland was prompted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Scotland will continue to employ whatever levers and resources it has within the constraints of this union to ensure it's doing its bit. But I have no doubt an independent Scotland would take its place on the global stage as a nation ready to meet its international obligations. Because even the PM's own backbenchers have admitted these aid cuts will cost lives. The UN said that more than 500 rape cases have been imported, eh, reported in the Tigray region of Ethiopia in March this year. At least 27 cases of sexual violence have been recorded during the recent protests in Colombia. And China stands accused of organised sexual violence against its Uyghur population. These are just a few horrific examples of what people, mainly women and girls, are at risk of enduring in an already devastating and volatile situation. So the UK must not use the COVID-19 pandemic to shirk its responsibilities in fighting what the UN calls a global pandemic of gender-based violence. And it's an outrage that this House and its democratically elected representatives were stripped of our right to vote on the cut to aid. It shows once again that this Tory government cannot be trusted. Madam Deputy Speaker, the people of my Livingston constituency, and indeed the people of Scotland, are an outward-looking, forward-thinking and progressive nation. I cannot wait for the day when we as an independent nation on the global stage have the full basket of powers to operate and support those in need with all our might and power. Until then, we in the SNP will continue to challenge this Conservative government on their despicable actions. A change of heart and actions are sorely needed. The world is watching and the UK is at present at grave risk of doing lasting damage to its international reputation, but more importantly, to the most vulnerable people on the planet. At the very least, the Preventing Sexual Violence and Conflict Initiative needs new money and new life breathed into it. Gareth Davis. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Throughout our history, rape and sexual violence have been used as weapons of war. Horrendous crimes, and so it is important that we debate this today. Let me first of all congratulate my honourable friend, the member for Totnes, not just for giving a great, well-informed speech, but for all of his work over many years on this subject and his leadership of the APPG, for which I'm very pleased to be a member of. Can I also say, Madam Deputy Speaker, it's good to see a man with a leading voice on this important issue, for it is overwhelmingly men who are the perpetrators of these horrendous crimes. Our gender has an incredibly important role in helping to drive action against those responsible, and my honourable friend is at the forefront leading the calls. It is also an important time to have this debate in the context of the global pandemic, for we know that the pandemic has exacerbated gender inequality, and we know that gender equality is one of the key drivers of gender-based violence. My honourable friend pointed out that the United Nations has estimated that last year, in just six months of the lockdown, 31 million cases of gender-based violence were recorded. And by my rough maths, that's about five million a month, truly staggering. So it's incredibly important we meet today to discuss this. Now, we should not forget that much progress has been made over the last decade. The Murad Code, a global code of conduct, was introduced by Lord Ahmed and Nadia Murad 
for the recording of sensitive information from survivors, and that should be applauded. Our British Armed Forces are playing an important role, with British troops now receiving comprehensive pre-deployment training on preventing sexual exploitation, abuse and violence against women. And we have also made strong commitments to ensuring that UN peacekeeping is equipped to tackle sexual violence. And indeed, on the international stage, 150 countries have now endorsed the Declaration of Commitment to end sexual violence in conflict. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, some progress is being made, but as Lord Haig of Richmond has pointed out, apathy does endure, sadly, on the world stage. And so we must go further to re-engage the international community. The main point I want to make today, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that I entirely endorse and wholeheartedly support those calling for a new international, independent, permanent body focused on the collection of evidence. Ultimately, the way we solve this issue is to increase prosecutions, and I believe that this body could help drive that forward. Britain could help drive that forward. Madam Deputy Speaker, the situation you walk past is the situation you accept. It was Plato who once said that only the dead have truly seen the end of war. So if military conflict is to endure, let it be Britain that ensures that the existence of rape as a weapon of war does not. Thank you. Kirsten Oswald. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I, I congratulate the Honourable Member for Totnes on securing this debate and his very powerful remarks because I, I think there can be no doubt that, as he said, these are the most terrible crimes and we must step up in that situation. And the Honourable Member for Rotherham is right to say that in the past the UK has been an important global advocate for survivors of these appalling war crimes. Sadly, though, this UK government is swiftly squandering that reputation, and that's deeply regrettable. Conflict-related sexual violence perpetrated against women and girls, but also against boys and men, is a horrendous crime. The use of rape, sexual slavery, forced prostitution, forced pregnancy, forced abortion, enforced sterilisation, forced marriage, I could go on, as weapons, these things don't always hit the headlines. Actually, they so often go unreported yep. to the wider world. But that doesn't mean that these things are not happening. And in fact, regrettably, these things are happening more and more. Yep. We know that during crises and during conflict, sexual violence can both increase and yet be less noticed. And this pandemic is no different. In fact, the United Nations has described gender-based violence itself as a global pandemic. So we do need to be very clear that this current COVID-19 crisis cannot mean that this issue is allowed to fall down the priority list because it absolutely must get the attention and the funding that it deserves. Madam Deputy Speaker, in 2012, when the Foreign and Commonwealth Office set up the Preventing Sexual Violence in Conflict Initiative and 155 nations joined forces to make that commitment to ending sexual violence as a weapon of war, things looked to be on a positive track. But momentum has fallen away since that point. And in 2020, an independent commission for aid impact evaluation of the initiative concluded that since 2014, ministerial interest has waned and that there was an overall lack of strategy and an overall lack of funding. It's also a pity that recommendations haven't yet been published, given that we are in a state of limbo um, on the previously planned international conference on PSVI, which should have been held during 2019. Now, I appreciate that that was put off because of the general election, but we're some way down the road from that now, and victims cannot wait. And I say that in the context of the UK government's own narrative. The recent integrated review of foreign policy does not give gender equality globally the priority that it deserves. The word gender is mentioned only once in what is a very lengthy document. And that is in stark contrast to the Scottish Government's vision, which I have to say is the correct focus, as the Honourable Member for Livingston set out. 
So the lack of attention here is not new, and programmes to tackle gender-based violence are notoriously and persistently underfunded. According to the International Refugee Committee, from 2016 to 2018, global allocations for sexual gender-based violence funding were just 0.1% of total humanitarian funding. That is 0.1%. And that's to, take, to tackle this most harrowing aspect of conflict across the globe, with more than 500 rape cases reported in the Tigray region of Ethiopia, 27 cases of sexual violence reported in Colombia in recent weeks, and with many others deemed likely. Persistent reports exist of organised sexual violence against the Uyghurs in China, very effectively highlighted, I have to say, by the campaign group yet again, who I know are hosting an important event on that topic, um, along with the Scottish Council for Jewish Communities this weekend. And continuing reports of this kind of violence emerge across the world from countries including Cameroon and Iraq. But what is the UK government's response? Its response is to cut the aid budget that helps to tackle this global pandemic of gender-based yep. violence. While the Prime Minister had been pleased to host global leaders and to sign high-sounding charters, the fact is that the UK was the only country present at last week's G7 summit that's cutting its aid budget. Yet again, this UK government demonstrates its strategic incompetence by cutting aid at the time that it should be increasing it. That's Tory austerity all over again, but this time it's on the global stage. France is growing its budget. It's set to reach 0.7%. Germany will exceed 0.7% this year. The Americans are increasing aid by $14 billion. It's easy to sign a charter to get your name in history books, but as is often the case with this Prime Minister, the follow-through is sadly lacking. And instead of working to confront injustice, the Prime Minister is forcing through swinging cuts at the worst possible time. He doesn't even have the courage to give this House a vote or to publish an honest assessment of what these cuts will mean for the world's poorest, most vulnerable and most marginalised. Yeah. President Biden may come to regret putting his name to a charter with a Prime Minister who seems to have an unerring ability to commit to one set of actions on paper while planning all along to do the opposite. But we don't need a formal assessment to see the damage that these cuts will do to efforts to protect the most vulnerable from sexual violence and conflict. The UK government has already cut research programmes aimed at advancing gender justice, equality and security in 22 countries, spending that helps keep more girls in school and for longer has been slashed by 40% compared to 2016 levels. The UK doesn't even contribute to the UN Victims Assistance Trust Fund that helps women and girls in severe distress. Baroness Hellich and Chloe Dalton, both former advisers to William Hague when he was Foreign Secretary, have recommended ring-fencing a minimum of 1% of our aid budget to challenge violence against women and girls abroad. This would not only increase the UK's capacity to tackle this horrendous problem at source, it would also set a valuable example for others to follow. That's a proposal that has wide support across this House, and I would ask that adoption of this is seriously considered as well as using some of the additional funding to reverse the troubling decline in the budget of the Preventing Sexual Violence in Conflicts team. Yeah, yeah. Jackie Doyle-Price. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I am very, very pleased indeed to be able to speak in this debate on this very important issue of preventing sexual violence and conflict, and I congratulate my honourable friend for bringing this to the House, because this is an issue which I think you know, we don't probably spend enough time really tackling these humanitarian issues in this place. We spend far too much time you know, playing knockabout, but this is where actually this country is at its best when it shows global, global leadership on these humanitarian matters. And we know that sexual violence is a weapon of war. It has been a weapon of war since time immemorial, but it's perhaps only in recent years that we have collectively faced up to it. We can have any number of reasons why that might be the case. Um, but it's very interesting that when it is a fundamental part of a strategy where conflicts are between ethnicities, uh, and, and when we think about it, it's pretty obvious why. Uh, while we readily talk about the murders and killings that take place as part of a, an ethnic genocide, we talk rather less about the rape and sexual violence that is associated with it, and I think that's got to change. I think we need to face up to the fact that men are perpetrating terrible, heinous, evil acts against women and girls specifically, but also against men and boys, 
uh, because it is also the it is the use of rape and sexual violence as a way of exerting power, as a way of humiliating people, as a way of degrading them. And we need to show our shine light of it. We, you know, we've had things like the Geneva Convention, which have pointed out you know, actions, international and multinational actions, to take actions against gratuitous execution. And we need to do exactly the same about, about rape and sexual violence. And you know, I think sexual violence is often a, a rather vanilla sounding term for something which is fundamentally evil. So let's, let's say it for what it is. It's rape. It's forced incest. It's mutilation. It's buggery. It is the ultimate defiling of human beings and the ultimate corruption of an act which should be about love and intimacy. And in that sense, it is a crime against humanity and one that we should rightly, rightly show global leadership in tackling. So I, I'm very proud actually that uh, William Hague, when Foreign Secretary, showed that global leadership on this issue by, by establishing this initiative. And it was something which was a very personal interest of his. And in that sense, he put it free front and centre of foreign policy at the time. But I hope that we can use this presidency of the G7, perhaps reboot uh, this agenda, particularly in the light of the other ethnic conflicts which are going on in the world at this time, and we've heard, heard about them from in previous speeches. I'd also like to just remind the government as well that you know, this is entirely complementary with its wider policy towards women and girls. You know, domestically, we are for the first time having a proper violence against women and girls strategy, so it absolutely makes perfect sense to take that into the international field too. And of course, at the heart of our international aid programmes is the focus on education uh, for girls around the world, and you know, actually we, we recognise the the immensely civilising influence that the education of girls has on societies. So it is absolutely consistent uh, that uh, we put the prevention of sexual violence at the heart of, of our uh, future agenda. As I said earlier, um, since the dawn of time, rape has been a, a weapon of war, and it's, it is important that we continue to, to treat it as a, a serious crime uh, as we prosecute uh, on a global basis. But I think it's only recently that we've begun to understand just how prevalent it is. And it's only by really making sure that we, sh that we spread that understanding about how prevalent it is that we will encourage anyone uh, to, take, to take action. And I'd just like to refer actually to the uh, conflict in Bosnia, where I think that was the first time the international community did recognise properly that rape was being used as a part of the military strategy. Um, we understand that there were as many as 50,000 uh, rapes during that conflict, which, you know, when you think that each of us represents 80,000 constituents, that's, that brings home just the magnitude of how significant this is. You know, we, talk, we always remember, when we remember Srebrenica, the murder of, of, of those, all those men and boys, but we never talk about the rapes. I remember, I was a student at university during that conflict, I remember seeing the pictures of the camps. Uh, I remember seeing the shell shelling in Sarajevo. I remember hearing about the fact this was an ethnic com conflict between Bosniaks, Croats and Serbs, but I never heard about the rapes. And I think, you know, again, we will not be able to take actions until we're honest about it. And we shouldn't just see this as an inevitable fact uh, of any ethnic conflict. We've got to say, call it out for what it is, we've got to say this is unacceptable. And I'm really pleased that in prosecuting the war crimes following Bosnia, that rape was included against those, it was seen as, as a genocide, and it was seen as a crime against humanity. Uh, it is inevitable, when we think about it, that in an ethnic conflict, rape will be a fundamental part of that, that strategy. Um, and I think, again, we need, we need to highlight exactly what it is that we're talking about. In, in the Bosnian conflict, we saw rape camps, uh, which were established where women were systematically raped and only released once they were pregnant. Gang rape and public rapes were common. Uh, men were forced to rape their family members. There was one report of a 14-year-old boy being forced to rape his mother. Forced oral sex and forced anal sex were common. And in some prisons, detainees were forced to rape other men. 
How horrific is this to be happening? Just 20 years ago in Europe, yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker. And you know, once we actually face the facts of what we're actually talking about, sexual violence in conflict really is, it means we cannot look the other way. And this country is a great country that shows leadership on these matters. And please continue to do so. Yeah. Maria Miller. Madam Deputy Speaker, caught me slightly unwares there. I'll take and remove my mask. Um, can I commend my honourable friend for Totnes for securing this debate today and the way in which he so persuasively talks about the need for continued focus on this hugely important issue. And it's, it's really uh, challenging to um, follow my honourable friend who's just spoken uh, because I think she really puts her finger on it to talk about the appalling way in which this abuse can affect people for generations. Um, and the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war is, is always unacceptable. And it was the Conservative Party's work on preventing sexual violence in armed conflict that was born out of the tragedy of Darfur and the survivors of uh, Srebrenica. Um, and, and it's really the tragedy today that despite this leadership, 12 years on, events like these are still happening now in places like Ethiopia and honourable members who've spoken previously are right to say that uh, debates like this are vital to ensure that we keep the focus on the use of rape and torture and abuse, particularly of women, um, as a weapon of war. And we have to keep that central to this debate. But we do also, Madam Deputy Speaker, need to focus on the facts. Uh, and this is where I think the debate needs to lie, because there has been a great deal of progress as a result of the leadership of this government, of this party, um, of the Conservative Party, um, and of, of, of ministers in place now. And I, you can see that in the integrated review, you can see that in the G7 communique. Um, in the integrated review, it is, it is absolutely clear, and I quote, that the government want to continue to strengthen justice for survivors of conflict-related uh, sexual violence, as well as providing support to survivors and children born of conflict-related sexual violence. I don't think it could be clearer than that. And indeed, in the G7 communique, I, I was very pleased to see, and I think clearly with leadership from uh, this government, um, the leaders of the seven uh, most important developed nations in this world, um, setting out very clearly that the use of sexual violence in conflict situations, uh, that, that such acts constitute crimes against humanity or war crimes. We could not be clearer, and I think that leadership should not be underestimated, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, but the, and the UK continues to be one of the largest providers of international aid as well. But let's get to the debate where it really needs to be, which is what do we do next? How do we move forward? with this uh, clear goodwill that there is there to, to make the sort of changes uh, and approaches to this appalling crime that we need to see. And I think that's where my honourable friend, the member for Totnes, is absolutely right. We need to hear from the minister uh, more of the specifics about how this government is going to continue to drive forward that important agenda. And I'm, I, I'm very uh, interested in some of the uh, the ideas that he was putting forward, uh, which obviously are also echo echoing those of the Independ Independent Commission for Aid Impact. And I think it would be sensible to hear more about how uh, an international convention on preventing sexual violence could be developed, or indeed how we could have an international body to do more to collect evidence to bring perpetrators to justice, because that also has the added benefit of making it a crime that people are fearful of committing in the first place, for, for fear of that evidence being collected and uh, for, for, um, for, for, for perpetrators to be brought to justice. Um, I, I also have a huge sympathy for the need for longer term funding commitments. Uh, we all too, hear, all too often hear, as members of parliament, the problems created by short term funding approaches. Um, and so I hope the Minister might be thinking carefully about that and indeed the ring fencing of, um, of those working on this issue to build the sort of consistency that my honourable friend, the Member for Totnes, was talking about. Um, we, we, we should not speak about this issue without remembering also, Madam Deputy Speaker, that in February of this year, Save the Children estimated that 246 million children around the world live in conflict zones and that more than 70 million 
one in six of those children live within 50 kilometers of conflicts where armed groups have perpetrated the most heinous sexual violence, not only against adults, but also against children. And that is in the last year alone. Madam Deputy Speaker, none of us can allow that to pass us by because if we do, then all of the work that we're doing on international development is for naught. Because if we allow children to become the, uh, the victims of sexual violence in these sorts of conflict zones, then we leave ourselves with generations of problems to deal with in terms of uh, peace and reconciliation. If, we are, if children have been exposed to these sorts of heinous acts and, and all of the consequences that my honourable friend, the member for Thurrock, went through um, so eloquently in her speech. Um, to make sure that we save the next generation from the sort of impact of these war crimes. I hope the Minister will take his uh, contribution in the debate today uh, to be able to give um, all of us here more information and more details on how the government is taking forward what has been um, an, an, an incredible piece of work over the last 12 years so that we can ensure that um, the, the work and the reputation of our nation for dealing with issues of sexual violence in conflict zones uh, continues to be something that we can all be extremely proud um, to be part of the legacy of this government. Oh, I, I thank the Honourable Lady for being brief. We're doing fine. We now go by video link to Chris Law. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The horrific nature of sexual violence and conflict, the deliberate, humiliating violation of those targeted, the fear it instills in survivors and potential victims, the stigma it can create and the trauma it leaves behind means it's rightly recognised by the International Criminal Court as a war crime and a crime against humanity. Yet all too often sexual violence goes under the radar or worse, is considered an inevitable consequence of war. Programmes to tackle it are notoriously and persistently underfunded, with global allocations for sexual gender-based violence funding just 0.1% of total humanitarian funding between 2016 and 2018. There is no excuse to neglect these efforts, and all governments have a responsibility to increase support to those who have already suffered these crimes and to protect those being targeted now and in the future. Madam Deputy Speaker, in the past, the UK government has shown that it can be a global leader on conflict-related sexual violence. With the establishment of the Preventing Sexual Violence and Conflict Initiative in 2012. However, the regrettable keyword here is the past. Sadly, the momentum behind the initiative has not been sustained, and the government must revitalise this work to be an effective global partner in tackling sexual violence. The budget for the Preventing Sexual Violence and Conflict Initiative team has been decreasing for several years, and the number of deployments in the UK, UK's team of experts has been falling too. In 2020, there was just one deployment, in contrast with 27 deployments in 2014. The Independent Commission for Aid Impact concluded that since 2014, ministerial interest in the Preventing Sexual Violence and Conflict Initiative has waned and fragmented. The protection of these fundamental human rights and prevention of this war crime cannot be treated as a short-term campaign rather than a long-term strategy. This has consequences, Madam Deputy Speaker. In March, the UN said that more than 500 rape cases had been reported in the Tigray region of Ethiopia. And of course, this is likely to be a gross underestimate. In Ethiopia alone, the UN Population Fund estimates there may be 22,500 survivors of sexual violence who will see clinical care this year. It is clear that this is a weapon of war. At this moment, the SCDO should be deploying teams of experts and specialist aid to treat survivors to Ethiopia and to neighbouring Sudan, where tens of thousands of refugees are arriving. But we have yet to hear any news of this, and I hope the Minister will speak on this today. Will the SCDO be doing this? And given that spending in this area has been declining even prior to the cuts to ODA, does the SCDO still have that budget and resources for this initiative, particularly with aid now being cut to Africa by two thirds. Madam Deputy Speaker, the UK government has taken its eye off the ball and there's a real danger that this will continue to be neglected and imperiled as further cuts to aid programmes are announced. 
The reduction in spending has meant there'll be almost £1 billion cut to the UK government's work on conflict in open societies. Surely making every effort to prevent conflict occurring must be part of the strategy to prevent conflict-related sexual violence. For every programme that's wholly or even partially suspended, there's an increased risk of bloodshed, conflict and sexual violence. This is penny wise and pound foolish. Madam Deputy Speaker, each and every one of us who are horrified when we heard stories of sexual slavery of Yazidi women by Daesh. Yet this year, the government has not only decided to slash it to Syria, and for the first time, but also for the first time since 1991, will provide no bilateral aid to Iraq. That is none. Therefore, how did these reckless decisions help protect against conflict and sexual violence? The simple answer is, is that they don't. Ahead of the G7 summit, the UK government spoke about building momentum to end violence against women and girls and denouncing the use of sexual violence in conflict situations, but words are simply not enough. COVID should have been a reason to step up, not step away. The UN estimates that each month in lockdown would result in an additional 5 million cases of gender-based violence, 2 million more of female genital mutilation, and 13 more, more children forced into child marriage. This government has taken us all for fools by claiming that we had to cut the aid budget because of the pandemic. That was a political choice, not shown by other G7 countries who increased their aid. Indeed, the Scottish government increased their contributions by 50%. This cruel Tory government's austerity 2.0 is now on the backs of the most vulnerable in our global community. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm sure the government will try to defend themselves by rattling off the statistics of what they're doing. However, we must ask, even though they may be doing something, are they doing clearly enough? For every project this UK government mentions, just remember many more have had their operations hindered or completely shut down. So let's remind the Tories who exactly has been affected when they make their cuts. For example, a woman in South Sudan tied to a tree after her husband was brutally murdered and forced to watch her teenage child being gang raped by soldiers. Or a primary school boy in Syria who should have been watching cartoons and playing with friends instead kidnapped by Daesh, imprisoned and sexually abused over and over again. Or a Yemeni man in prison, subject to rape, electrocution, beating of genitals and threats of sterilisation. These ac actions are replicated many thousands of times the world over. These are the people this government is abandoning with their cuts. So to answer my own question, Madam Deputy Speaker, no, this government is not doing enough despite the claims of support. This government will not be doing enough until we can return to our full aid commitment, reprioritise the Preventing Sexual Violence and Conflict Initiative and ensure that the victims of sexual violence get the full amount of support they need and deserve. Thank you. Jim Shannon. Th thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and, and um, for calling me. I would also like to thank uh, uh, you for the opportunity to speak in today's debate. This Madam Deputy Speaker, is not a topic that many like to discuss. It is uncomfortable, it is, it is difficult, and, and to be honest with you, Madam Deputy Speaker, I feel a bit uneasy uh, about uh, some of the things that I've heard, because uh, when they're, I know they're true, but I do feel particularly um, hard to try and deal with these things. However, I also feel obliged, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, to stand up today on behalf of those who cannot especially as a father and a grandfather, where evil triumphs when good people do nothing. So we, as good people in this house, have, I believe, an opportunity to speak out on behalf of those who need our help. Sexual violence in conflict areas has become very common, often seen as a tactic of war and not a crime. These acts are not limited to rape and sexual assault. They can include the forced prostitution and enforced sterilisation, arranged marriages, save the children. I've estimated to some 72 million children and or one in six children living in conflict zones are at a high risk of sexual violence by armed groups. The figure is well and truly astonishing. And it is also important to remember that these crimes do not discriminate and can occur to men, women and children of all ages. This is just absolute pure evil, uh, pure wickedness uh, of, of, of a bestial uh, nature that it's almost impossible to try and comprehend it uh, uh, as we try to figure out what, what to do. 
with the pandemic causing distress to all walks of life, the sexual violence, crimes and conflict zones have gone unnoticed. From January 2020, um, the, the, from, uh, the United Nations reported more than 200 sexual violence cases in many conflict zones. And we've heard them in Afghanistan, in the Central Afri African Republic, in South Sudan, in Colombia, and, and many, many other places in the world where we just cannot absolutely find it difficult to try and take it in. Many of these have been ignored due to the lack of reports and reliable data due to COVID. And as we gradually come out of the, of the pandemic, there is time for reflection and more importantly, time for action. And we do look to our minister today and the, and, and the front benches to, to give us the reassurance that is necessary. The Preventing Sexual Violence and Conflict Initiative set up by the MOD and SCDO were established to raise awareness on these horrific crimes and is welcome. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm afraid raising awareness is simply not enough. And I think that's what we're saying. We can all raise awareness by the speeches we make, but we really look to our minister to see how that awareness can be turned into action, because that's what I want to see. We as a legislator must legislate and act against this. We must work on delivering better access to support and health care for the victims of conflict zones, not simply being aware of the need. Being aware of the need in this debate is one thing, but acting upon it is the other. Um, conflict and violence are something Northern Ireland is familiar with. We still bear the scars every day. Uh, but when we think of conflict zones combined with the impacts of sexual violence, it does not come close to the devastation that some face. Most recently in, in March past, and, and I was quite horrified when I, when I read the case, the, the, the facts, some 500 rape cases were reported in the Pigray um, region of Ethiopia. Uh, note the words were reported. Uh, sometimes, Madam Deputy Speaker, that probably means there were actually more. Uh, and, and that's a worrying thing about it. I mean, it, it's incomprehensible to try and, 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 and deal with this uh, uh, for people who uh, uh, have not been confronted with this before. And I'm happy to, absolutely. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm, I'm always grateful to hear the Honourable Member speaking because he speaks with such passion. Um, you talk about the reported cases. In the UK, it's estimated about 15% of women report the cases. So I absolutely agree. Of the reported cases we hear of PSVI, it will be the slightest tip of the iceberg. I thank the Honourable Lady for, for her, her intervention, and, and she's absolutely right. And I think every one of us is, is, is aware that the, the figures that they talk about nowhere near come near the, the, the uh, magnitude of the, of the difficulty. And I commend the Honourable Lady, and I, I do this because it's true. The Honourable Lady, for, uh, she's championed by name, but championed for, for the way that, that, that she yeah, takes yeah. up the causes. Uh, and, and, and I'm certainly very, very encouraged by everything that she says as well. Um, in, in these and other post-conflict uh, situations, survivors carry the effects of their trauma, when the perpetrators, those who deserve uh, a punishment for their actions, uh, uh, often walk free. Uh, a local churchman in my constituency has often brought these issues of sexual violence and conflict zones to my attention. He has travelled areas which have been subject to this kind of brutality. It reminds us of how essential it is that the work has been done on the ground. This kind of work starts here in this house. Uh, from, from us as uh, elected MPs and our, our minister and our government uh, and how we move forward. I, I, I would like to commend Lord Ackman uh, as well. He's been mentioned by the Honourable Gentleman for Totnes in particular. Um, and uh, he, his statement were, were uh, back at the conference which he said, time for justice, putting uh, survivors first. And, and really, we, we would wish to do that. Uh, and, and with helping those survivors, we need to have accountability for those who carry out the, the awful, awful, horrible uh, uh, um, um, uh, attacks upon people and upon women and children. I've noted in 2014-15 the Foreign Commonwealth Office le uh, legislated for some £20 million to be allocated to the PSV activities. Um, the figure has been, and, and I, I find it quite distressing by the way, to see the figure uh, being reduced each and every year, and I understand the, the, the government and, and, and is trying hard to, to balance the books. But the good that this does and can do, uh, I think, should outweigh uh, the, the figures that are allocated to it. In the last year, just 2.6 million. Uh, compare that with 2014 with 20 million. Uh, and I think uh, we, we can, in this House, take those decisions. Uh, uh, I know we can't fund all of the world's problems, but we can honour commitments that we have made. Uh, and and in, in that, where does that money that money used for? When we looked at the library stats, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, it referred to the deployment of PSVI expert teams. Um, in 2020, we only deployed one team. My goodness. Uh, should we not be doing more? Um, six a year before, 11, and, and, the, and the big year of 2014-27. 
Again, I do thank uh, the Honourable Member for Totnes for setting the scene so extremely well and for the work that he does as Chair of the APPG. Uh, he, he, he highlighted how PSD has been downgraded and underfunded. Uh, and again, I'd look to the Minister, as I always do, by the way, with, with great respect, why this is the case and, and will the Minister be able to change his decision. I've also noted that only one sexual violence expert team, as I referred to, has been deployed. This may be a result of the pandemic. It's possible that that could be the reasons, but I would suggest that we really probably need to do more. And I believe there's more crowd work that have been done to eradicate this. Redress as uh, charity has done amazing work with non-governmental organisations in areas such as Sudan, Kenya, Uganda to ensure effective documentation of crimes and this brings proper legal claims against per perpetrators and accountability. Those people who carry out those damnable and those terrible, terrible uh, atrocities do need to be made accountable and I would like to see something been done in, in relation to that. And I finish with this, Madam Deputy Speaker. I would urge the Minister today to dedicate time to communicate with charities and NGOs who ultimately give their time all their time to supporting victims and getting justice. We as elected representatives in this House today have the platform to act on this issue. What a privilege we have uh, to act for other people and to help other people if we can. Madam Deputy Speaker, I thank you again for the opportunity to speak in such an important debate and I have faith that the Minister will listen to all the comments made today and allocate the funding uh, to help address this issue rather than, can I say, simply talking about it. Thank you. Brendan O'Hara. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I congratulate and thank the Honourable Member for Totnes and indeed all members who have contributed to this afternoon's debate. And there is no doubt that we are all united in our complete revulsion and total condemnation of this awful practice. But yet, despite being widely acknowledged as being one of the most heinous and despicable crimes imaginable, the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war still, to this day, goes largely unreported and generally unpunished. And as we've heard, Madam Deputy Speaker, it's a long and depressing list, from Sinjar to Sri Lanka, from Colombia to China, Tigray to Myanmar, Nepal to Nigeria, Bosnia to Libya. The list goes on and on of countries where women and girls are being raped and abused by men carrying guns. And they do it in the almost certain knowledge that they will never be held to account for their actions. And we've heard from a number of honourable members that having initially shown leadership in this issue, the government has unfortunately at best stalled and at worst backpedalled in recent years. And I ask the Minister, I urge the Minister to recognise that we have a moral responsibility to ensure that those women and girls receive the justice that they're entitled to and the perpetrators know that there will, they will be tried and punished for their crimes. But while legal consequences are vital, so too is the responsibility for us all in all states to ensure that survivors of sexual violence receive the trauma counselling alongside any necessary health care they require to assist in their recovery. It's absolutely vital that we all work to end the stigma that survivors of sexual violence experience both in their communities and in wider society. And this is particularly relevant, I feel, to children born of rape. So while a legal a robust legal framework is essential. It's important that a holistic approach is taken towards healing and recovery of those living with the consequences of these atrocities. Madam Deputy Speaker, I've spoken a number of issues, a number of times on this issue since 2015, mainly in relation to the Yazidi genocide and the sexual enslavement of Yazidi women by Daesh. I've had the enormous privilege of getting to know very well Nadia Murad, whose story of how she was kidnapped, enslaved and raped, shocked the world, but shone a light on the vile atrocities that were being perpetrated by, Yazidi, by Daesh on Yazidi women. Nadia is without doubt one of the bravest and most inspiring people I have ever met. And although I have quoted her in this chamber before, I make no apology for retelling her story today. Having been taken from her village to Raqqa, Nadia, along with other women, were held in a school. She said, there were thousands of families in a building there, including children who were given away as gifts. One of the men came up to me. He wanted to take me. I was absolutely terrified. He was like a monster. I cried out I was too young. He kicked and beat me. A few days later, this man forced me to get dressed and put on makeup. Then, on that terrible night, he did it. 
He humiliated me daily. He forced me to wear clothes that barely covered my body. At night, he beat me. He asked me to take my clothes off. He put me in a room with guards who proceeded to commit their crimes until I fainted. Madam Deputy Speaker, that is a harrowing reality of sexual violence and conflict. And sadly, in what will be an all too familiar story to women and girls who have been victim of these crimes, no one has been charged or convicted yeah. for what has happened. Despite the well-documented atrocities of Daesh and despite their military defeat and the mass arrests that followed, the crime of rape appears to have been completely forgotten as criminal courts continue to use counter-terrorism legislation to prosecute members of Daesh with no charges of sexual violence being brought. These Yazidi women deserve justice. Their crimes have been inflicted upon them cannot and should not be airbrushed away. Yet, as my friend, the Honourable Member for Dundee West said, the government indeed talk a good game, but the reality is you cannot talk a good game and yet take away the funding from the very bodies who can make a difference. It is fundamentally wrong. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, the women and girls who have suffered these awful crimes deserve justice, and their perpetrators cannot be allowed to believe that they act with impunity. I urge the government to work with the United Nations, NGOs and other international partners to ensure that all countries have le legislation that ensures effective prosecution of sexual violence as a standalone international crime. But sadly, as we've heard from many members, wartime rape remains the rule and accountability the exception. As the Honourable Member for, for Thurrock said, in Bosnia between 92 and 95, 50,000 Bosnian women were raped, mainly but not exclusively, by Bosnian Serbs and Serbian paramilitary units, who used rape as an instrument of terror and as a key tactic in their programme of ethnic cleansing. And for one, every reported rape, they are reckoned to be between 15 and 20 went unreported. That same despicable tactic of ethnic cleansing was used during the Rwandan genocide, with half a million women being raped, sexually mutilated or murdered in the course of just 100 days. The aim was to produce more Hutu children and, in other cases, to infect women with sexually transmitted diseases thereby destroying their re reproductive capabilities. It is an appalling act. Yet what unites these women of Bosnia, of Rwanda, of the Yazidi women, is that despite these atrocities, atrocities that have ruined hundreds of thousands of innocent lives, the number of men charged, prosecuted and convicted of carrying out these rapes is minimal while survivors of conflict-related related sexual violence have struggled to achieve recognition as legitimate victims of war and, thereby, and therefore access to reparations and redress. In August last year, a UN report concluded that almost a quarter of a century after the conflict in, in Bosnia, that investigations into sexual violence had been ineffective and slow and that compensation and support for the victims were inadequate. And to almost painfully illustrate the point, one Hutu commander, John Tigane, who was accused of rape and murder of Tutsi women at a local hospital, was convicted of two counts of immigration fraud and three counts of perjury in the United States. It is appalling, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's simply not good enough, and we are all failing these vulnerable women and girls. And I repeat the call I made earlier for this to be given a much higher priority by the government than it currently is. Finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, tragically, appallingly, rape and sexual violence in conflict is endemic, so much so that while it is loudly and rightly condemned, it has almost become an accepted norm. That has to change. We all have a moral responsibility to be part of that change. And I'm afraid, as my honourable member, the friend for Livingston said, right now the UK government appear to be asleep at the wheel. And as my honourable friend for East Renfrewshire said, how can the UK government talk seriously about preventing sexual violence and conflict while at the same time taking away those desperately needed funds from those organisations whose job it is to combat it and prevent it? And I urge the Minister, please rethink this cut to overseas aid. It is killing people.
Shadow Minister Yasmin Qureshi. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. May I congratulate the Honourable Member for Totnes for obtaining this very timely debate with the UN Day for the Elimination of Sexual Violence Conflict on Saturday. And can I say that the quality of the debates from all the Honourable Members from both sides have been excellent, and everybody is very passionate about the commitment that this is a serious issue that needs to be addressed and that it must be properly funded as well. Nine years ago, there was a global summit to end sexual violence in conflict, where following the 2012 creation of the United Kingdom Preventing Sexual Violence in Conflict Initiative, PSVI, there was a commitment to bring the international community together to put an end to this act. We know that the COVID-19 has increased the risk of conflict-related sexual and gender-based violence around the world, and projects that support survivors and train officials to identify and combat the issues are absolutely vital in addressing the symptoms of sexual violence. But, Mr. De Madam Deputy Speaker, the government has not done enough. Only two weeks ago, Lord Haig, who helped to spearhead this initiative, stated, the United Kingdom government has continued PSVI but with a lower priority. The sense of urgency at a senior level has dissipated. Funding for the initiative is the lowest since it started. The team of experts is really deployed. The raising of the issue across all diplomatic gatherings has dried up. That is a damning indictment of what was a powerful initiative. The Minister would know that in a critical report last year, the Independent Commission for Aid Impact found that the PCVI's staffing, staffing dropped from 34 staff members in 2014 to just three now. And in answer to parliamentary question, it was revealed that funding for PSVI has fallen by 87% in the past seven years. And the expert team which was assembled to be deployed to a conflict areas to help gather evidence and support survivors has been cut from 27 in 2014 to just one in 2020. Does the claim from the Foreign Secretary that the PSV is still a major priority for government is plainly not correct. Instead of stepping up, the government has actually scaled back. If we are truly serious about ending sexual and gender-based violence, we need to begin by changing the way we think and talk about sexual violence and the motivation of its perpetrators and enablers. Yes, we need projects that support survivors and train officials to identify and combat the underlying issues and it's vital to addressing the symptoms of sexual violence. But we also need to acknowledge the impact of structural gender inequality which justifies, normalises and accepts this thing as part of life. We know that violence against women increases in conflict settings. Most notably, this takes the form of systematic rape by military actors. And we know this has long been considered a strategic weapon of war. And as one me as member for uh, Totnes said, it's cheap and costs nothing. But we know that sexual violence is not unique to conflict settings. Policies that focus slowly, solely on military rape risk failing to address the continuum of violence between these crimes and the everyday private forms of abuse that happens everywhere and increase in the inequitable and unsustainable societal environments. In the United Kingdom and around the world, COVID-19 lockdown measures have unleashed a surge in gender-based violence at exactly the same time that the services on which survivors rely on have been cut or forced to close. Uniforms reported that at least 120 million girls under the age of 20 have experienced forced sexual intercourse. Further, it is anticipated that 47 million women are expected to fall in extreme poverty. And 20 million girls, on top of the 131 million out of school before the crisis, are now unlikely to return to school. That is why we on this side of the house have been calling for gender analyses in the UK's international response to COVID-19. 
But instead, the government has shut down the Department for International Development, which is renowned for its work on gender equality throughout the world, and is now intent on slashing the aid budget with women and girls disproportionately impacted. Gender-based violence response remains severely underfunded, with less than 0.52% of the overall global humanitarian response plan for COVID-19 being dedicated to gender-based violence. We missed an opportunity at the G7 to right this wrong. As G7 host, this was an opportune time for us to look ahead to the value of PSVI and the planned prevention, Preventing Sexual Violence Conflict Conference next year. And we should be putting commitment to women, peace and security at the heart of our work and our recovery from COVID-19. Does the Minister agree with me that we need to scale up quality gender-based violence, including sexual violence, prevention, protection and responses, services in conflicted states? But this is to happen the, US, the UK government must make a concrete commitment on gender equality and other forms of prevention. Madam Deputy Speaker, the government has also slashed its funding to the United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, by 85%. These funds help over 150 countries, and they have helped to prevent a quarter of a million child and maternal deaths. 14.6 million unintended pregnancies and 4.3 million unsafe abortions. And the director of BRAC has said cuts to Bangladesh will be catastrophic to millions of women and girls. But apart from the cuts, many in the civil society have reported that there is a lack of transparency around the funding decisions that have been taken with little or no consultation with external partners and very poor and erratic communication. The G7 Gender Equality Advisory Council 2021 had been clear that to achieve gender equality, world leaders should renew their commitment to spend 0.7 of the GNI on the ODA to tackle violence against women and girls and investing in the care economy. Will the government and the minister listen to this? United Kingdom is the only G7 country to be cutting its aid budget this year. Does the minister agree that it is hypocritical in public to commit to PSVI, the Sustainable Development Goals and gender equality while slashing aid to all of these same things at the same time? Every day, women and girls around the world are faced with discrimination in every aspect of life, purely because of their gender, and women have many discriminatory issues. In addition to financial resources, of course, we have to ensure that voices of local activists are heard and that they are led in the decision-making process. So again, that's why on this side of the House, we have launched a gender equality consultation to understand how we can work with local activists and deliver a policy platform which seeks to tackle the effects of gender equality as well as the causes. Ending sexual violence in conflict requires a holistic approach, covering a legal framework to open access to justice for survivors, gender training and support for authorities and initiatives to prevent conflict in the first place. I want our government, our country, our ministers to be ambitious and to support PSVI and to financially support it properly and not have piecemeal uh, reforms to it. So I urge the minister to listen to what everyone in the House has said and act on this. Minister James Doddridge. Madam Deputy Speaker, the House is clearly very grateful to my honourable friend, the member for Totnes, and the honourable member for Rotherham for securing uh, this debate. I pay tribute to their work, respectively, on the APPG and uh, the uh, Select Committee. I'd also, right at the outset, like to add my thanks to the work of, uh, as the honourable member of Totnes did, to Lord Haig, Baroness Helicus. Uh, the Special Envoy Angelina Jolie, particularly Chloe Dalton, whose name sometimes gets dropped off uh, the list, equally uh, as 
important. And I would add to that Lord Ahmed, who uh, is uh, doing a sterling job as a Prime Minister's uh, special representative, and also Jill Hatting as a Minister of State, a really senior, high-level uh, uh, appointment. And I can assure uh, my honourable friend that this receives the Foreign Secretary's time, it receives my time, the full team, and indeed he makes sure it receives the Prime Minister's time as well, quite rightly. Um, as others have said, this is a very timely uh, debate, uh, given uh, the event on Saturday, the International Day for the Elimination of Sexual Violence uh, and Conflict, and it's very important that we raise these issues. Um, prior to entering the chamber, I was discussing with the Honourable Member for Thurrock uh, her plans for her speech, and she went through in great detail uh, what was actually involved behind PSVI, and I'm not going to repeat those horrific words, but uh, I think it is important not to hide uh, behind uh, a, a, an acronym and actually call these things out, but with the brevity of time, I'm not going to go uh, through the list. This House should be proud of the record uh, it's had for speaking up for sexual violence, and we should be proud of the work that's been done since 2012 through 2014, when there was a surge uh, of activity under William Hague under tw uh, around 2019. There was an additional surge uh, uh, in... Uh, in the run-up to the potential uh, conference, which we're still uh, committed to. Now, this issue has been uh, very important to me. Back in uh, 2006, I went with Christian A to Rwanda and saw my, for myself uh, the horrific impact. And I can remember speaking to people for an hour, and virtually at every sentence, the next sentence was something more horrific than I could possibly imagine, and even worse than that, which they just said. Uh, in 2014, uh, sorry, in, uh, later on, um, I, I visited uh, South Sudan, uh, sat in a tent with women and heard their uh, horrific stories, uh, but also their optimism to move forward from that, but for it not to happen uh, to others. Um, and only last November I was in the Congo learning about the work that we do there, speaking uh, to our uh, gender and protection uh, uh, individuals that work out there. This issue remains vitally important. I can reassure the Honourable Gentleman that that is uh, the case. Um, and I, and I, I particularly recall, uh, as uh, uh, Lord Haig was leaving, I, I re remained uh, as a, a minister, and I co-hosted with Zema Banagura uh, a conference on this issue uh, back in 2014 for the 69th session of the UN General Assembly. So we should be proud, notwithstanding uh, the House wants us to do more of what we already have done, um, and many other countries have helped uh, move things forward. And we shouldn't see that as criticism of the UK. It was the intention of the initiative to take others, uh, particularly German, the Germans, like us. Different countries are leading in different areas, and I note uh, Germany's um, particular leadership uh, in Ethiopia as a champion uh, of PSVI, even predating the current conflict. And I will come back uh, to that as an issue. But we're focused on two aims. Firstly, strengthening the pathway to justice for survivors and holding perpetrators to account. And secondly, particularly but on the back of the ICAI uh, report and the development uh, report, uh, improving support to survivors, including talking about the stigma uh, they face and putting them at the centre of developments uh, going forward. Since the launch in 2012, uh, we've put in over 48 million, you know, the HMT have put in over 48 million. That's funded over 85 projects across 29 countries. We've trained 17,000 police and military personnel around the world. Since 2012, there's been uh, 90 deployments to a variety of countries. That has slowed down largely because of COVID uh, very recently, but hopefully that will scale um, up. Um, I spoke to Lord Ahmed uh, only last night, uh, and he reflected on his time in Cox's Bazaar, where he spoke to a, a woman who had to repeat her story of rape many, many, many times over, um, and he was uh, very keen for that not to happen. So speaking to survivors, as a member for Rotherham said, yes, kind of a survivor-centred, survivor-led approach clearly uh, needs to be at the heart, and that's why last summer we launched the the Morad Code, uh, and that code serves to be the gold standard. Various other honourable members have mentioned it and have uh, talked of how they have met uh, the Nobel laureate, uh, Nazir Morad. So just for the House, what that code does, it helps investigators, interpreters, policy makers, politicians to all respect the rights and needs of the individuals involved, but also to make sure that uh, investigations are safer, more ethical and more effective. In addition, Lord Ahmed launched a Declaration of Humanity uh, by uh, faith uh, leaders and beliefs, 
Uh, this is really important that over 50 organisations uh, signed up and recognises that uh, children born as a result of sexual conflict um, often are the most marginalised. They have difficult legal status, they struggle to get into education, um, and this is really important that we recognise this. And we're pushing forward the international action through the model framework for the well-being of children born of sexual violence. We will work through all international organisations, and this debate particularly references uh, the G7, but I shan't go through a list, but it will be bedded within. Uh, the Honourable Gentleman specifically asked me about uh, the international investigatory uh, body. Uh, I, I, I must admit I'm more sceptical than the Honourable Gentleman uh, of the efficacy of putting in place this body. For it to be achieved, there are a number of article, uh, obstacles that need to be overcome. Um, certainly, uh, we need to overcome the duplication with the existing international uh, architecture. Uh, we need to look at jurisdiction issues and limitations on accessing some sovereign states, particularly in, in these periods of conflict in the middle. Um, to be frank, uh, despite our efforts, there has been a lack of political will uh, amongst partner organisations, including the UN and other states, although we were trying to get a, a band of support together. And also there are significant resource implications for partners in the broadest sense. Uh, and there's an opportunity to cost um, to uh, deploying in this way rather than another way to support PSVI in a more traditional uh, way. Uh, but we did consult on this and perhaps I've given him an indication of some of the things that he needs to work on to build uh, support uh, and move things forward uh, through the group. A number of individuals uh, mentioned Tigray off the back of the uh, urgent question. I can confirm we will be deploying in the uh, resource in the next uh, few weeks. A um, uh, resource has been identified in a number of locations uh, and there's some logistical issues uh, to get uh, them in the field. But the British Government have been in Tigray. There's been five visitors, um, or five delegations. Our Head of Development has been there. Our Ambassador uh, uh, was there this week. Uh, Prime Minister's uh, Envoy for Trade and Famine was there. Uh, so there's been a lot of attention. But early on in the crisis, there was no access to humanitarian entities, let alone uh, those involved in PSVI. Uh, we've directly in Tigray helped 240, uh, sorry, 545 survivors. We've helped 9,792 people we think are at risk. Uh, through partners, we've helped 643 children and provide specialist medical uh, kits through partners uh, and materials to 16,488. So whilst we are not there with those uh, advisors at this time, we are going to be and we are already uh, supporting through partner organisations. Uh, in Lord Ahmed, in the Foreign Secretary and me, I can confirm that we will remain champions of the prevention of sexual violence uh, against women. And I thank uh, the House for raising uh, this issue and holding the government to account on this important subject. Anthony Mangle. Madam Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his response because there is a great deal to cover over the course of this debate because a whole host of issues have been raised by members with great expertise in different areas and all of the speeches have managed to create and inform the House of the severity of this issue and the fact that it is a crisis. But I would respectfully say that one of the problems that we have when looking at other organisations, inter international organisations, is that they have failed to achieve any meaningful prosecutions on this subject. So if they are not working, then we must try to take the steps forward so that we can lead those prosecutions. It's no good us saying that there are other organisations who have objections to this. When we know that we can get 156 countries to sign our resolution, when we know that we can get international support for what we have done in the past, we have the opportunity to take that leadership and to create those new international bodies. Because in the wake of every great conflict and crisis that there has been in the world, there have always been remarkable institutions and organisations set up in response to those events. And let us make no doubt, let us be under no illusion that this is a crisis and it will be a crisis in future conflicts unless we address it. Now, as the member for Strangford rightly said, the UK cannot respond to every single ill and evil in the world. But we stepped forward in 2012 and I asked the House, what does it say about us if we do not deliver on the promises of the past to help the future? That is what I want to see done. The member for Rotherham, as ever, gave a splendid speech, and I think the point about a survivor-led approach is right. And it is rightly reflected in the Murad Code. 
the, uh, the Minister is completely right. But the point is that the MURAD code must be housed in an international organisation that sees that code of conduct deployed in every conflict area in the world, but also is enforced by an organisation that can bring perpetrators to justice. Collecting evidence is only one of the pillars of what we must seek to achieve to be able to bring justice uh, against perpetrators and to support those survivors. It has been said that on Saturday, Madam Deputy Speaker, it is UN Day for the Elimination of Sexual Violence in Conflict. We have, in this debate, raised a whole host of ideas and thoughts as to what we can do, and I look forward to seeing members from across this House work with the Government and other governments to get it right. The question is, as on the order paper, as may as that opinion say aye. No, the question. Yes, the question. <laughs> so as that opinion say aye. aye. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I beg to move that this house do now adjourn. Just before I adjourn the house, I'm going to suspend the house for one minute uh, because I will be in trouble if we don't take the necessary precautions. So we will. Suspend the adjournment and have one minute suspension. Order! Order. I beg to move that this House do now adjourn. The question is that this House do now adjourn. Olivia Blake. Yeah. Um, I would like to thank the Speaker through you, Madam Deputy Speaker, for allowing parliamentary time on this important topic in this adjournment debate on miscarriage. I wanted to bring to the Chamber's attention the recent series of papers published in The Lancet entitled Miscarriage Matters and the petition by Tommies on support for women after miscarriages. The petition currently has over 170,000 signatories. I know that this topic is often one that is difficult to talk about, but I hope by giving the Chamber an opportunity to hear some of the experiences and latest research that this debate can act as a catalyst for change for miscarriage services in the upcoming Women's Health Strategy. For too long, miscarriage has been a taboo, and I was disappointed that while the press release for the Women's Health Strategy call for evidence mentioned breaking taboos. It did not mention miscarriages directly, only pregnancy-related issues. I am so pleased that prominent women like Meghan Markle in my Ling class have been brave enough to speak and break the taboo about their experiences. Miscarriage is little spoken about, but incredibly common. One in four pregnancies are thought to end in miscarriage. The research suggests 15% of recognised pregnancies around the world end in miscarriage. That's 23 million miscarriages a year, or 44 miscarriages a minute. Black mothers face 40% higher relative risk than white mothers, and the risk of miscarriage is the lowest between the ages of 20 and 29, but goes up threefold by 40 and fivefold by 45. Unfortunately, I think this commonality and the well-known challenges in women's health has meant that services are not always set up with the best interests of women. Miscarriages are often a symptom of an underlying health condition. It shouldn't be that they should just seen as a fact of life. And I am concerned that this attitude speaks to a wider gendered inequalities in our society. I shared my own experience in Westminster Hall debate last year, and I've been overwhelmed by families contacting me to share their experiences. I've heard from women who have never told anyone but their partners they've experienced a miscarriage, and women who have experienced this 30 years ago still carrying the hurt, and now some seeing their children go through exactly the same issues. Although I spoke of my loss to highlight the impact of the pandemic, what is clear to me is that COVID or not, there are some huge holes, sometimes voids, in the care provided. 
Some people are lucky enough to have access to fantastic services, early pregnancy units, others attend their GPs, and others end up at A&E. But unfortunately, some attitudes seem to be very, very prevalent, both in society and in some health services. Uh, of course. Thank you, Madam Dice. Can I just say how moved I was, and everybody knows this, how moved I was with her contribution in Westminster Hall on that day. Um, it, it certainly moved me to tears, and, and, and the lady knows that. But I just want to congratulate her on doing this. I should probably change the way that we, we, we handle support for miscarriages as a result of that debate. Does the Honourable Lady not agree that the threshold of three miscarriages in a row for NHS investigation must change as every miscarriage is devastating and the estimation of an acceptable loss, level of loss is indeed abhorrent? I, I absolutely agree. Now, I'll come on to the issue of how care is provided later in the debate. Um, there seems to be a general lack of understanding that whilst miscarriage is common, it is also incredibly traumatic and can lead to mental health problems. The Lancet Research Series highlights that anxiety, depression and even suicide are strongly associated with going through a miscarriage. Partners are also likely to be affected and previous reports have highlighted links with PTSD. Despite this, the loss associated with miscarriage can often be minimised with phrases like, it's okay, you can just try again, or it just wasn't meant to be this time. After my miscarriage, I got into a cycle of blaming myself and obsessing over what went wrong. If I ate the wrong thing, lifted something too heavy, and so many other ridiculous yeah. thoughts. I have had to have counselling to deal with my trauma, but it was not offered. It was something that I had to seek out myself. The same cycle has been described back to me again and again and again by people who have experienced miscarriages. My brave constituent, Lauren, who has allowed me to share her story today, has sadly suffered three mis miscarriages, has never ever been offered any mental health support through the miscarriage pathway. In fact, even after she requested it, her miscarriages were not even recorded on her medical notes, leading her to explain to five different healthcare professionals about her three miscarriages. And on one occasion, a member of staff asked about when she had had her first child. This is clearly incredibly distressing and why I support the calls for better data collection and patient recording of miscarriages. Women have also told me that about suffering three, four and five miscarriages. The reasons found for these were underlying health conditions such as blood clotting disorders, autoimmune diseases and thyroid disease. Since my miscarriage, I have since ended up in hospital again and been diagnosed with diabetes, an issue that may have been picked up if there was testing carried out at the time of my miscarriage. The information I have received since my diagnosis of diabetes about pregnancy has been very informative and helpful and a really stark contrast to those who have to get information about miscarriage. Now, there are some excellent examples and many, many committed staff who are often share the frustrations about the system, which has a hard cut-off of 24 weeks for some support services. And we've seen a huge number of organisations stepping forward to fill the gaps in support and advice. Tommy's, SANS, the Miscarriage Association, and locally in Sheffield, the Sheffield Maternity Cooperative. I spoke with Phoebe from the cooperative, an experienced midwife who herself has gone through a miscarriage. She works with individuals and families across the city to provide timely, appropriate and sensitive care after her own experiences were unfortunately the exact opposite of that. So what should we do? Well, I hope today the Minister will respond to the key findings of the Lancet series and these key asks. The first is that the three miscarriages rule needs to end. The large number of people who have signed the Tommy's petition show the strength of feeling. We wouldn't expect someone to go through three heart attacks before we try to find out what was wrong and treat them. So why do we expect women to go through three, in some cases, preventable losses before they are offered the answers and treatments they need? Instead, the research recommends a graded support system where people get information and support after their first miscarriage. We shouldn't phrase it like that, though. Tests after the second and a consultant-led care 
after the third. The second key ask is 24-7 care and support being available. That care should be standardised to avoid postcode lottery or patchy provision currently available. And it should include follow-up mental health support to help reduce mental illnesses post miscarriage. Finally, we need to acknowledge that miscarriage matters and start collecting data on miscarriage, stillbirth and preterm rates. I was shocked to find that no central data existed on the statistics. Uh, and these, are, these are estimates are based on very many different sources. We must break the taboo on miscarriage. I know from personal experience and from many people who have contacted me that we could do so, so much better. Will the minister today commit to take forward these proposals and take a stand for women, individuals and families that the system is failing? And will she meet with me and campaigners to discuss this issue further? <laughs> minister Nadine Dorris. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Well, first of all, I want to pay a uh, tribute to the Honourable Lady Member for Sheffield Hallam for how brave she is. And I think she moves everybody to tears, actually, when she talks about her story, because it's personally so touching. And I responded to her debate um, the first time in Westminster Hall. And so she hasn't elaborated on her own situation in the way she did then. But you are so, sorry, Madam Chair, sweet, the Honourable Lady is so incredibly brave to do what she does and to champion those women who have suffered from miscarriages. And I also just want to say that I worked very closely with her mother at the beginning of the COVID outbreak, Judith. And I think your mother must be very proud of you. She's a formidable lady. I have the hugest respect for her. And I'm sure she's incredibly proud of you today too. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, I would like to thank everybody who, is, um, who has shown particular interest in this subject, both in the Chamber and in the Westminster Hall debates which have been held. And it's as a result of, I was also like to thank Tommy's, actually, um, in Coventry, for those who might think well, I'm talking about um, a hospital over the bridge. So, for their incredible, the charity, for their incredible work to support families through their pregnancy journey, including those that sadly miscarry, and for the funding research centres and specialist clinics to help us understand why pregnancy sometimes goes wrong and how we can prevent complications and loss and provide specialist care for those women who need it. Tommy's petition to improve miscarriage care has drawn a huge amount of support and I'm glad that this deeply important issue has the attention it deserves. The three papers published in The Lancet provide an important insight into the prevalence, effects and costs of miscarriage. Miscarriage is the most common complication of pregnancy experienced by an estimated one in five women and we know that miscarriage can significantly impact the emotional and psychological well-being of women and their families. And it can be extremely isolating for women and their partners with long-term complications. Women who have suffered miscarriage are 3.8 times more likely to die by suicide. And it only takes one miscarriage to increase the likelihood of a suicide for a woman. Such difficult experiences should not be faced alone. And that is why, as part of the NHS long-term plan, we are improving the access and quality of perinatal mental health care for mothers and their partners affected by their maternity experience during miscarriage, or including miscarriage. Mental health services around England are being expanded to include new mental health hubs for new expectant or bereaved mothers. The hubs will offer treatment to around 6,000 women in the first year for a range of mental health issues from post-traumatic stress disorder after miscarrying or giving birth to others with a fear of childbirth. The new hubs will also provide specialist training for midwives and other maternity staff as well as services for reproductive health and bereavement. And the Lancet series highlights the unacceptable inequalities in women's chances of having a miscarriage. Black women have a 40% increased relative risk of miscarriage compared to white women. It also provides evidence for the importance of maintaining a healthy lifestyle before conception and during pregnancy for all women to reduce the risk of miscarriage. Women who smoke in the first trimester are 1.2 times more likely to have a miscarriage than non-smokers. Women with a low BMI under 18.5 are 1.6 times more likely to miscarry, and those with a BMI over 30 are one times 
1.9 times more likely. This is the information that we know. The NHS is open for all and no women should feel like they cannot seek help. And the early women come forward during their pregnancy, the easier it is for the NHS to make sure that they receive the right support to reduce the risks. Pregnancy lasts around 40 weeks, but a lifetime approach is needed to address some of the reasons why some women are at more risk than others. Tackling health inequalities and levelling up society is a priority. While there is still more to do, good progress has been made to improve maternity safety and achieve our national maternity safety ambition. Since 2010, the stillbirth rate has fallen by 25%. 98,000 women now receive care from the same midwife team throughout their maternity journey that we call that continuity of carer, up from 10,000 women in March 2019. This helps to reduce, and that's through COVID as well. This helps to reduce baby loss, preterm births, hospital admissions, and the need for intervention during labour, and improves women's experiences. It is so important that the voices of women including those who have suffered miscarriages, are heard. And, and that's why I pay tribute to her, because here in this place, she champions those voices. I announced in March this government is embarking on the first women's health strategy for England, something that I was absolutely committed to start and finish when I first became a minister in the Department for Health. This strategy is first and foremost about listening to women's voices. The call for evidence recently closed and we have seen an incredible response. Over 112,000 women from across the country came forward to share their experiences in the online survey. And the call for evidence specifically asked about women's experiences with fertility, pregnancy and baby loss, which is such an important area of women's health. And we are analysing responses closely to make sure the strategy reflects what women identify as their priorities and we will consider the recommendations made in the Lancet series as part of this work. I'm also looking forward to visiting Tommy's myself, the National Centre for Miscarriage Research in Coventry, in the coming months. Their research into the causes of miscarriage and search for solutions and treatment is incredibly valuable. And I look forward to meeting with the authors of the Lancet papers and talking to some of the patients to hear about their experiences of miscarriage and, mis and miscarriage care. And I would like to then extend an offer also to meet with the, uh, my honourable friend so that we can discuss this issue further too. Every miscarriage is a tragedy and it is only right that parents are supported through difficult times. Now she asked me, um, particularly with regard to the recommendations that were made, and so I just want to go through the recommendations and what I'm doing about each recommendation. So recommendation one was to ensure that designated miscarriage services are available 24-7 to all taking into account uh, local conditions resources. So I'm including uh, recommendation one in the women's health strategy as part of the work that we're doing there, um, specifically about those issues.